Chapter One, Section One of the History of Mr. Polly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Pretzelis in Santa Rosa, California. The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. Chapter the First. Beginnings and the Bazaar. Section 1. Howl, said Mr. Polly, and then for a change and with greatly increased emphasis, Howl. He paused, and then broke out with one of his private and peculiar idioms. Oh, beastly, silly wheeze of a howl. He was sitting on a stile between two threadbare-looking fields, and suffering acutely from indigestion. He suffered from indigestion now nearly every afternoon in his life, but as he lacked introspection, he projected the associated discomfort upon the world. Every afternoon he discovered afresh that life as a whole, and every aspect of life that presented itself, was beastly. And this afternoon, lured by the delusive blueness of a sky that was blue because the wind was in the east, he had come out in the hope of snatching something of the joyousness of spring. The mysterious alchemy of mind and body refused, however, to permit any joyousness whatever in the spring. He had had a little difficulty in finding his cap before he came out. He wanted his cap, the new golf cap, and Mrs. Polly must needs fish out his old soft brown felt hat. "'Here's your hat,' she said in a tone of insincere encouragement. He had been rooting among the piled newspapers under the kitchen dresser, and had turned quite hopefully and taken the thing. He put it on, but it didn't feel right. Nothing felt right. He put a trembling hand upon the crown of the thing, and pressed it on his head, and tried it askew to the right, and then askewed to the left. Then the full sense of the indignity offered him came home to him. The hat masked the upper sinister quarter of his face, and he spoke with a wrathful eye regarding his wife from under the brim. In a voice thick with fury, he said, I suppose you'd like me to wear that silly mud pie for ever, eh? I tell you, I won't. I'm sick of it. I'm pretty much sick of everything comes to that hat. He clutched it with quivering fingers. Hat, he repeated. Then he flung it to the ground and kicked it with extraordinary fury across the kitchen. It flew up against the door and dropped to the ground with its ribbon band half off. "'Chant, go out,' he said, and, sticking his hands into his jacket pockets, discovered the missing cap in the right one. There was nothing for it but to go straight upstairs without a word, and out, slamming the shop door hard. "'Beauty!' said Mrs. Polly at last, to a tremendous silence, picking up and dusting the rejected headdress. Tantrums, she added, I haven't patience. And moving with the slow reluctance of a deeply offended woman, she began to pile together the simple apparatus of their recent meal for transportation to the scullery sink. The repast she had prepared for him did not seem to her to justify his ingratitude. There had been the cold pork from Sunday and some nice cold potatoes, and Rashdall's mixed pickles, of which he was inordinately fond. He had eaten three gherkins, two onions, a small cauliflower head, and several capers, with every appearance of appetite, and indeed with avidity and there had been cold suet pudding to follow with treacle, and then a nice bit of cheese. It was the pale, hard sort of cheese he liked. Red cheese, he declared, was indigestible. 
He had also had three big slices of greyish baker's bread, and had drunk the best part of the jugful of beer. But there seems no pleasing some people. Tantrums, said Mrs. Polly at the sink, struggling with the mustard on his plate, and expressing the only solution of the problem that occurred to her. And Mr. Polly sat on the stile, and hated the whole scheme of life, which was at once excessive and inadequate as a solution. He hated Foxbourne, he hated Foxbourne High Street, he hated his shop and his wife and his neighbours, every blessed neighbour, and, with indescribable bitterness, he hated himself. "'Why did I ever get in this silly hole?' he said. "'Why did I ever?' He sat on the stile and looked with eyes that seemed blurred with impalpable flaws at a world in which even the spring buds were wilted. The sunlight metallic, and the shadows mixed with blue-black ink. To the moralist I know he might have served as a figure of sinful discontent, but that is because it is the habit of moralists to ignore material circumstances. If indeed one may speak of a recent meal as a circumstance, with Mr. Polly Circum. Drink, indeed, our teachers will criticise nowadays, both as regards quantity and quality. But neither church nor state nor school will raise a warning finger between a man and his hunger and his wife's catering. So on nearly every day of his life Mr. Polly fell into a violent rage and hatred against the outer world in the afternoon, and never suspected that it was this inner world to which I am with such masterly delicacy alluding that was thus reflecting its sinister disorder upon the things without. It is a pity that some human beings are not more transparent. If Mr. Polly, for example, had been transparent or even passably translucent, then perhaps he might have realised, from the Laocoon struggle he would have glimpsed, that indeed he was not so much a human being as a civil war. Wonderful things must have been going on inside Mr. Polly. Oh, wonderful things! It must have been like a badly managed industrial city during a period of depression. Agitators, acts of violence, strikes at the forces of the law and order doing their best, rushings to and fro, upheavals, the Marseillais, tumbrils, the rumble and thunder of the tumbrils. I do not know why the east wind aggravates life to unhealthy people. It made Mr. Polly's teeth seem loose in his head, and his skin feel like a misfit, and his hair a dry, stringy exasperation. Why cannot doctors give us an antidote to the east wind? Never have the sense to get your hair cut till it's too long, said Mr. Polly, catching sight of his shadow. You blighted, degenerated paint-brush! Ugh! And he flattened down the projecting tails with an urgent hand. Section 2 Mr. Polly's age was exactly thirty-five years and a half. He was a short, compact figure, and a little inclined to a localised embonpoint. His face was not unpleasing, the features fine, but a trifle too pointed about the nose to be classically perfect. The corners of his sensitive mouth were depressed. His eyes were ruddy brown and troubled, and the left one was round with more of wonder in it than its fellow. His complexion was dull and yellowish. That, as I have explained, on account of those civil disturbances. He was, in the technical sense of the word, clean-shaved, with a small, sallow patch under the right ear and a cut on the chin. His brow had the little puckerings of a thoroughly discontented man, 
little wrinklings and lumps, particularly over his right eye, and he sat with his hands in his pockets, a little askew on the stile, and swung one leg. Howl, he repeated presently. He broke into a quavering song. Rotten, beastly, silly, howl. His voice thickened with rage, and the rest of his discourse was marred by an unfortunate choice of epithets. He was dressed in a shabby black morning coat and vest. The braid that bound these garments was a little loose in places. His collar was chosen from stock and with projecting corners, technically a wing poke. That and his tie, which was new and loose and rich in colouring, had been selected to encourage and stimulate customers, for he dealt in gentlemen's outfitting. His golf cap, which was also from stock and a slant over his eye, gave his mystery a desperate touch. He wore brown leather boots, because he hated the smell of blacking. Perhaps, after all, it was not simply indigestion that troubled him. Behind the superficialities of Mr. Polly's being moved a larger and vaguer distress. The elementary education he had acquired had left him with the impression that arithmetic was a flunky science, and best avoided in practical affairs. But even the absence of bookkeeping and a total inability to distinguish between capital and interest could not blind him for ever to the fact that the little shop in the high street was not paying. An absence of returns, a construction of credit, a depleted till, the most valiant resolves to keep smiling, could not prevail for ever against these insistent phenomena. One might bustle about in the morning before dinner, and in the afternoon after tea, and forget that huge, dark cloud of insolvency that gathered and spread in the backgrounds, but it was part of the desolation of these afternoon periods, these grey spaces of time after meals, when all one's courage had descended to the unseen battles of the pit, that life seemed stripped to the bone, and one saw with a hopeless clearness. Let me tell the history of Mr. Polly from the cradle to these present difficulties. First the infant, mewling and puking in its nurse's arms. There had been a time when two people had thought Mr. Polly the most wonderful and adorable thing in the world, had kissed his toenails, saying, Nyum, nyum and marvelled at the exquisite softness and delicacy of his hair, and had called to one another to remark the particular distinction with which he bubbled, and had disputed whether the sound he had made was just dada, or truly and intentionally dada, had washed him in the utmost detail, and wrapped him up in soft warm blankets, and smothered him with kisses. A regal time that was, and four and thirty years ago. And a merciful forgetness barred Mr. Polly from ever bringing its careless luxury, its autocratic demands and instant obedience, into contrast with his present condition of life. These two people had worshipped him from the crown of his head to the soles of his exquisite feet and also they had fed him rather unwisely, for no one had ever troubled to teach his mother anything about the mysteries of a child's upbringing, though of course the monthly nurse and her charwoman gave some valuable hints, and by his fifth birthday the perfect rhythms of his nice new exterior were already darkened with perplexity. His mother died when he was seven. He began only to have distinctive memories of himself in the time when his education had already begun. I remember seeing a picture of education in some place. I think it was education, but quite conceivably it represented the empire teaching her sons, and I have a strong impression 
that it was a wall painting upon some public building in Manchester or Birmingham or Glasgow, but very possibly I'm mistaken about that. It represented a glorious woman with a wise and fearless face stooping over her children and pointing them to far horizons. The sky displayed the pearly warmth of a summer dawn, and all the painting was marvellously bright, as if with the youth and hope of the delicately beautiful children in the foreground. She was telling them, one felt, of the great prospect of life that opened before them, of the spectacle of the world, the splendours of sea and mountain they might travel and see, the joys of skill they might acquire, of effort and the pride of effort, and the devotions and nobilities it was theirs to achieve. Perhaps she even whispered of the warm, triumphant mystery of love that comes at last to those who have patience and unblemished hearts. She was reminding them of their great heritage as English children, rulers of more than one-fifth of mankind, of the obligation to do and to be the best that such a pride of empire entails, of their essential nobility and knighthood, and the restraints and the charities and the undisciplined strength that is becoming in knights and rulers. The education of Mr. Polly did not follow this picture very closely. He went for some time to a national school, which was run on severely economical lines to keep down the rates by a largely untrained staff. He was set sums to do that he did not understand, and that no one made him understand. He was made to read the Catechism and Bible with the utmost industry, and an entire disregard of pronunciation or significance, and caused to imitate writing copies and drawing copies, and given an object lessons upon sealing wax, and silk worms, and potato bugs, and ginger and iron, and such like things and taught various other subjects his mind refused to entertain, and afterwards, when he was about twelve, he was jerked by his parents to finish off in a private school of dingy aspect and still dingier pretensions, where there were no object lessons, and the studies of bookkeeping and French were pursued, but never effectively overtaken, under the guidance of an elderly gentleman who wore a nondescript gown and took snuff, wrote copperplate, explained nothing, and used a cane with remarkable dexterity and gusto. Mr. Polly went into the national school at six, and he left the private school at fourteen, and by that time his mind was in much the same state that you would be in, dear reader, if you were operated upon for appendicitis by a well-meaning, boldly enterprising, but rather overworked and underpaid butcher-boy, who was superseded toward the climax of the operation by a left-handed clerk of high principles but intemperate habits. That is to say, it was in a thorough mess. The nice little curiosities and willingnesses of a child were in a jumbled and thwarted condition, hacked and cut about. The operators had left, so to speak, all their sponges and ligatures in the mangled confusion, and Mr. Polly had lost much of his natural confidence, so far as figures and sciences and languages and the possibilities of learning things were concerned. He thought of the present world no longer as a wonderland of experiences, but as geography and history, as the repeating of names that were hard to pronounce, and lists of products and populations and heights and lengths, and as lists and dates, oh, and boredom indescribable. He thought of religion as the recital of more or less incomprehensible words that were hard to remember, and of the divinity as a limitless being, having the nature of a schoolmaster, and making infinite rules 
known and unknown rules that were always ruthlessly enforced, and with an infinite capacity for punishment, and, most horrible of all to think of, limitless powers of espial, so that to the best of his ability he did not think of that unrelenting eye. He was uncertain about the spelling and pronunciation of most of the words in our beautiful but abundant and perplexing tongue. That especially was a pity, because words attracted him, and under happier conditions he might have used them well. He was always doubtful whether it was eight sevens or nine eights that was sixty-three. He knew no method for settling the difficulty, and he thought the merit of a drawing consisted in the care in which it was lined in. Lining in bored him beyond measure. But the indigestions of mind and body that were to play so large a part in his subsequent career were still only beginning. His liver and his gastric juice, his wonder and imagination, kept up a fight against the things that threatened to overwhelm soul and body together. Outside the regions devastated by the school curriculum, he was still intensely curious. He had cheerful phases of enterprise, and about thirteen he suddenly discovered reading and its joys. He began to read stories voraciously and books of travel, provided they were also adventurous. He got these chiefly from the local institute, and he also took in, irregularly but thoroughly, one of those inspiring weeklies that dull people used to call penny dreadfuls. Admirable weeklies, crammed with imagination that the cheap boys' comics of today have replaced. At fourteen, when he emerged from the valley of the shadow of education, there survived something, indeed it survived still, obscured and thwarted, at five and thirty, that pointed, not with a visible and prevailing finger like the finger of that beautiful woman in the picture, but pointed, nevertheless, to the idea that there was interest and happiness in the world. Deep in the being of Mr. Polly, deep in that darkness, like a creature which has been beaten about the head and left for dead, but that still lives, crawled a persuasion that over and above the things that are jolly and bits of all right, there was beauty, there was delight, that somewhere, magically inaccessible perhaps, but still somewhere, were pure and easy and joyous states of body and mind. He would sneak out on moonless winter nights and stare up at the stars, and afterwards find it difficult to tell his father where he had been. He would read tales about hunters and explorers, and imagine himself riding mustangs as fleet as the wind across the prairies of Western America, or coming as a conquering and adored white man into the swarming villages of Central Africa. He shot bears with a revolver, a cigarette in the other hand, and made a necklace of their teeth and claws for the chief's beautiful young daughter. Also he killed a lion with a pointed stake, stabbing through the beast's heart as it stood over him. He thought it would be splendid to be a diver, and go down into the dark green mysteries of the sea. He led stormers against well-nigh impregnable forts, and died on the ramparts at the moment of victory. His grave was watered by a nation's tears. He rammed and torpedoed ships, one against ten. He was beloved by queens in barbaric lands, and reconciled whole nations to the Christian faith. He was martyred, and took it very calmly and beautifully, not only once, but twice, after the revivalist week. It did not become a habit with him. He explored the Amazon, and found, newly exposed by the fall of a great tree, a rock of gold. Engaged in these pursuits, he would neglect the work immediately in hand, sitting somewhat slackly on the form 
and projecting himself in a manner tempting to a schoolmaster with a cane, and twice he had books confiscated. Recalled to the realities of life, he would rub himself or sigh deeply as the occasion required, and resume his attempts to write as good as copperplate. He hated writing. The ink always crept up his fingers, and the smell of ink offended him. He was filled with unexpressed doubts. Why should writing slope down from right to left? Why should downstrokes be thick and upstrokes thin? Why should the handle of one's pen point over one's right shoulder? His copy-books toward the end foreshadowed his destiny, and took the form of commercial documents. "'Dear Sir,' they ran, "'referring to your esteemed order of the twenty-sixth alt, we beg to inform you,' and so on. The compression of Mr. Polly's mind and soul in the educational institutions of his time was terminated abruptly by his father between his fourteenth and fifteenth birthday. His father, who had long since forgotten the time when his son's little limbs seemed to have come straight from God's hand, and when he had kissed five minute toenails in a rapture of loving tenderness, remarked, "'It's time that dratted boy did something for a living.' And a month or so later, Mr. Polly began that career in business that led him at last to the sole proprietorship of a bankrupt outfitter's shop, and to the stile on which he was sitting. End of chapter one, section one. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 1, Section 2 of The History of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. 3. Mr. Polly was not naturally interested in hosiery and gentleman's outfitting. At times, indeed, he urged himself to a spurious curiosity about that trade, but presently something more congenial came along and checked the effort. He was apprenticed in one of those large, rather low-class establishments which sell everything, from pianos and furniture to books and millinery. A department store, in fact, the Port Burdock Drapery Bazaar at Port Burdock, one of the three townships that are grouped around the Port Burdock Naval Dockyards. There he remained six years. He spent most of the time inattentive to business in a sort of uncomfortable happiness, increasing his indigestion. On the whole, he preferred business to school, the hours were longer, but the tension was not nearly so great. The place was better aired, you were not kept in for no reason at all, and the cane was not employed. You watched the growth of your moustache with interest and impatience, and mastered the beginnings of social intercourse. You talked, and found there were things amusing to say. Also, you had regular pocket money and a voice in the purchase of your clothes, and presently a small salary. And there were girls, and friendship. In the retrospect, Port Burdock sparkled with the facets of quite a cluster of remembered jolly times. "'Didn't save much money, though,' said Mr. Polly. The first apprentice's dormitory was a long, bleak room, with six beds, six chests of drawers and looking-glasses, and a number of boxes of wood or tin. It opened into a still longer and bleaker room of eight beds, and this into a third apartment with yellow-grained paper and American cloth tables, which was the dining-room by day 
and the men's sitting and smoking room after nine. Here Mr. Polly, who had been an only child, first tasted the joys of social intercourse. At first there were attempts to bully him, on account of his refusal to consider face-washing a diurnal duty, but two fights with the apprentices next above him established a useful reputation for collar, and the presence of girl apprentices in the shop somehow raised his standard of cleanliness to a more acceptable level. He didn't, of course, have very much to do with the feminine staff in his department, but he spoke to them casually as he traversed foreign parts of the bazaar, or got out of their way politely, or helped them lift down heavy boxes, and on such occasion he felt their scrutiny. Except in the course of business or at meal times, the men and women of the establishment had very little opportunity of meeting. The men were in their rooms, and the girls in theirs. Yet these feminine creatures, at once so near and so remote, affected him profoundly. He would watch them going to and fro, and marvel secretly at the beauty of their hair, or the roundness of their necks, or the warm softness of their cheeks, or the delicacy of their hands. He would fall into passions for them at dinner-time, and try to show devotions by his manner of passing the bread and margarine at tea. There was a very fair-haired, fair-skinned apprentice at the adjacent haberdashery, to whom he said good morning every morning, and for a period it seemed to him the most significant event in his day. When she said, I do hope it will be fine to-morrow, he felt it marked an epoch. He had had no sisters, and was innately disposed to worship womankind. But he did not portray as much to Platt and Parsons. To Platt and Parsons he affected an attitude of seasoned depravity towards womankind. Platt and Parsons were his contemporary apprentices in departments of the drapery shop, and the three were drawn together into a close friendship by the fact that all their names began with P. They decided they were the three P's, and went about together of an evening with the bearing of desperate dogs. Sometimes when they had money they went into public houses and had drinks. Then they would become more desperate than ever and walk along the pavement under the gas-lamps, arm in arm, singing. Platt had a good tenor voice, and had been in a church choir, and so he led the singing. Parsons had a serviceable bellow, which roared and faded and roared again very wonderfully. Mr. Polly's share was an extraordinary lowing noise, a sort of flat recitative, which he called singing seconds. They would have sung catches if they had known how to do it, but as it was they sung melancholy music-hall songs about dying soldiers and the old folks far away. They would sometimes go into the quieter residential quarters of Port Burdock, where policemen and other obstacles were infrequent, and really let their voices soar like hawks, and feel very happy. The dogs of the district would be stirred to hopeless emulation, and would keep it up for long after the three peas had been swallowed up by the night. One jealous brute of an Irish terrier made a gallant attempt to bite Parsons, but was beaten by numbers and solidarity. The three peas took the utmost interest in each other, and found no company so good. They talked about everything in the world, and would go on talking in their dormitory after the gas was out until the other men were reduced to throwing boots. They skulked from their departments in the slack hours of the afternoon to gossip in the packing-room of the warehouse. On Sundays and bank holidays they went for long walks together, talking. Platt was white-faced and dark, and disposed to undertones and mystery and a curiosity about society, 
and the demi-monde. He kept himself en courant by reading a penny paper of infinite suggestion called Modern Society. Parsons was of an ampler build, already promising fatness, with curly hair and a lot of rolling, rollicking, curly features and a large blob-shaped nose. He had a great memory and a real interest in literature. He knew great portions of Shakespeare and Milton by heart, and would recite them at the slightest provocation. He read everything he could get hold of, and if he liked it, he read it aloud. It did not matter who else liked it. At first Mr. Polly was disposed to be suspicious of this literature, but was carried away by Parson's enthusiasm. The three peas went to a performance of Romeo and Juliet at the Port Burdock Theatre Royal, and hung over the gallery, fascinated. After that they made a sort of password out of, Do you bite your thumbs at us, sir? To which the countersign was, We bite our thumbs. For weeks the glory of Shakespeare's Verona lit Mr. Polly's life. He walked as though he carried a sword at his side, and swung a mantle from his shoulders. He went through the grimy streets of Port Burdock with his eye on the first-floor windows, looking for balconies. A ladder in the yard flooded his mind with romantic ideas. Then Parsons discovered an Italian writer, whose name Mr. Polly rendered as Boccaccio, and after some excursions into that author's remains, the talk of Parsons became infested with the word Amours and Mr. Polly would stand in front of his hosiery fixtures, trifling with paper and string, and thinking of perennial picnics under dark olive trees in the everlasting sunshine of Italy. And about that time it was that all three peas adopted turn-down collars and large, loose, artistic silk ties, which they tied very much on one side, and wore with an air of defiance and a certain swashbuckling carriage. And then there came the glorious revelation of that great Frenchman whom Mr. Polly called Rabelouse. The three peas thought the birth feast of Gargantua the most glorious piece of writing in the world, and I'm not sure that they were wrong. And on wet Sunday evenings, when there was the danger of him singing, they would get Parsons to read it aloud. Towards the several members of the Y.M.C.A. who shared the dormitory, the three P's maintained a sarcastic and defiant attitude. "'We got a perfect right to do what we want in our corner,' Platt maintained. "'You do what you like in yours.' "'But the language,' objected Morrison, the white-faced, earnest-eyed improver who was leading a profoundly religious life under great difficulties. "'Language, man!' roared Parsons. "'Why, it's literature!' "'Sunday isn't the time for literature. "'It's the only time we've got, and besides—' "'The horrors of religious controversy would begin.' Mr. Polly stuck loyally to the three Ps, but in the secret places of his heart— he was torn. A fire of conviction burnt in Morrison's eyes, and spoke in his urgent, persuasive voice. He lived the better life manifestly, chaste in word and deed, industrious, studiously kindly. When the junior apprentice had sore feet and homesickness, Morrison washed the feet and comforted the heart and he helped other men to get through their work when he might have gone early, a superhuman thing to do. Polly was secretly a little afraid to be left alone with this man and the power of the spirit that was in him. He felt watched. Platt, also struggling with things his mind could not contrive to reconcile, said, "'That confounded hypocrite!' "'He's no hypocrite,' said Parsons. He's no hypocrite, old man, but he's got no blessed joy de vive. That's what's wrong with him. 
Let's go down to the Harbour Arms and see some of those blessed old captains getting drunk. Short of sugar, old oh man, said Mr. Polly, slapping his trouser pocket. Oh, come on, said Parsons. Always do it on tuppence for a bitter. Let me get my pipe on, said Platt, who had recently taken to smoking with great ferocity. Then I'm with you. Pause and struggle. Don't ram it down, old man, said Parsons, watching with knitted brows. Don't ram it down. Give it air. Seen my stick, old man? right o and leaning on his cane, he composed himself in an attitude of sympathetic patience towards Platt's incendiary efforts. 4. Jolly days of companionship they were for the incipient bankrupt on the stile to look back upon. The interminable working hours of the bazaar had long since faded from his memory, except for one or two conspicuous rows and one or two larks, but the rare Sundays and holidays shone out like diamonds among pebbles. They shone with the mellow splendour of evening skies reflected in calm water, and athwart them all went old Parsons, bellowing an interpretation of life, gesticulating, appreciating, and making appreciate, expounding books, talking of that mystery of his, the joy de vivre. There were some particularly splendid walks on bank holidays. The three peas would start on Sunday morning early, and find a room in some modest inn, and talk themselves asleep, and return singing through the night, or having an argy-bargy about the stars, on Monday evening. They would come over the hills out of the pleasant English countryside in which they had wandered, and see Port Burdock spread out below, a network of interlacing street lamps and shifting tram lights against the black, beacon-gemmed immensity of the harbour waters. "'Back to the collar, old man,' Parsons would say. There is no satisfactory plural to old man so he always used it in the singular. "'Don't mention it,' said Platt. And once they got a boat for the whole summer day, and rowed up past the moored ironclads, and the black old hulks, and the various shipping of the harbour, past the white troop-ship, and past the trim front, and the ships, and interesting vistas of the dockyard, to shallow channels, and rocky, weedy wildernesses of the upper harbour. And Parsons and Mr. Polly had a great dispute and quarrel that day as to how far a big gun could shoot. The country over the hills behind Port Burdock is all that an old-fashioned, scarcely disturbed English countryside should be. In those days the bicycle was still rare and costly, and the motor-car had yet to come and stir up rural serenities. The three peas would take footpiles haphazard across fields, and plunge into unknown winding lanes between high hedges of honeysuckle and dog-rose. Greatly daring, they would follow green bridle-paths through primrose-studded undergrowths, or wander waist-deep in the bracken of beech-woods. About twenty miles from Port Burdock, there came a region of hop-gardens and host-crowned farms, and further on, to be reached only by cheap tickets at bank holiday times, was a sterile ridge of very clean roads and red sand-pits and pine and gorse and heather. The three peas could not afford to buy bicycles, and they found boots the greatest item of their skimpy expenditure. They threw appearance to the winds at last, and got ready-made working men's hobnails. There was much discussion and strong feeling in this step in the dormitory. There is no countryside like the English countryside for those who have learned to love it. Its firm yet gentle lines of hill and dale, its ordered confusion of features, its deer parks and downlands, its castles and stately houses, its hamlets and old churches, 
its farms and ricks and great barns and ancient trees, its pools and ponds and shining threads of rivers, its flower-starred hedgerows, its orchards and woodland patches, its village greens and kindly inns. Other countrysides have their pleasant aspects, but none such variety, none that shine so steadfastly through the year. Picardy is pink and white and pleasant in the blossom time. Burgundy goes on with its sunshine and wild hillsides and cramped vineyards, a beautiful tune repeated and repeated. Italy gives salatas and wayside chapels and chestnuts and olive orchards. The Ardennes has its woods and gorges, terrain and the Rhineland, the wide Campania with its distant Apennines, and the neat prosperities and mountain backgrounds of South Germany. All clamour their especial merits at one's memory. And there are the hills and fields of Virginia, like an England grown very big and slovenly, the trim New England landscape, a little bleak and rather fine like the New England mind, and the wide, rough country roads and hills and woodland of New York State. But none of these change scene and character in three miles of walking, nor have so mellow a sunlight, nor so diversified a cloudland, nor confess the perpetual refreshment of the strong, soft winds that blow off the sea as our mother England does. It was good for the three peas to walk through such a land, and forget for a time that indeed they had no footing in it all, that they were doomed to toil behind counters in such places as Port Burdock for the better part of their lives. They would forget the customers and shop-walkers and department buyers and everything, and become just happy wanderers in a world of pleasant breezes and bird-songs and shady trees. The arrival at the inn was a great affair. No one, they were convinced, would take them for drapers, and there might be a pretty serving-girl or a jolly old lady, or what Parsons called a bit of a character drinking in the bar. There would always be weighty inquiries as to what they could have, and it would work out always at cold beef and pickles, or fried ham and eggs and shandy gaff, two pints of beer and two bottles of ginger beer foaming in a huge round-bellied jug. The glorious moment of standing lordly at the inn doorway and staring out at the world, the swinging sign, the geese upon the green, the duck-pond, a waiting wagon, the church-tower, a sleepy cat, the blue heavens, with the sizzle of the frying audible behind one, the keen smell of the bacon, the trotting feet bearing the repast, the click and clatter as the tableware is finally arranged, a clean white cloth. Ready, sir? or ready gentlemen better hearing that than forward polly look sharp the going in the sitting down the falling too bread o oh man right o oh. don't bag all the crust o oh man once a simple mannered girl in a pink print dress stayed and talked with them as they ate Led by the gallant Parsons, they professed to be all desperately in love with her, and courted her to say which she preferred of them. It was so manifest she did prefer one, and so impossible to say which it was held her there, until a distant maternal voice called her away. Afterwards, as they left the inn, she waylaid them at the orchard corner, and gave them a little shyly three keen yellow-green apples, and wished them to come again some day, and vanished, and reappeared looking after them as they turned the corner, waving a white handkerchief. All the rest of the day they disputed over the signs of her favour, and the next Sunday they went there again. 
but she had vanished, and a mother of forbidding aspect afforded no explanations. If Platt and Parsons and Mr. Polly live to be a hundred, they will none of them forget that girl as she stood with a pink flush upon her, faintly smiling and yet earnest, parting the branches of the hedgerows and reaching down apple in hand. Which of them was it had caught her spirit to attend to them? And once they went along the coast, following it as closely as possible, and so they came at last to Foxbourne, that easternmost suburb of Brailing and Hampstead-on-the-Sea. Foxbourne seemed a very jolly little place to Mr. Polly that afternoon. It has a clean sandy beach instead of the mud and pebbles and coaly defilement of Port Burdock, a row of six bathing machines, and a shelter on the parade in which the three peas sat after a satisfying but rather expensive lunch that had included celery. Rows of verandahed villas proffered apartments. They had feasted in an hotel with a porch painted white and gay with geraniums above and the high street with the old church at the head had been full of an agreeable afternoon stillness. "'Nice little place for a business,' said Platt sagely from behind his big pipe. It stuck in Mr. Polly's memory. 5. Mr. Polly was not so picturesque a youth as Parsons. He lacked richness in his voice, and went about in these days with his hands in his pockets, looking quietly speculative. He specialised in slang and the disuse of English, and he played the role of an appreciative stimulant to Parsons. Words attracted him curiously, words rich in suggestion, and he loved a novel and striking phrase. His school training had given him little or no mastery of the mysterious pronunciation of English, and no confidence in himself. His schoolmaster, indeed, had been both unsound and variable. New words had terror and fascination for him. He did not acquire them, he could not avoid them, and so he plunged into them. His only rule was not to be misled by the spelling. That was no guide, anyhow. He avoided every recognised phrase in the language, and mispronounced everything in order that he shouldn't be suspected of ignorance, but whim. Sesquipleden, he would say, sesquipleden, Virgibus. Eh? said Platt. Eloquent Rhapsodus. Where? asked Platt. In the warehouse, old man. All among the tablecloths and blankets. Carlyle. He's reading aloud. Doing the high froth. Spuming. Windmilling. Wah, wah. It's a sight worth seeing. He'll bark his blessed knuckles one of these days on the fixtures, old man. He held an imaginary book in one hand and waved an eloquent gesture. Here, too, shall every hero, in so much as notwithstanding for evermore, come back to reality. He parodied the enthusiastic Parsons. So that in fashion and thereby upon things and not under things, articulariously, he stands. I should laugh if the governor dropped on him, said Platt. He'd never hear him coming. The old man's drunk with it. Fair drunk, said Polly. I never did. It's worse than when he got on to Rabaloos. End of chapter one. Chapter two of the History of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 2. The Dismissal of Parsons. 1. Suddenly Parsons got himself dismissed. 
He got himself dismissed under circumstances of peculiar violence that left a deep impression on Mr. Polly's mind. He wondered about it for years afterwards, trying to get the rights of the case. Parsons' apprenticeship was over. He had reached the status of an improver, and he dressed the window of the Manchester department. By all the standards available, he dressed it very well. By his own standards, he dressed it wonderfully. "'Well, old man,' he used to say, "'there's one thing about my position here. I can dress a window.' And when trouble was under discussion, he was told that Little Fluffums, which was the apprentice's name for Mr. Garvace, the senior partner and managing director of the bazaar, would think twice before he got rid of the only man in the place who could make a window full of Manchester goods tell. Then, like many a fellow artist, he fell prey to theories. The art of window dressing is in its infancy, old man, in its blooming infancy. All balance and stuffiness, like a blessed Egyptian picture. No joy in it, no blooming joy. Conventional. A shop window ought to get hold of people, grip em as they go along. It stands to reason. Grip. His voice would sink to a kind of quiet bellow. Do they grip? Then, after a pause, a savage roar. No. He's got a heavy on said Mr. Polly. Go it, old man. Let's have some more of it. Look at old Morrison's dress-stuff windows. Tidy, tasteful, correct, I grant you, but bleak. He let out the word reinforced to a shout. Bleak. Bleak, echoed Mr. Polly. Just pieces of stuff in rows. Rows of tidy little puffs, perhaps one bit just unrolled. Quiet tickets. Might as well be in church, old man, said Mr. Polly. A window ought to be exciting, said Parsons. It ought to make you say, hello, when you see it. He paused, and Platt watched him over a snorting pipe. Rococcio! said Mr. Polly. "'We want a new school of window-dressing,' said Parsons, regardless of the comment. "'A new school. The Port Burdock School. Day after tomorrow, I change the Fitzallen Street stuff. This time it's going to be a change. I mean to have a crowd or bust.' And, as a matter of fact, he did both. His voice dropped to a note of self-reproach. "'I've been timid, old man. I've been holding myself in. I haven't done myself justice. I've kept down the simmering, seething, teeming ideas. All oh, that's over now.' "'Over,' gulped Polly. "'Over for good and all, old man.' Two. Platt came to Polly, who was sorting up collar-boxes. "'Old man's doing his blooming window.' "'What window?' "'What he said.' Polly remembered. He went on with his collar-boxes, with his eye on his senior, Mansfield. Mansfield was presently called away to the counting-house, and instantly Polly shot out by the street door, and made a rapid transit across the street front, past the Manchester window, and so into the silk-room door. He could not linger long, but he gathered joy, a swift, fearful joy, from his brief inspection of Parsons' unconscious back. Parsons had his tail-coat off, and was working with vigour. His habit of pulling his waistcoat straps to the utmost brought out all the agreeable promise of corpulence in his youthful frame. He was blowing excitedly, and running his fingers through his hair, and then moving with all the swift eagerness of a man inspired. 
all about his feet and knees were scarlet blankets. Not folded, not formally unfolded, but, uh, the only phrase is, shied about. And a great bar sinister of roller toweling stretched across the front of the window, on which was a ticket, and the ticket said, in bold black letters, LOOK. So soon as Mr. Polly got into the silk department and met Platt, he knew he had not lingered nearly long enough outside. "'Did you see the boards at the back?' said Platt. He hadn't. "'The high egregious is fairly on,' he said, and dived down to return by his devious subterranean routes to the outfitting department. Presently the street door opened, and Platt, with an air of intense devotion to business, assumed to cover his adoption of that unusual route, came in and made for the staircase down to the warehouse. He rolled up his eyes at Polly. "'Oh, law!' he said, and vanished. Irresistible curiosity seized Polly. Should he go through the shop to the Manchester department? or risk a second transit outside. He was impelled to make a dive at the street door. "'Where are you going?' asked Mansfield. "'Lil Dog,' said Polly, with an air of lucid explanation, and left him to get any meaning he could from it. Parsons was worth the subsequent trouble. Parsons really was extremely rich. This time Polly stopped to take it in. Parsons had made a huge symmetrical pile of thick white and red blankets, twisted and rolled to accentuate their woolly richness, heaped up in warm disorder, with large window tickets inscribed in blazing red letters, cosy comfort at cut prices, and curl up and cuddle below cost. Regardless of the daylight, he had turned up the electric light on that side of the window to reflect a warm glow upon the heap, and behind, in pursuit of contrasted bleakness, he was now hanging long strips of grey silesia and chilly-coloured linen dusterings. It was wonderful! But— uh... Mr. Polly decided it was time he went in. He found Platt in the silk department, apparently on the verge of another plunge into the exterior world. "'Cosy comfort at cut prices,' said Polly. "'Alliteration's artful aid.' He did not dare go into the street for the third time, and he was hovering feverishly near the window when he saw the governor— Mr. Garvace, that is to say, the managing director of the bazaar, walking along the pavement after his manner to assure himself all was well with the establishment he guided. Mr. Garvace was a short, stout man, with that air of modest pride that so often goes with corpulence. Choleric and decisive in manner, and with hands that looked like bunches of fingers— he was red-haired and ruddy, and after the custom of such complexions, hairs sprang from the tip of his nose. When he wished to bring the power of the human eye to bear upon an assistant, he projected his chest, knitted one brow, and partly closed the left eyelid. An expression of speculative wonder overspread the countenance of Mr. Polly, he felt he must see. Yes, whatever happened, he must see. "'Want to speak to Parsons, sir?' he said to Mr. Mansfield, and deserted his post hastily, dashed through the intervening departments, and was in position behind a pile of bolt and sheeting as the governor came in out of the street. "'What on earth do you think you're doing with that window, Parsons?' began Mr. Garvace. Only the legs of Parsons and the lower part of his waistcoat and an intervening inch of shirt were visible. He was standing inside the window on the steps, 
hanging up the last strip of his background from the brass rail across the ceiling. Within, the Manchester shop window was cut off by a partition, rather like the partition of an old-fashioned church pew, from the general space of the shop. There was a panelled barrier, that is to say, with a little door like a pew door in it. Parson's face appeared, staring with round eyes at his employer. Mr. Garvace had to repeat his question. "'Dressing it, sir, on new lines.' "'Come out of it,' said Mr. Garvace. Parsons stared, and Mr. Garvace had to repeat his command. Parsons, with a dazed expression, began to descend the steps slowly. Mr. Garvace turned around. "'Where's Morrison? Morrison!' Morrison appeared. "'Take this window over,' said Mr. Garvace, pointing his bunch of fingers at Parsons. "'Take all this muddle out and dress it properly.' Morrison advanced and hesitated. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Parsons, with an immense politeness. "'But this is my window.' "'Take it all out.' said Mr. Garvace, turning away. Morrison advanced. Parsons shut the door with a click that arrested Mr. Garvace. "'Come out of that window,' he said. "'You can't dress it, if you want to play the fool with a window.' "'This window's all right,' said the genius in window-dressing. And there was a little pause. "'Open the door, and go right in,' said Mr. Garvace to Morrison. "'You leave that door alone, Morrison,' said Parsons. Polly was no longer even trying to hide behind the stack of bolt and sheetings. He realised he was in the presence of forces too stupendous to heed him. "'Get him out,' said Mr. Garvace. Morrison seemed to be thinking out the ethics of his position. The idea of loyalty to his employer prevailed with him. He laid his hand on the door to open it. Parsons tried to disengage his hand. Mr. Garvace joined his effort to Morrison's. Then the heart of Polly leapt, and the world blazed up to wonder and splendour. Parsons disappeared behind the partition for a moment, and reappeared instantly, gripping a thin cylinder of rolled huckerback. With this he smote at Morrison's head. Morrison's head ducked under the resounding impact, but he clung on, and so did Mr. Garvace. The door came open, and then Mr. Garvace was staggering back, hand to head, his autocratic his sacred baldness, smitten. Parsons was beyond all control, a strangeness, a marvel. Heaven knows how the artistic struggle had strained that richly endowed temperament. "'Say I can't dress a window, you thundering old humbug,' he said, and hurled the hucker back at his master. He followed this up by hurling first a blanket— then an armful of Silesia, then a window support, out of the window and into the shop. It leapt into Polly's mind that Parsons hated his own effort and was glad to demolish it. For a crowded second Polly's mind was concentrated upon Parsons, infuriated, active like a figure of earthquake with its coat off, shying things headlong. Then he perceived the back of Mr. Garvace, and heard his gubernatorial voice crying to no one in particular, and everybody in general, "'Get him out of the window! He's mad! He's dangerous! Get him out of the window!' Then a crimson blanket was for a moment over the head of Mr. Garvace, and his voice, muffled for an instant, broke out into unwonted expletive. 
Then people had arrived from all parts of the bazaar. Luck, the ledger clerk, blundered against Polly and said, Help him! Somerville from the silks vaulted the counter and seized a chair by the back. Polly lost his head. He clawed at the bolt and sheeting before him, and if he could have detached a piece, he would certainly have hit somebody with it. As it was, he simply upset the pile. It fell away from Polly, and he had an impression of somebody squeaking as it went down. It was the sort of impression one discards. The collapse of the pile of goods just sufficed to end his subconscious efforts to get something to hit somebody with, and his whole attention focused itself upon the struggle in the window. For a splendid instant Parsons towered up over the active backs that clustered about the shop window door. An active whirl of gesture, tearing things down and throwing them. And then he went under. There was an instant's furious struggle, a crash, a second crash, and the crack of broken plate glass. Then a stillness, and heavy breathing. Parsons was overpowered. Polly, stepping over scattered pieces of bolt and sheeting, saw his transfigured friend with a dark cut that was not at present bleeding on the forehead, one arm held by Somerville and the other by Morrison. "'You, you, you annoyed me,' said Parsons, sobbing for breath. 3. There are events that detach themselves from the general stream of occurrences, and seem to partake of the nature of revelations. Such was this Parsons affair. It began by seeming grotesque. It ended disconcertingly. The fabric of Mr. Polly's daily life was torn, and beneath it he discovered depths and terrors. Life was not altogether a lark. The calling in of a policeman seemed, at the moment, a pantomime touch. But when it became manifest that Mr. Garvace was in a fury of vindictiveness, the affair took on a different complexion. The way in which the policeman made a note of everything and aspirated nothing impressed the sensitive mind of Polly profoundly. Polly presently found himself straightening up ties to the refrain of "'He then itch you on the head, and—' In the dormitory that night Parsons had become heroic. He sat on the edge of the bed with his head bandaged, packing very slowly, and insisting over and again, "'He ought to have left my window alone, old man. He ought to have touched my window.' Polly was to go to the police court in the morning as a witness. The terror of that ordeal almost overshadowed the tragic fact that Parsons was not only summoned for assault, but swapped, and packing his box. Polly knew himself well enough to know that he would make a bad witness. He felt sure of one fact only, namely that he then hit him on the head, and— all the rest danced about in his mind now. And how it would dance about on the morrow, heaven only knew. Would there be a cross-examination? Is it perjury to make a slip? People did sometimes perjure themselves. Serious offence. Platt was doing his best to help Parsons, and inciting public opinion against Morrison. But Parsons would not hear of anything against Morrison. He was all right, old man, according to his lights, said Parsons. It isn't him I complain of. He speculated on the morrow. I shall have to pay a fine, he said. No good trying to get out of it. It's true. I hit him. I hit him. He paused and seemed to be seeking an exquisite accuracy. His voice sank to a confidential note. On the head about here. He answered the suggestion of a bright junior apprentice in a corner of the dormitory. 
"'What's the good of a cross summons?' he replied, with old Corks the chemist and Mottishead the house-agent, and all that lot on the bench. "'Humble pie. That's my meal tomorrow, old man. Humble pie.' Packing went on for a time. "'But, Lord, what a life it is!' said Parsons, giving his deep notes scope. Ten thirty-five, a man trying to do his duty, mistaken perhaps, but trying his best. Ten forty, ruined, ruined. He lifted his voice to a shout, ruined, and dropped it to, like an earthquake. Hated altercation, said Polly. Like a blooming earthquake, said Parsons, with the notes of a rising wind. He meditated gloomily upon his future, and a colder chill invaded Polly's mind. "'Likely to get another crib, ain't I, with assaulted the governor on my reference? I suppose, though, he wouldn't give me refs. Hard enough to get a crib at the best of times,' said Parsons. "'You ought to go round with the show, old man,' said Mr. Polly. Things were not so dreadful in the police court as Mr. Polly had expected. He was given a seat with other witnesses against the wall of the court, and after an interesting larceny case, Parsons appeared and stood, not in the dock, but at the table. By that time Mr. Polly's legs, which had been tucked up at first under his chair out of respect to the court, were extended straight before him, and his hands were in his trouser pockets. He was inventing names for the four magistrates on the bench, and had got to the grave and reverend seigneur and the palatial boco, when his thoughts were recalled to gravity by the sound of his name. He rose with alacrity, and was fielded by an expert policeman from a brisk attempt to get into the vacant dock. The clerk to the justices repeated the oath with incredible rapidity. Right o said Mr. Polly, but quite respectfully, and kissed the book. His evidence was simple and quite audible, after one warning from the superintendent of police to speak up. He tried to put in a good word for Parsons, by saying that he was naturally of a choleric disposition. But the start and the slow grin of enjoyment upon the face of the grave and reverend seigneur with the palatial boco suggested that the word was not so good as he had thought it. The rest of the bench was frankly puzzled, and there were hasty consultations. "'You mean he has a hot temper?' said the presiding magistrate. "'I mean he has a hot temper.' replied Polly, magically incapable of aspirates for the moment. "'You don't mean he catches cholera?' "'I mean, he's easily put out.' "'Then why didn't you say so?' said the presiding magistrate. Parsons was bound over. He came for his luggage while everyone was in the shop, and Garvace would not let him invade the business to say good-bye. When Mr. Polly went upstairs for margarine and bread and tea, he slipped on into the dormitory at once to see what was happening further in the Parsons case. But Parsons had vanished. There was no Parsons, no trace of Parsons. His cubicle was swept and garnished, for the first time in his life, Polly had a sense of irreparable loss. A minute or so after, Platt dashed in. Oh, he said, and then discovered Polly. Polly was leaning out of the window and did not look around. Platt went up to him. He's gone already, said Platt. Might have stopped to say good-bye to a chap. There was a little pause before Polly replied. He thrust his finger into his mouth and gulped. "'Bit on that beastly tooth of mine,' he said, still not looking at Platt. 
It's made my eyes water, something chronic. Any one might think I was doing a blooming pipe by the look of me. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The History of Mr. Polly This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter the Third Cribs One Port Burdock was never the same place for Mr. Polly after Parsons left it. There were no chest notes in his occasional letter, and little of the joy de vivre got through by them. Parsons had gone, he said, to London, and found a place as a warehouseman in a cheap outfitting store near St. Paul's Churchyard, where references were not required. It became apparent as time passed that new interests were absorbing him. He wrote of socialism and the rights of man, things that had no appeal for Mr. Polly. He felt strangers had got hold of his Parsons, were at work upon him, making him into someone else, something less picturesque. Port Burdock became a dreariness, full of faded memories of Parsons, and work a bore. Platt revealed himself alone as a tiresome companion, obsessed by romantic ideas about intrigues and vices and society women. Mr. Polly's depression manifested itself in a general slackness, a certain impatience in the manner of Mr. Garvace presently got upon his nerves. Relations were becoming strained. He asked for a rise of salary to test his position, and gave notice to leave when it was refused. It took him two months to place himself in another situation, and during that time he had quite a disagreeable amount of loneliness, disappointment, anxiety, and humiliation. He went at first to stay with a married cousin who had a house at Easewood. His widowed father had recently given up the music and bicycle shop, with the post of organist at the parish church that had sustained his income, and was living upon a small annuity as a guest with his cousin, and growing a little tiresome on account of some mysterious internal discomfort that the local practitioner diagnosed as imagination. He had aged with mysterious rapidity, and become excessively irritable. But the cousin's wife was a born manager, and contrived to get along with him. Our Mr. Polly's status was that of a guest, pure and simple. But after a fortnight of congested hospitality, in which he wrote nearly a hundred letters, beginning, Sir, referring to your advertisement in the Christian world for an improver in gents' outfitting, I beg to submit myself for the situation, have had six years' experience, and upset a bottle of ink over the toilet cover and the bedroom carpet. His cousin took him for a walk and pointed out the superior advantages of apartments in London, from which to swoop upon the briefly yawning vacancy. "'Helpful,' said Mr. Polly. "'Very helpful, old man, indeed. I might have gone on there for weeks.' And packed. He got a room in an institution that was partly a benevolent hostel for men in his circumstances, and partly a high-minded but forbidding coffee-house, and a centre for pleasant Sunday afternoons. Mr. Polly spent a critical but pleasant Sunday afternoon in a back seat, inventing such phrases as, Soulful owner of the exorbitant largenial development, and Adam's apple being in question, Earnest joy, exultant, urgent lubriosity. A manly young curate, marking and misunderstanding his preoccupied face and moving lips, 
came and sat by him, and entered into conversation with the idea of making him feel more at home. The conversation was awkward and disconnected for a minute or so, and then suddenly a memory of the Port Burdock Bazaar occurred to Mr. Polly, and with a baffling whisper of, Little dog, and a reassuring nod, he rose up and escaped, to wander out, relieved and observant, into the varied London streets. He found the collection of men he found waiting about in wholesale establishment in Wood Street and St. Paul's Churchyard, where they interview the buyers who have come up from the country, interesting and stimulating, but far too strongly charged with the suggestion of his own fate to be really joyful. There were men in all degrees, between confidence and distress, and in every stage between extravagant smartness and the last stages of decay. There were sunny young men, full of an abounding and elbowing energy, before whom the soul of Polly sank in hate and dismay. Smart juniors, said Polly to himself, full of smart juniosity, the chavacious cult. There were hungry-looking individuals of thirty-five or so that he decided must be proletarians. He had often wanted to find someone who fitted that attractive word. Middle-aged men, too old at forty, discoursed in the waiting-rooms on the outlook in the trade. It had never been so bad, they said, while Mr. Polly wondered if deduced was a permissible epithet. There were men with an overwhelming sense of their importance, manifestly annoyed and angry to find themselves still disengaged, and inclined to suspect a plot. And men so faint-hearted, one was terrified to imagine their behaviour when it came to an interview. There was a fresh-faced young man with an unintelligent face, who seemed to think himself equipped against the world beyond all misadventure by a collar of exceptional height, and another who introduced a note of gaiety by wearing a flannel shirt and a check suit of remarkable virulence. Every day Mr. Polly looked round to mark how many of the familiar faces had gone, and the deepening anxiety, reflecting his own, on the faces that remained, and every day some new type joined the drifting shoal. He realised how small a chance his poor letter from Easewood ran against this hungry cluster of competitors at the fountain head. At the back of Mr. Polly's mind, while he made his observations, was a disagreeable flavour of a dentist's parlour. At any moment his name might be shouted, and he might have to haul himself into the presence of some fresh specimen of employer, and to repeat once more his passionate protestation of interest in the business, his possession of a capacity for zeal, zeal on behalf of anyone who would pay him a yearly salary of twenty-six pounds a year. The prospective employer would unfold his ideals of the employee. I want a smart a willing young man, thoroughly willing, who won't object to take trouble. I don't want a slacker, the sort of fellow who has to be pushed up to his work and held there. I've got no use for him. At the back of Mr. Polly's mind, and quite beyond his control, the insubordinate phrase-maker would be proffering such combinations as chubby chops or chubby charmer as suitable for the gentleman, very much as a hat salesman proffers hats. "'I don't think you'll find much slackness about me, sir,' said Mr. Polly, brightly, trying to disregard his deeper self. "'I want a young man who means getting on.' "'Exactly, sir. Excelsior.' "'I beg your pardon?' Uh, "'I said uh, Excelsior, sir. It's a sort of motto of mine.' from Longfellow. Would you want me to serve through? 
The chubby gentleman explained and reverted to his ideals with a faint air of suspicion. "'Do you mean getting on?' he asked. "'I hope so, sir,' said Mr. Polly. "'Get on or get out, eh?' Mr. Polly made a rapturous noise, nodded appreciation, and said indistinctly, uh, "'Quite my style.' "'Some of my people have been with me twenty years,' said the employer. "'My Manchester buyer came to me as a boy of twelve. "'You're a Christian?' "'A uh, Church of England,' said Mr. Polly. "'Hm,' said the employer, a little checked. "'For good all-around business work I should have preferred a Baptist. "'Still—' "'He studied Mr. Polly's tie.' which was severely neat and businesslike, as became an aspiring outfitter. Mr. Polly's conception of his own prose and expression was rendered by that uncontrollable phrase-monger at the back as obsequies deference. "'I am inclined,' said the prospective employer in a conclusive manner, "'to look up your reference.' Mr. Polly stood up abruptly. "'Thank you,' said the employer, and dismissed him. "'Chump-chops! How about chump-chops?' said the phrase-monger, with an air of inspiration. "'I hope then to hear from you, sir,' said Mr. Polly, in his best salesman manner. "'If everything is satisfactory,' said the prospective employer. Two. A man whose brain devotes its hinterland to making odd phrases and nicknames out of ill-conceived words, whose conception of life is a lump of auriferous rock to which all the value is given by rare veins of unbusiness-like joy, who reads Boccaccio and Rabelais and Shakespeare with gusto, and uses Stertonius Shover and Smart Junior as terms of bitterest opprobrium, is not likely to make a great success under modern business conditions. Mr. Polly dreamt always of picturesque and mellow things, and had an instinctive hatred of the strenuous life. He would have resisted the spell of ex-President Roosevelt, or General Baden-Powell, or Mr. Peter Keary, or the late Dr. Samuel Smiles, quite easily, and he loved Falstaff and Hudibras and coarse laughter, and the old England of Washington Irving, and the memory of Charles the Second's courtly days. His progress was necessarily slow. He did not get rises. He lost situations. There was something in his eye employers did not like. He would have lost his places oftener if he had not been at times an exceptionally brilliant salesman, rather carefully neat, and a slow but very fair window-dresser. He went from situation to situation. He invented a great wealth of nicknames. He conceived enmities and made friends, but none so richly satisfying as Parsons. He was frequently, but mildly and discursively, in love, and sometimes he thought of that girl who had given him a yellow-green apple. He had an idea, amounting to a flattering certainty, whose youthful freshness it was had stirred her to self-forgetfulness, and sometimes he thought of Foxbourne sleeping prosperously in the sun and he began to have moods of discomfort and lassitude and ill-temper due to the beginnings of indigestion. Various forces and suggestions came into his life and swayed him for longer and shorter periods. He went to Canterbury and came under the influence of Gothic architecture. There was a blood affinity between Mr. Polly and the Gothic, in the Middle Ages he would no doubt have sat upon a scaffolding, and carved out penetrating and none too flattering portraits of church dignities upon the capitals. 
and when he strolled with his hands behind his back along the cloisters behind the cathedral and looked at the rich grass plot in the centre he had the strangest sense of being at home far more than he had ever been at home before portly capons he used to murmur to himself under the impression that he was naming a characteristic type of medieval churchman he liked to sit in the nave during the service and look through the great gates at the candles and choristers and listen to the organ sustained voices but the transepts he never penetrated because of the charge for admission the music and the long vista of the fretted roof filled him with a vague and mystical happiness that he had no words even mispronounceable words to express but some of the smug monuments in the aisles got a wreath of epithets metrorious urnfuls funereal claims dejected angelosity for example he wandered about the precincts and speculated about the people who lived in the ripe and cosy houses of grey stone that cluster there so comfortably. Through green doors in high stone walls he caught glimpses of level lawns and blazing flower-beds. Mullioned windows revealed shaded reading lamps and disciplined shelves of brown bound books now and then a dignitary in gaiters would pass him portly capon or a drift of white-robed choir-boys cross a distant arcade and vanish into a doorway or the pink and cream of some girlish dress flit like a butterfly across the cool still spaces of the place particularly he responded to the ruined arches of the benedictine's infirmary and the view of Bell Harry Tower from the school buildings. He was stirred to read the Canterbury Tales, but could not get on with Chaucer's old-fashioned English. It fatigued his attention, and he would have given all the story-telling very readily for a few adventures on the road. He wanted these nice people to live more and yarn less. He liked the wife of Bath very much, he would have liked to have known that woman. At Canterbury, too, he first, to his knowledge, saw Americans. His shop did a good class trade in Westgate Street, and he would see them go on the way to stare at Chaucer's checkers, and then turn down Mercy Lane to Prior Goldstone's gate. It impressed him that they were always in a kind of quiet hurry, and very determined and methodical people much more so than any English he knew. Cultured rapacity, he tried. Verocious return to the heritage. He would expound them, incidentally, to his attendant apprentices. He had overheard a little lady putting her view to a friend near the Christchurch gate. The accent and intonation had hung in his memory, and he would reproduce them more or less accurately. Now, does this Marlowe monument really and truly matter? He had heard the little lady inquire. We've no time for side-shows and second-rate stunts, maybe. We just want the big, simple things of the place. Just the broad, elemental Canterbury proposition. What is it saying to us? I want to get right hold of that, and then have tea in the very room that Chaucer did, and hustle to get that 814 train back to London. He would go over these precious phrases, finding them full of an indescribable flavour. Just the broad, elemental Canterbury proposition, he would repeat. He would try to imagine Parsons confronted with Americans. For his own part, he knew himself to be altogether inadequate. Canterbury was the most congenial situation Mr. Polly ever found during those wander years, albeit a very desert so far as companionship went. 
Three. It was after Canterbury that the universe became really disagreeable to Mr. Polly. It was brought home to him, not so much vividly as with a harsh and ungainly insistence, that he was a failure in his trade. It was not the trade he ought to have chosen, though what trade he ought to have chosen was by no means clear. He made great but irregular efforts, and produced a forced smartness that, like a cheap dye, refused to stand sunshine. He acquired a sort of parsimony also, in which acquisition he was helped by one or two phrases of absolute impecuniosity. But he was hopeless in competition against the naturally gifted, the born hustlers, the young men who meant to get on. He left the Canterbury place very regretfully. He and another commercial gentleman took a boat one Sunday afternoon at Starry on the Sour, when the wind was in the west, and sailed it very happily eastward for an hour. They had never sailed a boat before, and it seemed simple and wonderful. When they turned they found the river too narrow for tacking, and the tide running out like a sluice. They battled back to Sturry in the course of six hours, at a shilling for the first hour and sixpence for each hour thereafter, rowing a mile in an hour and a half or so, until the turn of the tide came to help them. And then they had a night walk to Canterbury, and found themselves remorselessly locked out. The Canterbury employer was an amiable, religious-spirited man, and he would probably not have dismissed Mr. Polly if that unfortunate tendency to phrase things had not shocked him. "'A tide's a tide, sir,' said Mr. Polly, feeling that things were not so bad. "'I've no lunatic power to alter that.' It proved impossible to explain to the Canterbury employer that this was not a highly disrespectful and blasphemous remark. "'And besides, what good are you to me this morning, do you think?' said the Canterbury employer, with your arms pulled out of your sockets. So Mr. Polly resumed his observations in the Wood Street warehouses once more, and had some dismal times. The shoal of fish waiting for the crumbs of employment seemed larger than ever. He took counsel with himself— should he chuck the outfitting? It wasn't any good for him now, and presently, when he was older and his youthful smartness had passed into the dullness of middle age, it would be worse. What else could he do? He could think of nothing. He went one night to a music hall and developed a vague idea of a comic performance. The comic men seemed violent rowdies, and not at all funny. But when he thought of the great pit of the audience yawning before him, he realised that his was an altogether too delicate talent for such a use. He was impressed by the charm of selling vegetables by auction in one of those open shops near London Bridge, but admitted upon reflection his general want of technical knowledge. He made some inquiries about emigration, but none of the colonies were in want of shop assistance without capital. He kept up his attendance in Wood Street. He subdued his ideal of salary by the sum of five pounds a year, and was taken at that into a driving establishment in Clapham, which dealt chiefly in ready-made suits, fed its assistants in an underground dining-room, and kept them till twelve on Saturdays. He found it hard to be cheerful there. His fits of indigestion became worse, and he began to lie awake at night and think. Sunshine and laughter seemed things lost forever. Picnics and shouting in the moonlight. The chief shopwalker took a dislike to him and nagged him. "'Now there, Polly! Look alive, Polly!' became the burthen of his days. 
"'As smart a chap as you could have,' said the chief shopwalker. "'But no zest, no zest, no vim. What's the matter with you?' During his night vigils Mr. Polly had a feeling. A young rabbit must have very much the feeling, when, after a youth of gambling in sunny woods and furtive jolly raids upon the growing wheat, and exciting triumphant bolts before ineffectual casual dogs, it finds itself at last, for a long night of floundering effort and perplexity, in a net for the rest of its life. He could not grasp what was wrong with him. He made enormous efforts to diagnose his case. Was he really just a lazy slacker who ought to buck up? He couldn't find it in him to believe it. He blamed his father a good deal. It's what fathers are for. In putting him to a trade he wasn't happy to follow. But he found it impossible to say what he ought to have followed. He felt there had been something stupid about his school. But just where that came in he couldn't say. He made some perfectly sincere efforts to buck up and shove ruthlessly. But that was infernal, impossible. He had to admit himself miserable, with all the misery of a social misfit, and with no clear prospect of more than the most incidental happiness ahead of him. And for all his attempts at self-reproach or self-discipline, he felt at bottom that he wasn't at fault. As a matter of fact, all the elements of his troubles had been adequately diagnosed by certain high-browed, spectacled gentlemen living at Highbury, wearing a gold pince-nez, and writing for the most part in the beautiful library of the Reform Club. This gentleman did not know Mr. Polly personally, but he had dealt with him generally as one of those ill-adjusted units that abound in a society that has failed to develop a collective intelligence and a collective will for order, commensurate with its complexities. But phrases of that sort had no appeal for Mr. Polly. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four, Section One of the History of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. • Chapter Four, Section One. Mr. Polly, an Orphan. One. Then a great change was brought about in the life of Mr. Polly by the death of his father. His father had died suddenly. The local practitioner still clung to his theory that it was imagination he suffered from, but compromised in the certificate with the appendicitis that was then so fashionable, and Mr. Polly found himself heir to a debatable number of pieces of furniture in the house of his cousin near Eastwood Junction, a family Bible, an engraved portrait of Gary Baldy and a bust of Mr. Gladstone, an invalid gold watch, a gold locket formerly belonging to his mother, some minor jewellery and bric-a-brac, a quantity of nearly valueless old clothes, and an insurance policy, and money in the bank, amounting altogether to the sum of three hundred and ninety-five pounds. Mr. Polly had always regarded his father as an immortal, as an eternal fact, and his father, being of a reserved nature in his declining years, had said nothing about the insurance policy. Both wealth and bereavement, therefore, took Mr. Polly by surprise, and found him a little inadequate. His mother's death had been a childish grief, and long forgotten, and the strongest affection in his life had been for Parsons. An only child of sociable tendencies necessarily turns his back a good deal upon home, and the aunt who had succeeded his mother was an economist and furniture polisher, a knuckle-wrapper and sharp silencer. 
no friend for a slovenly little boy. He had loved other little boys and girls transitorily. None had been frequent and familiar enough to strike deep roots in his heart, and he had grown up with a tattered and dissipated affectionateness that was becoming wildly shy. His father had always been a stranger, an irritable stranger, with exceptional powers of intervention and comment, and an air of being disappointed about his offspring. It was shocking to lose him. It was like an unexpected hole in the universe, and the writing of death upon the sky. But it did not tear Mr. Polly's heart-strings at first, so much as rouse him to a pitch of vivid attention. He came down to the cottage at Easewood in response to an urgent telegram, and found his father already dead. His cousin Johnson received him with much solemnity, and ushered him upstairs to look at a stiff, straight, shrouded form, with a face unwontedly quiet, and, as it seemed with its pinched nostrils, scornful. "'Looks uh, peaceful,' said Mr. Polly, disregarding the scorn to the best of his ability. "'It was a merciful relief,' said Mr. Johnson. There was a pause. Second, uh, second departed I've ever seen, not counting mummies,' said Mr. Polly, feeling it necessary to say something. "'We did uh, all we could.' Uh, no doubt of it, old man, said Mr. Polly. A second long pause followed, and then, much to Mr. Polly's great relief, Johnson moved towards the door. Afterwards, Mr. Polly went for a solitary walk in the evening light, and as he walked, suddenly his dead father became real to him. He thought of things far away down the perspective of memory, of jolly moments when his father had skylarked with a wildly excited little boy, of a certain annual visit to the Crystal Palace pantomime, full of trivial, glittering incidents and wonders, of his father's dread back while customers were in the old, minutely known shop. It is curious that the memory which seemed to link him nearest to the dead man was the memory of a fit of passion. His father had wanted to get a small sofa up the narrow winding staircase from the little room behind the shop to the bedroom above, and it had jammed. For a time his father had coaxed, and then groaned like a soul in torment, and given way to blind fury, had sworn, kicked and struck at the offending piece of furniture, and finally wrenched it upstairs with considerable incidental damage to lath and plaster, and one of the casters. That moment, when self-control was altogether torn aside, the shocked discovery of his father's perfect humanity had left a singular impression on Mr. Polly's queer mind. It was as if something extravagantly vital had come out of his father, and laid a warmly passionate hand upon his heart. He remembered that now very vividly, and it became a clue to endless other memories that had else been dispersed and confusing. A weakly, willful being struggling to get obdurate things round impossible corners. In that symbol Mr. Polly could recognise himself, and all the trouble of humanity. He hadn't had a particularly good time, poor old chap and now it was all over, finished. Johnson was the sort of man who derives great satisfaction from a funeral, a melancholy, serious, practical-minded man of five-and-thirty, with great powers of advice. He was the upline ticket clerk at Easewood Junction, and felt the responsibilities of his position. He was naturally thoughtful and reserved, and greatly sustained in that by an innate rectitude of body, and an overhanging and forward inclination of the upper part of his face and head. He was pale but freckled, 
and his dark grey eyes were deeply set. His lightest interest was cricket, but he did not take that lightly. His chief holiday was to go to a cricket match, which he did as if he was going to church, and he watched critically, applauded sparingly, and was darkly offended by any unorthodox play. His convictions upon all subjects were taciturnly inflexible. He was an obstinate player of draughts and chess, and an earnest and persistent reader of the British Weekly. His wife was a pink, short, willfully smiling, managing, ingratiating, talkative woman, who was determined to be pleasant, and take a bright, hopeful view of everything, even when it was not really bright and hopeful. She had large, blue, expressive eyes and a round face, and she always spoke of her husband as Harold. She addressed sympathetic and considerate remarks about the deceased Mr. Polly in notes of brisk encouragement. "'He was really quite cheerful at the end,' she said several times with congratulatory gusto. "'Quite cheerful.' She made dying seem almost agreeable. Both these people were resolved to treat Mr. Polly very well, and to help his exceptional incompetence in every possible way, and after a simple supper of ham and bread and cheese and pickles, and cold apple tart and small beer had been cleared away, they put him into the armchair almost as though he was an invalid, and sat on chairs that made them look down on him, and opened a directive discussion for the arrangements for the funeral. After all, a funeral is a distinct social opportunity, and rare when you have no family and few relations, and they did not want to see it spoilt and wasted. "'You'll have a hearse, of course,' said Mrs. Johnson. "'Not one of them combinations with the driver sitting on the coffin. Disrespectful, I think they are. I can't fancy how people can bring themselves to be buried in combinations.' She flattened her voice in a manner she used to imitate aesthetic feeling. "'I do like them glass hearses.' she said. So refined and nice they are. "'Podger's hearse you'll have,' said Johnson conclusively. "'It's the best in Easewood.' "'Everything that's right and proper,' said Mr. Polly. "'Podger's ready to come and measure at any time,' said Johnson. "'Then you'll want a mourner's carriage or two, according as to whom you're going to invite,' said Mr. Johnson. "'Uh,' "'Didn't think of inviting anyone,' said Polly. "'Oh, you'll have to ask a few friends,' said Mr. Johnson. "'You can't let your father go to his grave without asking a few friends.' "'A funereal baked meats, like,' said Mr. Polly. "'Not baked, but of course you'll have to give them something. Ham and chicken's very suitable.' You don't want a lot of cooking with the ceremony coming into the middle of it. I wonder who Alfred ought to invite, Harold. Just the immediate relations? One doesn't want a great crowd of people, and one doesn't want not to show respect. But he hated our relations, most of them. He's not hating them now, said Mrs. Johnson. You may be sure of that. It's just because of that I think they ought to come, all of them, even your Auntie Mildred. A bit vulture, isn't it? said Mr. Polly, unheeded. Oh, wouldn't be more than twelve or thirteen people if they all came, said Mr. Johnson. We could have everything put out ready in the back room, and the gloves and the whiskey in the front room, and while we were all at the ceremony, Bessie could bring it all into the front room on a tray, and put it out nice and proper. There'd have to be whisky, and cherry or port for the ladies. "'Where will you get your morning?' asked Johnson abruptly. Mr. Polly had not yet considered this by-product of sorrow. "'Haven't thought of it yet, old man.' A disagreeable feeling spread over his body as though he was blackening as he sat. He hated black garments. 
I suppose I must have mourning, he said. Well, said Johnson, with a solemn smile. Got to see it through, said Mr. Polly, indistinctly. If I were you, said Johnson, I should get ready-made trousers. That's all you really want, and a black satin tie and a top hat with a deep mourning band, and gloves. Jet cufflinks he ought to have, as chief mourner, said Mrs. Johnson. Not obligatory, said Johnson. It shows respect, said Mrs. Johnson. It shows respect, of course, said Johnson. And then Mrs. Johnson went on with the utmost gusto to the details of the casket, while Mr. Polly sat more and more deeply drooping into the armchair, assenting with a note of protest to all they said. After he had retired for the night, he remained for a long time perched on the edge of the sofa which was his bed, staring at the prospect before him. "'Chasing the old man about up to the last,' he said. He hated the thought and elaboration of death as a healthy animal must hate it. His mind struggled with unwanted social problems. "'Got to put them away somehow, I suppose,' said Mr. Polly. "'Wish I'd looked him up a bit more while he was alive,' said Mr. Polly. 2. Bereavement came to Mr. Polly before the realisation of opulence and its anxieties and responsibilities. That only dawned upon him on the morrow, which chanced to be Sunday, as he walked with Johnson before church-time about the tangle of struggling building enterprises that constituted the rising urban district of Easewood. Johnson was off duty that morning, and devoted the time very generously to the admonitory discussion of Mr. Polly's worldly outlook. "'Don't seem to get the hang of the business somehow,' said Mr. Polly. "'Too much blooming humbug in it for my way of thinking.' "'If I were you,' said Mr. Johnson, I should push for a first-class place in London. Take almost nothing and live on my reserves. That's what I should do. Come the heavy, said Mr. Polly. Get a better class reference. There was a pause. Think of uh, investing your money? asked Johnson. Hardly got used to the idea of having it yet, old man. You'll have to do something with it. Give you nearly twenty pounds a year if you invest it properly. Haven't seen it yet in that light, said Mr. Polly, defensively. There's no end of things you could put it into. It's getting it out again I shouldn't feel sure of. I'm no sort of financier. Sooner back horses. I wouldn't do that if I was you. Not my style, old man. "'It's a nest egg,' said Johnson. Mr. Polly made an indeterminate noise. "'There's uh, building societies,' Johnson threw out in a speculative tone. Mr. Polly, with detached brevity, admitted that there were. "'You might lend it on mortgage,' said Johnson. "'Very safe form of investment.' Shan't think anything about it, not till the old man's underground," said Mr. Polly with an inspiration. They turned a corner that led towards the junction. "Might do worse," said Johnson. "Then put it into a small shop." At the moment, this remark made very little appeal to Mr. Polly, but afterwards it developed. It fell into his mind like some small obscure seed, and germinated. "'These shops aren't in a bad position,' said Johnson. The row he referred to gaped in the late painful stage in building, before the healing touch of the plasterer assuages the roughness of the brickwork. The space for the shop yawned an oblong gap below framed above by an iron girder, windows and fittings to suit tenant, 
a board at the end of the row promised, and behind was the door space and a glimpse of stairs going up to the living rooms above. Not a bad position, said Johnson, and led the way into the establishment. Room for fixtures there, he said, pointing to the blank wall. The two men went upstairs to the little sitting room, or best bedroom, it would have to be, above the shop. Then they descended to the kitchen below. Rooms in a new house always look a bit small, said Johnson. They came out of the house again by the prospective back door, and picked their way through the builder's litter across the yard space to the road again. They drew nearer the junction to where a pavement and shops, already opened and active, formed the commercial centre of Easewood. On the opposite side of the way, the side door of a flourishing little establishment opened, and a man and his wife and a little boy in a sailor suit came into the street. The wife was a pretty woman in brown, with a floriferous straw hat, and the group was altogether very Sundayfied and shiny and spick and span. The shop itself had a large plate-glass window, whose contents were now veiled by a buff blind on which was inscribed in scrolly letters, Rhymer, Pork Butcher and Provision Merchant, and then, with voluptuous elaboration, The World-Famed Easewood Sausage. Greetings were exchanged between Mr. Johnson and this distinguished comestible. "'Off to church already?' said Johnson. "'Walking across the fields to Little Dorrington,' said Mr. Rymer. "'Very pleasant walk,' said Johnson. "'Very,' said Mr. Rymer. "'Hope you'll enjoy it,' said Mr. Johnson. "'That chap's done well,' said Johnson, sotto voce, as they went on. "'Came here with nothing, practically, four years ago.' and thin as a lath. Look at him now. He's worked hard, of course, said Johnson, improving the occasion. Thought fell between the cousins for a space. Some men can do one thing, said Johnson, and some another. For a man who sticks to it, there's a lot to be done in a shop. End of chapter 4, section 1《Chapter Four, Section Two of the History of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Four, Section Two. Three. All the preparations for the funeral ran easily and happily under Mrs. Johnson's skilful hands. On the eve of the sad event, she produced a reserve of black sateen the kitchen steps and a box of tin tacks, and decorated the house with festoons and bows of black in the best possible taste. She tied up the knocker with black crepe, and put a large bow over the corner of the steel engraving of Garibaldi, and swathed the bust of Mr. Gladstone that had belonged to the deceased with inky swathing. She turned the two vases that had views of Tivoli and the Bay of Naples round, so that these rather brilliant landscapes were hidden, and only the plain blue enamel showed, and she anticipated the long-contemplated purchase of a tablecloth for the front room, and substituted a violet-purple cover for the now very worn and faded raptures and roses in plushette, that hitherto had done duty there. Everything that loving consideration could do to impart a dignified solemnity to her little home was done. She had released Mr. Polly from the irksome duty of issuing invitations, and as the moments of assembly drew near, she sent him and Mr. Johnson out into the long strip of garden at the back of the house, to be free to put a finishing touch or so to her preparations. She sent them out together because she had a queer little persuasion at the back of her mind 
that Mr. Polly wanted to bolt from his sacred duties, and there was no way out of the garden except through the house. Mr. Johnson was a steady, successful gardener, and particularly good with celery and peas. He walked slowly along the narrow path down the centre, pointing out to Mr. Polly a number of interesting points in the management of peas, wrinkles neatly applied, and difficulties wisely overcome, and all that he did for the comfort and appropriation of that fitful but rewarding vegetable. Presently a sound of nervous laughter and raised voices from the house proclaimed the arrival of the earlier guests, and the worst of that anticipatory tension was over. When Mr. Polly re-entered the house he found three entirely strange young women with pink faces, demonstrative manners, and empathic mourning, engaged in an incoherent conversation with Mrs. Johnson. All three kissed him with great gusto, after the ancient English fashion. Are "'These are your cousins, Larkins,' said Mrs. Johnson. "'That's Annie,' unexpected hug and smack. "'That's Miriam,' resolute hug and smack. "'And that's Minnie,' prolonged hug and smack. "'Right ho,' said Mr. Polly emerging a little crumpled and breathless from this hearty introduction. "'I see. "'Here's Aunt Larkins,' said Mrs. Johnson, as an elderly and stouter edition of the three young women appeared in the doorway. Mr. Polly backed rather faint-heartedly, but Aunt Larkins was not to be denied. Having hugged and kissed her nephew resoundingly, she gripped him by the wrists— and scanned his features. She had a round, sentimental, freckled face. "'I should have known him anywhere,' she said with fervour. "'Hark a mother,' said the cousin, called Annie. "'Why, she's never set eyes on him before.' "'I should have known him anywhere,' said Mrs. Larkins. "'For Lizzie's child, you've got her eyes. It's a resemblance. And as for never seeing him—' "'I've dandled him, Miss Imperance. I've dandled him.' "'You couldn't dandle him now, Ma,' Miss Annie remarked with a shriek of laughter. All the sisters laughed at that. "'Oh, the things you say, Annie,' said Miriam, and for a time the room was full of mirth. Mr. Polly felt it incumbent upon him to say something. "'My dandling days are over,' he said. The reception of this remark could have convinced a far more modest character than Mr. Polly that it was extremely witty. Mr. Polly followed it up by another one almost equally good. "'My turn to dandle,' <laughs> he said with a sly look at his aunt, and convulsed every one. "'Not me,' said Mrs. Larkins, taking his point. "'Thank you,' and achieved a climax." It was queer, but they seemed to be easy people to get on with anyhow. They were still picking little ripples and giggles of mirth from the idea of Mr. Polly dandling Aunt Larkins, when Mr. Johnson, who had answered the door, ushered in a stooping figure, who was at once hailed by Mrs. Johnson as, "'Why, Uncle Penstemon!' Uncle Penstemon was rather a shock. He was an aged rather than venerable figure. Time had removed the hair from the top of his head, and distributed a small dividend of the plunder in little bunches, carelessly and impartially, over the rest of his features. He was dressed in a very big old frock-coat, and a long cylindrical top-hat, which he kept on. He was very much bent, and he carried a rush-basket from which protruded coy imitations of the lettuces and onions he had brought to grace the occasion. He hobbled into the room, resisting the efforts of Johnson to divest himself of his various encumbrances, halted, and surveyed the company with an expression of profound hostility, breathing hard. Recognition quickened in his eyes. 
You here, he said to Aunt Larkins, and then, You would be. Those your gals? They are, said Aunt Larkins, and better gals. That Annie? asked Uncle Penstemon, pointing a horny thumbnail. Fancy your remembering her name. She mucked up my mushroom bed, the baggage, said Uncle Penstemon ungenially, and I give it to her to rights. Trounced her I did, fairly, I remember her. Here's some green stuff for you, Grace. Fresh it is, and wholesome. I shall be wanting the basket back, and mind you let me have it. Have you nailed him down yet? You always was a bit in front of what was needful. His attention was drawn inward by a troublesome tooth, and he sucked at it spitefully. There was something potent about this old man that silenced every one for a moment or two. He seemed a fragment from the ruder agricultural past of our race, like a lump of soil among things of paper. He put his basket of vegetables very deliberately on the new violet tablecloth, removed his hat carefully, and dabbled his brow, and wiped out his hat-brim with a crimson and yellow pocket-handkerchief. "'I'm glad you were able to come, Uncle,' said Mrs. Johnson. "'Oh, I came,' said Uncle Penstemon. "'I came.' He turned on Mrs. Larkins. "'Gals in service?' he asked. "'They aren't, and they won't be,' said Mrs. Larkins. "'No,' he said with infinite meaning, and turned his eye on Mr. Polly. "'You Lizzie's boy,' he said. Mr. Polly was spared much self-exposition by the tumult occasioned by further arrivals. "'Oh, here's May Punt,' said Mrs. Johnson, and a small woman dressed in the borrowed mourning of a large woman, and leading a very small, long-haired, observant little boy, it was his first funeral, appeared, closely followed by several friends of Mrs. Johnson, who had come to swell the display of respect, and made only vague, confused impressions upon Mr. Polly's mind. Aunt Mildred, who was an unexpected family scandal, had declined Mrs. Johnson's hospitality. Every one was in profound mourning, of course, mourning in the modern English style, with the dyer's handiwork only too apparent, with hats and jackets of the current cut. There was very little crepe, and the costumes had none of the goodness and specialization and genuine enjoyment of mourning for mourning's sake that a similar continental gathering would have displayed. Still, that congestion of strangers in black sufficed to stun and confuse Mr. Polly's impressionable mind. It seemed to him much more extraordinary than anything he had expected. "'Now, gals,' said Mrs. Larkins, "'see if you can help.' And the three daughters became confusingly active between the front room and the back. "'I hope every one will take a glass of sherry and a biscuit.' said Mrs. Johnson, we don't stand on ceremony, and a decanter appeared in the place of Uncle Penstemon's vegetables. Uncle Penstemon had refused to be relieved of his hat. He sat stiffly down on a chair against the wall with that venerable headdress between his feet, watching the approach of any one jealously. "'Don't you go squashing my hat,' he said. Conversation became confused and general. Uncle Penstemon addressed himself to Mr. Polly. "'You're a little chap,' he said, "'a puny little chap. I never did agree to Lizzie marrying him, but I suppose bygones must be bygones now. I suppose they made you into a clerk or something.' "'Outfitter,' said Mr. Polly. "'I remember.' Them girls pretend to be dressmakers. They are dressmakers, said Mrs. Larkins across the room. I will take a glass of sherry, 
They hold to it, you see. He took the glass Mrs. Johnson handed him, and poised it critically between a horny finger and thumb. You'll be paying for this, he said to Mr. Polly. Here's to you. Don't you go treading on my hat, young woman. You brush your skirts against it, and take a shilling off its value. It ain't the sort of hat you see nowadays. He drank noisily. The sherry presently loosened everybody's tongue, and the early coldness passed. "'There ought to have been a post-mortem,' Polly heard Mrs. Punt remarking to one of Mrs. Johnson's friends, and Miriam and another were lost in admiration of Mrs. Johnson's decorations. "'So very nice and refined,' they were both repeating at intervals. The sherry and biscuits were still being discussed when Mr. Podger, the undertaker, arrived, a broad, cheerfully sorrowful, clean-shaven little man, accompanied by a melancholy-faced assistant. He conversed for a time with Johnson in the passage outside. The sense of his business stilled the rising waves of chatter and carried off everyone's attention in the wake of his heavy footsteps to the room above. Four. Things crowded upon Mr. Polly. Everyone, he noticed, took sherry with a solemn avidity, and a small portion even was administered sacramentally to the punt boy. There followed a distribution of black kid gloves, and much trying on and humouring of fingers. "'Good gloves,' said one of Mrs. Johnson's friends. "'There's a little pair there for Willie,' said Mrs. Johnson triumphantly. Everyone seemed gravely content with the amazing procedure of the occasion. Presently Mr. Podger was picking out Mr. Polly as chief mourner to go with Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Larkins, and Annie in the first mourning carriage. "'Right-o,' said Mr. Polly, and repented instantly of the alacrity of the phrase. "'There'll have to be a walking party,' said Mrs. Johnson cheerfully. "'There's only two coaches. I dare say we can put six in each, but that leaves three over.' There was a general struggle to be a pedestrian, and the two other Larkins girls, confessing coyly to tight new boots and displaying a certain eagerness, were added to the contents of the first carriage. "'It'll be a squeeze,' said Annie. "'I don't mind a squeeze,' said Mr. Polly. He decided privately that the proper phrase for the result of that remark was, "'Hysterical catunations.' Mr. Podger re-entered the room from a momentary supervision of the bumping business that was now proceeding down the staircase. "'Bearing up,' he said cheerfully, rubbing his hands together. "'Bearing up.' That struck very vividly in Mr. Polly's mind, and so did the close-wedged drive to the churchyard, bunched in between two young women in confused, dull and shiny black, and the fact that the wind was bleak and the officiating clergyman had a cold and sniffed between his sentences. The wonder of life, the wonder of everything! What had he expected, that this should all be so astoundingly different? He found his attention converging more and more upon the Larkin's cousins. The interest was reciprocal. They watched him with a kind of suppressed excitement, and became risable with his every word and gesture. He was more and more aware of their personal quality. Annie had blue eyes and a red, attractive mouth, a harsh voice, and a habit of extreme liveliness that even this occasion could not suppress. Minnie was fond, extremely free about the touching of hands and such-like endearments. Miriam was quieter, and regarded him earnestly. Mrs. Larkins was very happy in her daughters, and they had the naive affectionateness of those who see few people and find a strange cousin a wonderful outlet. Mr. Polly had never been very much kissed, and it made his mind swim. 
He did not know for the life of him whether he liked or disliked all or any of the Larkins' cousins. It was rather attractive to make them laugh. They laughed at anything. There they were, tugging at his mind, and the funeral tugging at his mind too, and the sense of himself as chief mourner in a brand new silk hat with a broad mourning band. He watched the ceremony and missed his responses, and strange feelings twisted at his heartstrings. 5. Mr. Polly walked back to the house because he wanted to be alone. Miriam and Minnie would have accompanied him, but finding Uncle Penstemon beside the chief mourner, they went on in front. "'You're wise,' said Uncle Penstemon. "'Glad you think so.' said Mr. Polly, rousing himself to talk. "'I like a bit of walking before a meal,' said Uncle Penstemon, and made a kind of large hiccup. "'That sherry rises,' he remarked. "'Grocer's stuff, I expect.' He went on to ask how much the funeral might be costing, and seemed pleased to find that Mr. Polly didn't know. "'In that case,' he said impressively, "'it's pretty certain to cost more than you expect, my boy.' He meditated for a while. Oh, "'I've seen a mort of undertakers,' he declared. "'A mort of undertakers.' The Larkins girls attracted his attention. "'Let's lodgings and chars,' he commented. Least way she goes out to cook dinners, and look at em, dressed up to the nines, if it ain't borrowed clothes, that is, and they goes to work at a factory. Ah, uh, did you know my father much, Uncle Penstemon? asked Mr. Polly. Couldn't stand Lizzie throwing herself away like that, said Uncle Penstemon and repeated his hiccup on a larger scale. "'That weren't good sherry,' said Uncle Penstemon, with the first note of pathos Mr. Polly had detected in his quavering voice. The funeral in the rather cold wind had proved wonderfully appetizing, and every eye brightened at the sight of the cold collation that was now spread in the front room. Mrs. Johnson was very brisk, and Mr. Polly, when he re-entered the house, found everyone sitting down. "'Come along, Alfred,' cried the hostess cheerfully. "'We can't very well begin without you. Have you got the bottled beer ready to open, Betsy? Uncle, you'll have a drop of whisky, I expect.' "'Put it where I can mix it for myself,' said Uncle Penstemon, placing his hat very carefully out of harm's way on the bookcase. There were two cold boiled chickens, which Johnson carved with great care and justice, and a nice piece of ham, some brawn and a steak and kidney pie, a large bowl of salad, and several sorts of pickles, and afterwards came cold apple tart, jam roll, and a good piece of Stilton cheese, lots of bottled beer, some lemonade for the ladies, and milk for Master Punt. A very bright and satisfying meal. Mr. Polly found himself seated between Mrs. Punt, who was very much preoccupied with Master Punt's table manners, and one of Mrs. Johnson's school friends, who was exchanging reminiscences of school days and news of how various common friends had changed and married with Mrs. Johnson. Opposite him was Miriam, and another of the Johnson circle, and also he had brawn to carve, and there was hardly room for the helpful Betsy to pass behind his chair, so that altogether his mind would have been amply distracted from any mortuary broodings, even if a wordy warfare about the education of the modern young woman had not sprung up between Uncle Penstemon and Mrs. Larkins, and threatened for a time, in spite of a word or so in season from Johnson, to wreck all the harmony 
of the sad occasion. The general effect was after this fashion. First an impression of Mrs. Punt on the right, speaking in a refined undertone. "'You didn't, I suppose, Mr. Polly, think to have your poor father post-mortemed?' Lady on the left side breaking in. "'I was just reminding Grace of the dear dead days beyond recall.' Attempted reply to Mrs. Punt. "'I didn't think of it for a moment. Uh, "'Can't I give you a piece of this brawn, can I?' A fragment from the left. "'Grace and beauty, they used to call us, "'and we used to sit at the same desk.' Mrs. Punt, breaking out suddenly, "'Don't swallow your fork, Willie. "'You see, Mr. Polly, "'I used to have a young gentleman, "'a medical student, lodging with me.' Voice from down the table. "'And, Alfred, I didn't give you very much.' Bessie became evident at the back of Mr. Polly's chair, struggling wildly to get past. Mr. Polly did his best to be helpful. "'Can you get past? Let me sit forward a bit. Ooh, uh, right-o!' The lady to the left going on valiantly, and speaking to everyone who cares to listen, while Mrs. Johnson beams beside her. "'There she used to sit, as bold as brass.' and the fun she used to make of things no one could believe, knowing her now. She used to make faces at the mistress through the— Mrs. Punt, keeping steadily on. The content of the stomach, at any rate, ought to be examined. Voice of Mr. Johnson. Ilfrid, uh, pass the mustard down. Miriam, leaning across the table. Ilfrid, once she got us all kept in. The whole school. Miriam, more insistently, Alfred. Uncle Penstemon, raising his voice defiantly, Trounce her again, I would, if she did as much now, that I would, dratted mischief. Miriam, catching Mr. Polly's eyes, Alfred, this lady knows Canterbury. I've been telling her you've been there. Mr. Polly, uh, glad you know it. The lady, shouting, I like it. Mrs. Larkins, raising her voice, I won't have my girl spoken of, not by nobody, old or young. Pop, imperfectly located. Mr. Johnson, at large, Ain't the beer up, it's the eated room. Bessie. Excuse me, sir, passing so soon again, but, Rest inaudible, Mr. Polly accommodating himself. Ooh, uh, right, right-o. The knives and forks, probably by some secret common agreement, clash and clatter together and drown every other sound. Nobody had the least idea how he died. Nobody. Willie, don't gollop so. You ain't in a hurry, are you? You don't want to catch a train or anything. Golloping like that. Do you remember, Grace, how one day we had writing lesson? Nicer girls no one ever had, though I say it who shouldn't. Mrs. Johnson, in a shrill, clear, hospitable voice. Harold, won't Mrs. Larkins have a teeny bit more fowl? Mr. Polly, rising to the situation. Or some brawn, Mrs. Larkins? Catching Uncle Penstemon's eye. "'Can't send you some brawn, sir.' "'Alfred!' Loud hiccup from Uncle Penstemon. Momentary consternation, followed by a giggle from Annie. The narration at Mr. Polly's elbow pursued a quiet but relentless course. "'Directly the new doctor came in, he said, "'Everything must be took out and put in spirits.' "'Everything.' "'Willie.' "'Audible.' Ingurgitation. The narration on the left was flourishing up to a climax. Ladies, she says, dip their pens in their ink and keep their noses out of it. Alfred, persuasively. Certain people may cast snacks at other people's daughters, never having had any of their own, though two poor souls of wives dead and buried through their goings-on. Johnson ruling the storm. 
We don't want old scores dug up on such a day as this. Old scores you may call them, but worth a dozen of them that put them to their rest, poor dears. Alfred, with a note of remonstrance, if you choke yourself, my lord, not another mouthful do you have. No nice pudding, nothing. And she kept us in, she did, every afternoon for a week. It seemed to be the end, and Mr. Polly replied with an air of being profoundly impressed. Uh, really? Alfred? A little disheartened. And then they had it. They found he'd swallowed the very key to unlock the drawer. Then don't let people go casting snacks. Who's casting snacks? Alfred, this lady wants to know, have the Prossers left Canterbury? No wish to make myself disagreeable, not to God's amplest worm. Alf, you aren't very busy with that brawn up there. And so on, for the hour. The general effect on Mr. Polly at the time was at once confusing and exhilarating, but it led him to eat copiously and carelessly, and long before the end, when, after an hour and a quarter, a movement took the party, and it pushed away its cheese-plate and rose, sighing and stretching from the remnants of the repast, Little streaks and bands of dyspeptic irritation and melancholy were darkening the serenity of his mind. He stood between the mantel-shelf and the window. The blinds were up now, and the Larkin sisters clustered about him. He battled with the oncoming depression, and forced himself to be extremely facetious about two noticeable rings on Annie's hand. "'They ain't real,' said Annie coquettishly. Got em out of a prize packet. Prize packet in trousers, I expect, her, <laughs> said Mr. Polly, and awakened indistinguishable laughter. Oh, the things you say, said Minnie, slapping his shoulder. Suddenly, something he had quite extraordinarily forgotten came into his head. Bless my heart, he cried, suddenly serious. What's the matter? asked Johnson. Ought to have gone back to the shop. Three days ago. They'll make no end of a row. Law, you are a treat, said Cousin Annie, and screamed with laughter at a delicious idea. You'll get the chuck, she said. Mr. Polly made a convulsing grimace at her. I'll die, she said. I don't believe you care a bit. Feeling a little disorganized by her hilarity, and a shocked expression that had come into the face of Cousin Miriam, he made some indistinct excuse, and went out through the back door and scullery into the little garden. The cool air and a very slight drizzle of rain was a relief, anyhow, but the black mood of the replete dyspeptic had come upon him. His soul darkened hopelessly. He walked with his hands in his pockets down the paths between the rows of exceptionally cultured peas, and, unreasonably, overwhelmingly, he was smitten by sorrow for his father. The heady noise and muddle and confused excitement of the feast passed from him like a curtain drawn away. He thought of that hot and angry and struggling creature who had tugged and sworn so foolishly at the sofa upon the twisted staircase, and who was now lying still and hidden at the bottom of a wall-sided oblong pit beside the heaped gravel that would presently cover him. The stillness of it, the wonder of it, the infinite reproach, hatred for all these people, all of them, possessed. Mr. Polly's soul. Hen-witted gigglers, said Mr. Polly. He went down to the fence and stood with his hands on it, staring away at nothing. He stayed there for what seemed a long time. From the house came a sound of raised voices that subsided, and then Mrs. Johnson calling for Bessie. Ghoulish gusto, 
said Mr. Polly. Jumping it in. Funereal games. Don't hurt him, of course. Doesn't matter to him. Nobody missed Mr. Polly for a long time. When at last he reappeared among them, his eye was almost grim, but nobody noticed his eye. They were looking at watches, and Johnson was being omniscient about trains. They seemed to discover Mr. Polly afresh just at the moment of parting, and said a number of more or less appropriate things. But Uncle Penstemon was far too worried about his rush basket, which had been carelessly mislaid, he seemed to think with larcenous intentions, to remember Mr. Polly at all. Mrs. Johnson had tried to fob him off with a similar but inferior basket. His own had one handle mended with string, according to a method of particular virtue and inimitable distinction known only to himself, and the old gentleman had taken her attempt as the gravest reflection upon his years and intelligence. Mr. Polly was left very largely to the Larkins trio. Cousin Minnie became shameless and kept kissing him good-bye, and then finding out it wasn't time to go. Cousin Miriam seemed to think her silly, and caught Mr. Polly's eye sympathetically. Cousin Annie ceased to giggle, and lapsed into a nearly sentimental state. She said with real feeling that she had enjoyed the funeral more than words could tell. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5, Section 1 of The History of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 5. Mr. Polly Takes a Vacation. 1. Mr. Polly returned to Clapham from the funeral celebration, prepared for trouble, and took his dismissal in a manly spirit. You've merely anticipated me by a hair he said politely, and he told them in the dormitory that he meant to take a little holiday before his next crib, though a certain inherited reticence suppressed the fact of the legacy. "'Oh, you'll do that all right,' said Askoff, the head of the boot-shop. "'It's quite the fashion just at present. Six weeks in wonderful Wood Street. They're running excursions.' "'A little holiday.' That was the form his sense of wealth took first, that it made a little holiday possible. Holidays were his life, and the rest merely adulterated living, and now he might take a little holiday and have money for railway fares and money for meals and money for inns. But he wanted someone to take the holiday with. For a time he cherished the design of hunting up Parsons, getting him to throw up his situation, and going with him to Stratford-on-Avon, and Shrewsbury, and the Welsh Mountains, and the Wye, and a lot of places like that, for a really gorgeous, careless, illimitable old holiday of a month. But, alas, Parsons had gone from the St. Paul's churchyard outfitter long ago, and left no address. Mr. Polly tried to think he would be almost as happy wandering alone, but he knew better. He dreamt of casual encounters with delightful, interesting people by the wayside, even romantic encounters. Such things happened in Chaucer and Bocashu. They happened with extreme facility in Mr. Richard Le Gallienne's very detrimental book, The Quest of the Golden Girl, which he had read at Canterbury, but he had no confidence they would happen in England to him. When, a month later, he came out of the Clapham side door at last into the bright sunshine of a fine London day, with a dazzling sense of limitless freedom upon him, he did nothing more adventurous than order the cabman to drive to Waterloo, and there take a ticket for Easewood. He wanted— what did he want most in life? 
I think his distinctive craving is best expressed as fun, fun in companionship. He had already spent a pound or two upon three select feasts to his fellow assistants, sprats up as they were, and there had been a great and very successful Sunday pilgrimage to Richmond by Wandswood and Wimbledon's Open Common, a trailing garrulous company walking about a solemnly happy host, to wonderful cold meat and salad at the Roebuck, a bowl of punch, punch, and a bill to correspond. But now it was a weekday, and he went down to Easewood with his bag and portmanteau in a solitary compartment, and looked out of the window upon a world in which every possible congenial seemed either toiling or in a situation or else looking for one with a gnawing and hopelessly preoccupying anxiety. He stared out of the window at the exploitation roads of suburbs, and rows of houses all very much alike, either emphatically and impatiently to let, or full of rather busy, unsociable people. Near Wimbledon he had a glimpse of golf links, and saw two elderly gentlemen who, had they chosen, might have been gentlemen of grace and leisure, addressing themselves to smite little hunted white balls, great distances, with the utmost bitterness and dexterity. Mr. Polly couldn't understand them. Every road, he remarked, as freshly as though he had never observed it before, was bordered by inflexible palings, or iron fences, or severely disciplined hedges. He wondered if perhaps abroad there might be beautifully careless, unenclosed high roads. Perhaps, after all, the best way of taking a holiday is to go abroad. He was haunted by the memory of what was either a half-forgotten picture or a dream. A carriage was drawn up by the wayside, and four beautiful people, two men and two women, graciously dressed were dancing a formal, ceremonious dance, full of bows and curtsies, to the music of a wandering fiddler they had encountered. They had been driving one way, and he walking another, a happy encounter with this obvious result. They might have come straight out of happy Thelim, whose motto is, Do what thou wilt. The driver had taken his two sleek horses out, they grazed unchallenged, and he sat on a stone, clapping time with his hand while the fiddler played. The shade of the trees did not altogether shut out the sunshine. The grass in the wood was lush and full of still daffodils. The turf they danced on was starred with daisies. Mr. Polly, dear heart, firmly believed that things like that could and did happen somewhere. Only it puzzled him that morning that he never saw them happening. Perhaps they happened south of Guildford. Perhaps they happened in Italy. Perhaps they ceased to happen a hundred years ago. Perhaps they happened just round the corner, on weekdays when all good Mr. Polly's are safely shut up in shops. And so dreaming of delightful impossibilities till his heart ached for them, he was rattled along in the suburban train to Johnson's discreet home, and the briskly stimulating welcome of Mrs. Johnson. 2. Mr. Polly translated his restless craving for joy and leisure into Harold Johnsonese by saying that he meant to look about him for a bit before going into another situation. It was a decision Johnson very warmly approved. It was arranged that Mr. Polly should occupy his former room, and board with the Johnsons in consideration of a weekly payment of eighteen shillings, and the next morning Mr. Polly went out early and reappeared with a purchase, a safety bicycle, which he proposed to study and master in the sandy lane below the Johnsons' house. But over the struggles that preceded his mastery, it is humane to draw a veil. And also Mr. Polly bought a number of books, Rabelais for his own, 
and The Arabian Nights, the works of Stern, a pile of Tales from Blackwood, cheap in a second-hand bookshop, the plays of William Shakespeare, a second-hand copy of Belloc's Road to Rome, an odd volume of Purchase His Pilgrims, and The Life and Death of Jason. "'Better get yourself a good book on bookkeeping,' said Johnson, turning over perplexing pages. A belated spring was now advancing with great strides to make up for lost time. Sunshine and a stirring wind were poured out over the land. Fleets of towering clouds sailed upon tremendous missions across the blue seas of heaven. And presently Mr. Polly was riding, a little unstably, along unfamiliar Surrey roads, wondering always what was round the next corner, and marking his blackthorn, and looking out for the first white flower-buds of the May. He was perplexed and distressed, as indeed are all right-thinking souls, that there is no May in early May. He did not ride at the even pace sensible people use who have marked out a journey from one place to another, and settled what time it will take them. He rode at variable speeds, and always as though he was looking for something that, missing, left life attractive still, but a little wanting in significance. And sometimes he was so unreasonably happy he had to whistle and sing, and sometimes he was incredibly, but not at all painfully, sad. His indigestion vanished with air and exercise, and it was quite pleasant in the evening to stroll about the garden with Johnson and discuss plans for the future. Johnson was full of ideas. Moreover, Mr. Polly had marked the road that led to Stamton, that rising, populous suburb, and as his bicycle legs grew strong, his wheel, with a sort of inevitableness, carried him toward the row of houses in a back street, in which his Larkins cousins made their home together. He was received with great enthusiasm. The street was a dingy little street, a cul-de-sac of very small houses in a row, each with an almost flattened bow window, and a blistered brown door with a black knocker. He poised his bright new bicycle against the window, and knocked, and stood waiting, and felt himself in his straw hat and black serge suit a very pleasant and prosperous-looking figure. The door was opened by Cousin Miriam. She was wearing a bluish print dress that brought out a kind of sallow warmth in her skin, and although it was nearly four o'clock in the afternoon, her sleeves were tucked up, as if for some domestic work above the elbows, showing her rather slender but very shapely yellowish arms. The loosely pinned bodice confessed a delicately rounded neck. For a moment she regarded him with suspicion, and a faint hostility, and then recognition dawned in her eyes. "'Why?' she said. "'It's Cousin Elfrid.' "'Thought I'd look you up,' he said. "'Fancy you coming to see us like this,' she answered. They stood confronting one another for a moment, while Miriam collected herself for the unexpected emergency. "'Explorations, menanderings,' said Mr. Polly, indicating the bicycle. Miriam's face betrayed no appreciation of the remark. "'Wait a minute,' she said, coming to a rapid decision, "'and I'll tell Ma.' She closed the door on him abruptly, leaving him a little surprised in the street. "'Ma!' he heard her calling, and swift speech followed, the import of which he didn't catch. Then she reappeared. It seemed but an instant, but she was changed. The arms had vanished into the sleeves, the apron had gone, a certain pleasing disorder of the hair had been at least reproved. "'I didn't mean to shut you out,' she said, coming out upon the step. "'I just told Ma. How are you, Elfrid? You are looking well. I didn't know you rode a bicycle. Is it a new one?' She leaned upon his bicycle. 
bright it is she said what a trouble you must have to keep it clean mr polly was aware of a rustling transit across the passage and of the house suddenly full of hushed but strenuous movement it's uh, plated mostly said mr polly what do you carry in that little bag thing she asked and then branched off to we're all in a mess to-day you know it's my cleaning day to-day i'm not a bit tidy i know but i do like to have a go at things now and then you've got to take us as you find us elfrid mercy we wasn't out she paused she was talking against time i'm glad to see you again she repeated couldn't keep away said mr polly gallantly had to come over and see my pretty cousins again miriam did not answer for a moment she coloured deeply you do say things she said she stared at mr polly and his unfortunate sense of fitness made him nod his head towards her regard her firmly with a round brown eye and add impressively i don't say which of them her answering expression made him realise for an instant the terrible dangers he trifled with avidity flared up in her eyes minnie's voice came happily to dissolve the situation hello alfred she said from the doorstep her hair was just passably tidy and she was a little effaced by a red blouse but there was no mistaking the genuine brightness of her welcome he was to come in to tea and mrs larkins exuberantly genial in a floriferous but dingy flannel dressing-gown appeared to confirm that he brought in his bicycle and put it in the narrow empty passage and every one crowded into a small untidy kitchen whose table had been hastily cleared of the debris of the midday repast you must come in here said mrs larkins for miriam's turning out the front room i never did see such a girl for cleaning up miriam's holiday's a scrub you've caught us on the op as the saying is but welcome all the same pity annie's at work to-day she won't be home till seven miriam put chairs and attended to the fire minnie edged up to mr polly and said i am glad to see you again alfred with a warm contiguous intimacy that betrayed a broken tooth mrs larkins got out the tea-things and descanted on the noble simplicity of their lives and how he mustn't mind our simple ways they enveloped mr polly with a geniality that intoxicated his amiable nature he insisted upon helping lay the things and created enormous laughter by pretending not to know where plates and knives and cups ought to go who am i going to sit next he said and developed voluminous amusement by attempts to arrange the plates so that he could rub elbows with all three mrs larkins had to sit down in the windsor chair by the grandfather clock which was dark with dirt and not going to laugh at her ease with his well-acted perplexity they got seated at last and mr polly struck a vein of humour in telling them how he learned to ride the bicycle he found the mere repetition of the word wobble sufficient to produce almost indistinguishable mirth no foreseeing little accidentalous misadventures he said none whatsoever giggle from minnie stout elderly gentleman shirt sleeves large straw waste paper basket sort of hat starts to cross the road going to the oil shop prodic refreshment of oil can don't say you ran him down said mrs larkins gasping don't say you ran him down elfrid ran him down not me madam i never run anything down wobble ring the bell wobble wobble laughter and tears no one's going to run him down here's the bell wobble gust of wind off comes the hat smack into the wheel wobble lord what's going to happen hat cross the road old gentleman after it bell shriek he ran into me didn't ring his bell 
hadn't got a bell. Just ran into me. Over I went, clinging to his venerable head. Down he went with me, clinging to him. Oil can bump, bump into the road. Interlude while Minnie is attended to for crumb in the windpipe. Well, what happened to the old man with the oil can? said Mrs. Larkins. We sat about among the debris and had a bit of an argument. I told him he oughtn't to have come out wearing such a dangerous hat, flying at things. Said if he couldn't control his hat, he ought to leave it at home. High old jawbonious argument we had, I tell you. I tell you, sir. I tell you, sir. Wa 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 infurious. But that's the sort of thing that's constantly happening, you know, on a bicycle. People run into you, hens and cats and dogs and things. Everything seems to have its mark on you. Everything. You never run into anything? Never, so help me, said Mr. Polly, very solemnly. Never, he say, hey, squeaked Minnie. Ark at him, and relapsed into a condition that urgently demanded back-thumping. Don't be so silly, said Miriam, thumping hard. Mr. Polly had never been such a social success before. They hung upon his every word and laughed. What a family they were for laughter! And he loved laughter. The background he apprehended dimly. It was very much the sort of background his life had always been. There was a threadbare tablecloth on the table, and the slop basin and teapot did not go with the cups and saucers. The plates were different again. The knives worn down. The butter lived in a greenish glass dish of its own. Behind was a dresser hung with spare and miscellaneous crockery, with a work-box and an untidy work-basket. There was an ailing musk-plant in the window, and the tattered and blotched wallpaper was covered by bright-coloured grocer's almanacs. Feminine wrappings hung from pegs upon the door, and the floor was covered with a varied collection of fragments of oilcloth. The Windsor chair he sat in was unstable, which presently afforded material for humour. "'Steady, old nag,' he said. "'Whoa, my friskiacious palfrey!' "'Oh, the things he says! You'll never know what he won't say next!' End of chapter 5, section 1《This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 5, Section 3. 3. "'You ain't talking of going,' cried Mrs. Larkins. "'Supper at eight. "'Stay to supper with us, now you have come over,' said Mrs. Larkins, with collaborating cries from Minnie. "'Have a bit of a walk with the gals, and then come back to supper.' You might all go and meet Annie, while I straighten up and lay things out. You're not to go touch in the front room, mind, said Miriam. Who's going to touch your front room? said Mrs. Larkins, apparently forgetful for a moment of Mr. Polly. Both girls dressed with some care while Mrs. Larkins sketched the better side of their characters, and then the three young people went out to see something of Stampton. In the streets their risable mood gave way to a self-conscious propriety that was particularly evident in Miriam's bearing. They took Mr. Polly to the Stampton Recreation Ground, at least that was what they called it, with its handsome custodian's cottage, its asphalt paths, its jubilee drinking fountain, its clumps of wallflower and daffodils, and so to the new cemetery and a distant view of the Surrey Hills, and round by the gasworks to the canal to the factory, that presently disgorged a surprised and radiant Annie. Hello, said Annie. It is very pleasant to every properly constituted mind to be the centre of an amiable interest for one's fellow creatures, 
and when one is a young man conscious of becoming mourning and a certain wit, and the fellow-creatures are three young and ardent and sufficiently expressive young women who dispute for the honour of walking by one's side, one may be excused a secret exultation. They did dispute. "'I'm going to have him now,' said Annie. "'You two have been having him all the afternoon. Besides, I've got something to say to him.' She had something to say to him. It came presently. "'I say,' she said abruptly, "'I did get them rings out of a prize package.' Mm. "'What rings?' asked Mr. Polly. "'What you saw at your poor father's funeral. "'You made out they meant something. "'They didn't, straight.' "'Then uh, some people have been very remiss about their chances,' "'said Mr. Polly, understanding. "'They haven't had any chances,' said Annie. "'I don't believe in making oneself too free with people.' "'Nor me,' said Mr. Polly. "'I may be a bit larky and cheerful in my manner,' Annie admitted. "'But it don't mean anything. I ain't that sort.' Uh, right o said Mr. Polly. 4. It was past ten when Mr. Polly found himself riding back towards Easewood in a broad moonlight, with a little Japanese lantern dangling from his handlebar and making a fiery circle of pinkish light on and around his front wheel. He was mightily pleased with himself and the day. There had been four ale to drink at supper mixed with ginger beer, very free and jolly in a jug. No shadow fell upon the agreeable excitement of his mind until he faced the anxious and reproachful face of Johnson, who had been sitting up for him, smoking, and trying to read the odd volume of Purchase His Pilgrims about the monk who went to Sarmatia and saw the Tartar carts. "'Not had a accident, Ilfrid,' said Johnson. The weakness of Mr. Polly's character came out in his reply. Uh, "'Not much,' he said. "'Pedal got a bit loose in Stampton, old man. Couldn't write it. So I looked up the cousins while I waited.' "'Not the Larkins lot?' "'Yes.' Johnson yawned hugely, and asked for and was given friendly particulars. "'Well,' he said, "'better get to bed. I've been reading that book of yours. Rum stuff. Can't make it out quite. Quite out of date, I should say, if you ask me.' "'That's all right, old man,' said Mr. Polly. "'Not a bit of use for anything, I can see.' "'Not a bit.' "'See any shops in Stampton?' "'Nothing to speak of,' said Mr. Polly. "'Good night, old man.' Before and after this brief conversation, his mind ran on his cousins very warmly and prettily in the vein of high spring. Mr. Polly had been drinking at the poisoned fountains of English literature— fountains so unsuited to the needs of a decent clerk or shopman, fountains charged with the dangerous suggestion that it becomes a man of gaiety and spirit to make love, gallantly and rather carelessly. It seemed to him that evening to be handsome and humorous and practicable to make love to all his cousins. It wasn't that he liked any of them particularly— but he liked something about them. He liked their youth and femininity, their resolute high spirits, and their interest in him. They laughed at nothing, and knew nothing. And Minnie had lost a tooth, and Annie screamed and shouted, but they were interesting, intensely interesting. And Miriam wasn't so bad as the others. He had kissed them all, and had been kissed in addition several times by Minnie, Oscillatory exercise. He buried his nose in his pillow and went to sleep, to dream of anything rather than getting on in the world as a sensible young man in his position ought to have done. And now Mr. Polly began to lead a divided life. 
With the Johnsons he professed to be inclined, but not so conclusively inclined as to be inconvenient, to get a shop for himself, to be, to use the phrase he preferred, looking for an opening. He would ride off in the afternoon upon that research, remarking that he was going to cast a strategical eye on Chertsey or Weybridge. But if not all roads, uh, still a great majority of them, led by however devious ways to Stamton, and to laughter and increasing familiarity. Relations developed with Annie and Miri and Miriam. Their various characters were increasingly interesting. The laughter became perceptively less abundant. Something of the fizz had gone from the first opening. Still, these visits remained wonderfully friendly and upholding. Then back he would come to grave but evasive discussions with Johnson. Johnson was really anxious to get Mr. Polly into something. His was a reserved, honest character, and he would really have preferred to see his lodger doing things for himself than receive his money for housekeeping. He hated waste, anybody's waste, much more than he desired profit. But Mrs. Johnson was all for Mr. Polly's loitering. She seemed much more human and likable of the two to Mr. Polly. He tried at times to work up enthusiasm for the various avenues to well-being his discussion with Johnson opened, but they remained disheartening prospects. He imagined himself wonderfully smartened up, acquiring style and value in a London shop, but the picture was stiff and unconvincing. He tried to rouse himself to enthusiasm by the idea of his property increasing by leaps and bounds, by twenty pounds a year or so, let us say each year, in a well-placed little shop, the corner shop Johnson favoured. There was a certain picturesque interest in imagining cut-throat economies, but his heart told him there would be little in practising them. And then it happened to Mr. Polly that real romance came out of dreamland into life, and intoxicated and gladdened him with sweetly beautiful suggestions, and left him. She came and left him, as that dear lady leaves so many of us, alas, not sparing him one jot or one tittle of the hollowness of her retreating aspect. It was all the more to Mr. Polly's taste that the thing should happen as things happen in books. In a resolute attempt not to get to Stamton that day, he had turned southward from Easewood towards the country where the abundance of bracken jungles Ladies' smock, stitchwork, bluebells, and grassy stretches by the wayside, under shady trees, does much to compensate the lighter type of mind for the absence of promising openings. He turned aside from the road, wheeled his machine along a faintly marked, attractive trail through bracken, until he came to a heap of logs, against a high old stone wall, with damaged coping, and wallflower plants already gone to seed. He sat down, balanced the straw hat on a convenient lump of wood, lit a cigarette, and abandoned himself to agreeable musings and the friendly observation of a cheerful little brown and grey bird his stillness presently encouraged to approach him. "'This is all right,' said Mr. Polly softly to the little brown and grey bird. "'Business!' later. He reflected that he might go on this way for four or five years, and then be scarcely worse off than he had been in his father's lifetime. "'Vile business,' said Mr. Polly. Then romance appeared, or, to be exact, romance became audible. Romance began as a series of small but increasingly vigorous movements on the other side of the wall and then as a voice murmuring, then as a falling of little fragments on the hither side, and as ten pink fingertips, scarcely apprehended before romance became startlingly and emphatically a leg. 
remained for a time a fine, slender, actively struggling limb, brown-stockinged and wearing a brown toe-worn shoe, and then a handsome red-haired girl, wearing a short dress of blue linen, was sitting astride the wall, panting, considerably disarranged by her climbing, and as yet unaware of Mr. Polly. His fine instincts made him turn his head away and assume an attitude of negligent contemplation, with his ears and mind alive to every sound behind him. "'Goodness!' said a voice, with a sharp note of surprise. Mr. Polly was on his feet in an instant. "'Dear me! Can I be of any assistance?' he said, with deferential gallantry. "'I don't know,' said the young lady and regarded him calmly with clear blue eyes. "'I didn't know there was any one here,' she added. "'Sorry,' said Mr. Polly, "'if I am intrudacious. I didn't know you didn't want me to be here.' She reflected for a moment on the word. "'It isn't that,' she said, surveying him. "'I ought to get over the wall,' she explained. "'It's out of bounds, at least in term time.' But this being holidays her manner placed the matter before him holidays is different said mr polly i don't want to exactly break the rules she said uh, leave them behind you said mr polly with a catch of the breath where they are safe and marvelling at his own wit and daring and indeed trembling within himself he held out a hand for her she brought another brown leg from the unknown, and arranged her skirt with a dexterity altogether feminine. "'I think I'll stay on the wall,' she decided, "'so long as some of me's in bounds.' She continued to regard him with eyes that presently joined dancing in an irresistible smile of satisfaction. Mr. Polly smiled in return. "'You icicle?' she said. Mr. Polly admitted the fact— and she said she did too. "'All my people are in India,' she explained. "'It's beastly rot. I mean, it's frightfully dull, being left here alone.' "'All my people,' said Mr. Polly, "'are in heaven.' "'I say.' "'Fact,' said Mr. Polly, "'got nobody.' "'And that's why?' She checked her artless comment on his mourning. "'I say.' she said in a sympathetic voice. I am sorry. I really am. Was it a fire or a ship or something? Her sympathy was very delightful. He shook his head. The ordinary table of mortality, he said, first one and then another. Behind his outward melancholy, delight was dancing wildly. Are you lonely? asked the girl. Mr. Polly nodded. "'I was just sitting here in melancholy retrospectatiousness,' he said, indicating the logs, and again a swift thoughtfulness swept across her face. "'There's no harm in our talking,' she reflected. "'It's a kindness. Won't you get down?' She reflected, and surveyed the turf below, and the scene around, and him. "'I'll stay on the wall,' she said, "'if only for Bound's sake.' She certainly looked quite adorable on the wall. She had a fine neck and pointed chin that was particularly admirable from below, and pretty eyes and fine eyebrows are never so pretty as when they look down upon one. But no calculation of that sort, thank heaven, was going on beneath her ruddy shock of hair. End of chapter 5, section 3— Chapter 5, section 3 of The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 5, section 3 — 6 — Let's talk, she said and for a while they were both tongue-tied. 
Mr. Polly's literary proclivities had taught him that, under such circumstances, a strain of gallantry was demanded, and something in his blood repeated that lesson. "'You made me feel like one of those old knights,' he said, "'who rode about the country looking for dragons and beautiful maidens and chivalrous adventures.' "'Ooh,' she said. "'Why?' "'Beautiful maiden,' he said. She flushed under her freckles with a quick, bright flush those pretty red-haired people have. <laughs> Nonsense, she said. You are? I'm not the first to tell you that. A beautiful maiden imprisoned in an enchanted school. You wouldn't think it enchanted. And here I am, clad in steel. Well, not exactly, but my fiery war-horse is, anyhow. Ready to abstampulate all the dragons and rescue you. She laughed, a jolly laugh that showed delightfully gleaming teeth. I wish you could see the dragons, she said with great enjoyment. Mr. Polly felt they were a sun's distance from the world of every day. Fly with me, he dared. She stared for a moment, and then went off into peals of laughter. You "'Ah, oh, funny,' she said. "'Why, I haven't known you five minutes.' "'Oh, one doesn't in this medieval world. My mind is made up anyhow.' He was proud and pleased with his joke, and quick to change his key neatly. "'I wish one could,' he said. "'I wonder if people ever did. If there were people like you.' "'We don't even know each other's names,' she remarked with a descent to matters of fact. Yours is the prettiest name in the world. How do you know? Oh, it must be, anyhow. It is rather pretty, you know. It's Christabel. What did I tell you? And yours? Poorer than I deserve. It's Alfred. I can't call you Alfred. Well, Polly. It's a girl's name. For a moment he was out of tune. I wish it was, he said, and could have bitten out his tongue at the larkin sound of it. I shan't forget it, she remarked consolingly. I say, she said in the pause that followed, why are you riding about the country on a bicycle? I'm doing it because I like it. She sought to estimate his social status on her limited basis of experience. He stood leaning with one hand against the wall, looking up at her and tingling with daring thoughts. He was a littleish man, you must remember, but neither mean-looking nor unhandsome in those days, sunburnt by his holiday and now warmly flushed. He had an inspiration to simple speech that no practised trifler with love could have bettered. "'There is love at first sight,' he said and said it sincerely. She stared at him with eyes round and big with excitement. "'I think,' she said slowly, and without any signs of fear or retreat, "'I ought to get back over the wall.' "'It needn't matter to you,' he said. "'I'm just a nobody. But I know you are the best and most beautiful thing I've ever spoken to.' His breath caught against something. "'No harm in telling you that,' he said. "'I shouldn't have to go back if I thought you were serious,' she said, after a pause, and they both smiled together. After that they talked in a fragmentary way for some time. The blue eyes surveyed Mr. Polly with kindly curiosity from under a broad, finely modelled brow, much as an exceptionally intelligent cat might survey a new sort of dog. She meant to find out all about him. She asked questions that riddled the honest knight in armour below, and probed ever nearer to the hateful secret of the shop and his normal servitude. And when he made a flourish and mispronounced a word, a thoughtful shade passed like the shadow of a cloud across her face. Boom! came the sound of a gong. Lordy! cried the girl, and flashed a pair of brown legs at him, and was gone. Then her pink fingertips reappeared, and the top of her red hair. 
Night, night there. Lady, he answered. Come again tomorrow. At your command, but— Yes, just one finger. What do you mean? To kiss. The rustle of retreating footsteps and silence. But after he had waited next day for twenty minutes, she reappeared, a little out of breath with the effort to surmount the wall, and head first this time. It seemed to him that she was lighter and more daring, and altogether prettier than the dreams and enchanted memories that had filled the interval. 7. From first to last their acquaintance lasted ten days. But into that time Mr. Polly packed ten years of dreams. "'He don't seem,' said Johnson, "'to take a serious interest in anything. That shop at the corner's bound to be snapped up if he don't look out.' The girl and Mr. Polly did not meet on every one of those ten days. One was a Sunday, and she could not come, and on the eighth the school reassembled and she made vague excuses. All their meetings amounted to this, that she sat on the wall, more or less in bounds, as she expressed it, and let Mr. Polly fall in love with her, and try to express it below. She sat in a state of irresponsible exultation, watching him, and at intervals prodding a vivisecting point of encouragement into him with that strangely passive cruelty which is natural to her sex and age. And Mr. Polly fell in love, as though the world had given way beneath him, and he had dropped through into another, into a world of luminous clouds and of desolate, hopeless wildernesses of desiring, and of wild valleys of unreasonable ecstasies, a world whose infinite miseries were finer, and in some inexplicable way sweeter than the purest gold of everyday life, whose joys, they were indeed but the merest remote glimpses of joy, were brighter than a dying martyr's vision of heaven. Her smiling face looked down upon him out of heaven. Her careless pose was the living body of life. It was senseless, it was utterly foolish, but all that was best and richest in Mr. Polly's nature broke like a wave and foamed up at that girl's feet, and died, and never touched her. And she sat on the wall and marvelled at him, and was amused, and once, suddenly moved and wrung by his pleading, she bent down rather shamefacedly and gave him a freckled, tennis-blistered little paw to kiss. And she looked into his eyes, and suddenly felt a perplexity, a curious swimming of the mind that made her recall and stiffen, and wonder afterwards, and dream. And then, with some dim instinct of self-protection, she went and told her three best friends, great students of character all, of this remarkable phenomenon she had discovered on the other side of the wall. "'Look here,' said Mr. Polly, "'I'm wild for the love of you. I can't keep up this gesticulations game any more. I'm not a knight. Treat me as a human man. You may sit up there smiling, but I die in torments to have you mine for an hour. I'm nobody and nothing. But look here.' Will you wait for me for five years? You're just a girl yet, and it wouldn't be hard. Shut up, said Christabel in an aside he did not hear, and something he did not see touched her hand. I've always been just dilettantying about till now, but I could work. I've just woke up. Wait till I've got a chance with all the money I've got. But you haven't got much money. I've got enough to take a chance with, some sort of a chance. I'd find a chance. I'll do that anyhow. I'll go away. I mean what I say. I'll stop trifling and shirking. If I don't come back, it won't matter. If I do... Her expressions had become uneasy. Suddenly she bent down towards him. Don't, 
she said in an undertone. Don't what? Don't go on like this. You're different. Go on being the knight who just wants to kiss my hand. That is, what do you call it? The ghost of a smile curved her face. Gudrum. But— Then, through a pause, they both stared at each other, listening. A muffled tumult on the other side of the wall asserted itself. "'Shut up, Rosie,' said a voice. "'I tell you I will see. I can't half hear. Give me a leg up. You idiot, he'll see you. You're spoiling everything.' The bottom dropped out of Mr. Polly's world. He felt as people must feel who are going to faint. "'You've got someone?' he said, aghast. She found life inexpressible to Mr. Polly. She addressed some unheard hearers. "'You filthy little beasts!' she cried with a sharp note of agony in her voice, and swung herself back over the wall, and vanished. There was a squeal of pain and fear, and a swift, fierce altercation. For a couple of seconds he stood agape. Then a wild resolve to confirm his worst sense of what was on the other side of the wall made him seize a log, put it up against the stones, clutch the parapet with insecure fingers, and lug himself to a momentary balance on the wall. Romance and his goddess had vanished. A red-haired schoolgirl with a pigtail was wringing the wrist of a schoolfellow who shrieked with pain and cried, "'Mercy! Mercy! Ooh, Christabel!' "'You idiot!' cried Christabel. "'You giggling idiot!' Two other young ladies made off through the beech-trees from this outburst of savagery. Then the grip of Mr. Polly's fingers gave, and he hit his chin against the stones, and slipped clumsily to the ground again, scraping his cheek against the wall, and hurting his shin against the log by which he had reached the top. Just for a moment he crouched against the wall. He swore, staggered to the pile of logs, and sat down. He remained very still for some time, with his lips pressed together. "'Fool!' he said at last. "'You blithering fool!' and began to rub his shin as though he had just discovered its bruises. Afterwards he found his face was wet with blood which was none the less red stuff from the heart, because it came from slight abrasions. End of chapter 5、chapter 6, section 1 of The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter 6, Section 1. Miriam. It is an illogical consequence of one human being's ill-treatment that we should fly immediately to another, but that's the way it is with us. It seemed to Mr. Polly that only a human touch could assuage the smart of his humiliation. Moreover, it had for some undefined reason to be a feminine touch and the number of women in his world was limited. He thought of the Larkins family, the Larkins whom he had not now been near for ten long days. Healing people, they seemed to him now, healing, simple people. They had good hearts, and he had neglected them for a mirage. If he rode over to them, he would be able to talk nonsense and laugh, and forget the whirl of memories and thoughts that were spinning round and round so unendurably in his brain. "'Law,' said Mrs. Larkins, "'come in. You're quite a stranger, Elfrid.' "'Been uh, seeing to business,' said the unveracious Polly. "'None of them ain't at home, but Miriam's just out to do a bit of shopping.' "'Won't let me shop, she won't, because I'm so careless. "'She's a wonderful manager, that girl. "'Minnie's got some work at the carpet place. "'Hope it won't make her ill again. "'She's a loving, 
delicate sort is Minnie. Come into the front parlour. It's a bit untidy, but you've got to take us as you find us. What you been doing to your face? Bit of a scrace with the bicycle, said Mr. Polly, trying to pass a carriage on the on side, and he drew up and ran me against the wall. Mrs. Larkins scrutinised it. You ought to have someone look after your scraces, she said. That's all red and rough. It ought to be cold creamed. Bring your bicycle into the passage and come in. She straightened up a bit, that is to say, she increased the dislocation of a number of scattered articles, put a work basket on the top of several books, swept two or three dog-eared numbers of the lady's own novelist from the table into the broken armchair, and proceeded to sketch together the tea-things with various such interpolations as, "'Law, if I ain't forgot the butter!' All the while she talked of Annie's good spirits, and the cleverness of her millinery, and of Minnie's affection, and Miriam's relative love of order and management. Mr. Polly stood by the window uneasily, and thought how good and sincere was the Larkin's tone. It was well to be back again. "'You're a long time finding that shop of yours,' said Mrs. Larkins. "'Don't do to be precipitous,' said Mr. Polly. "'No,' said Mrs. Larkins. "'Once you got it, you got it. Like choosing a husband. You'd better see you got it good. I kept Larkins hesitating two years, I did, until I felt sure of him. A handsome man he was, as you can see by the looks of the girls. But handsome is as handsome does. You'd like a bit of jam to your tea, I expect? I hope they'll keep their men waiting when the time comes. I tell them if they think of marrying... It only shows they don't know when they're well off. Here's Miriam. Miriam entered with several parcels in a net, and a peevish expression. Mother, she said, you might have prevented my going out with the net with the broken handle. I've been cutting my fingers with the string all the way home. Then she discovered Mr. Polly, and her face brightened. Hello, Alfred, she said. "'Where have you been all this time?' Uh, "'Looking round,' said Mr. Polly. "'Found a shop?' Uh, "'One or two likely ones, but it takes time. "'You've got the wrong cups, mother.' She went into the kitchen, disposed of her purchases, and returned with the right cups. "'What you done to your face, Elfrid?' she asked, and came and scrutinised his scratches. "'All rough it is.' He repeated his story of the accident, and she was sympathetic in a pleasant, homely way. "'You are quiet today,' she said as they sat down to tea. "'Meditatious,' said Mr. Polly. Quite by accident he touched her hand on the table, and she answered his touch. "'Why not?' thought Mr. Polly, and, looking up, caught Mrs. Larkin's eye, and flushed guiltily. But Mrs. Larkin's, with unusual restraint, said nothing. She merely made a grimace, enigmatical, but in its essence friendly. Presently Minnie came in with some vague grievance against the manager of the carpet-making place about his method of estimating piecework. Her account was redundant, defective, and highly technical, but redeemed by a certain earnestness. "'I'm never within a sixpence of what I reckon to be,' she said. "'It's a bit too hot.' Then Mr. Polly, feeling that he was being conspicuously dull, launched into a description of the shop he was looking for, and the shops he had seen. His mind warmed up as he talked. "'Found your tongue again?' said Mrs. Larkins. He had. He began to embroider the subject and work upon it. For the first time it assumed picturesque and desirable qualities in his mind, 
it stimulated him to see how readily and willingly they accepted his sketches. Bright ideas appeared in his mind from nowhere. He was suddenly enthusiastic. When I get this shop of mine, I shall have a cat. Must make home for a cat, you know. What? To catch the mice, said Mrs. Larkins. No, sleep in the window. A veritable seigneur of cat. Tabby. Cat's no good if it isn't tabby. Cat I'm going to have, and a canary. Didn't think of that before. But a cat and a canary uh, seem to go, you know. Summer weather I shall sit at breakfast in the little room behind the shop. Sun streaming in the window to rights. Cat on a chair. Canary singing. And Mrs. Polly. Hello, said Mrs. Larkins. Mrs. Polly frying an extra bit of bacon. Bacon singing. Cat singing. Canary singing. Kettle singing. Mrs. Polly. But who's Mrs. Polly going to be? said Mrs. Larkins. Figment of the imagination, ma'am, said Mr. Polly. Put in to fill up picture. No face to figure as yet. Still, that's how it will be, I can assure you. I must have a bit of garden. Johnson's the man for a garden, of course, he said, going off at a tangent. But I don't mean a fierce sort of garden. Earnest industry. Anxious moments. Fervous digging. Hm, shan't go in for that sort of garden, ma'am. No, too much backache for me. My garden will be just a patch of sturtiums and sweet pea. Red brick yard, clothesline. Trellis put up in odd time. Humorous wind vane. Creeper up the back of the house. Virginia creeper? asked Miriam. Canary creeper, said Mr. Polly. You will have it nice, said Miriam desirously. Rather said Mr. Polly. Tingling-ling, sharp. He straightened himself up, and then they all laughed. Smart little shop, he said. Counter, desk, all complete. Umbrella stand, carpet on the floor, cat asleep on the counter. Ties and hose on a rail over the counter. All right. I wonder you don't set about it right off, said Miriam. Mean to get it exactly right, ma'am, said Mr. Polly. Have to have a tomcat, said Mr. Polly, and paused for an expectant moment. Wouldn't it do to open shop one morning, you know, and find the window full of kittens? Can't sell kittens. When tea was over, he was left alone with Minnie for a few minutes, and an odd intimation of an incident occurred that left Mr. Polly rather scared and shaken. A silence fell between them, an uneasy silence. He sat with his elbows on the table looking at her. All the way from Easewood to Stamton, his erratic imagination had been running upon neat ways of proposing marriage. I don't know why it should have done, but it had. It was a kind of secret exercise that had not any definite aim at the time, but which now recurred to him with extraordinary force. He couldn't think of anything in the world that wasn't the gambit to a proposal. It was almost irresistibly fascinating to think how immensely a few words from him would excite and revolutionise Minnie. She was sitting at the table with a work-basket among the tea-things, mending a glove, in order to avoid her share of clearing away. "'I like cats,' said Minnie, after a thoughtful pause. "'I'm always saying to Mother, I wish we had a cat. But we couldn't have a cat here, not with no yard.' "'Never had a cat myself,' said Mr. Polly. "'No.' "'I'm fond of em, said Minnie. "'I like the look of em," said Mr. Polly. Can't exactly call myself fond. I expect I shall get one some day. When about you get your shop? I shall have my shop all right before long, 
said Mr. Polly. Trust me, canary bird and all. She shook her head. I shall get a cat first, she said. You never mean anything you say. Might get them together, said Mr. Polly, with his sense of a neat thing outrunning his discretion. Why, how do you mean? said Minnie, suddenly alert. Shop and cat thrown in, said Mr. Polly in spite of himself, and his head swam, and he broke out into a cold sweat as he said it. He found her eyes fixed on him with an eager expression. Mean to say, she began as if for verification. He sprang to his feet and turned to the window. Little dog, he said, and moved doorward hastily. Eating my bicycle tyre, I believe, he explained, and so escaped. He saw his bicycle in the hall and cut it dead. He heard Mrs. Larkins in the passage behind him as he opened the front door. He turned to her. Thought my bicycle was on fire, he said. Outside. Funny fancy. All right, really. Little dog outside. Miriam ready? What for? To go and meet Annie. Mrs. Larkins stared at him. You're stopping for a bit of supper? If I may said Mr. Polly. "'You're a Brahmin,' said Mrs. Larkins, and called, "'Miriam!' Minnie appeared at the door of the room, looking infinitely perplexed. "'There ain't a little dog anywhere, Alfred,' she said. Mr. Polly passed his hand over his brow. "'I had a most curious sensation. Felt exactly as though something was up somewhere. That's why I said, little dog. All right now. He bent down and pinched his bicycle tyre. You was saying something about a cat, Elfrid, said Minnie. Give you one, he answered, without looking up, the very day my shop is opened. He straightened himself up and smiled reassuringly. Trust me, he said. When, after imperceptible manoeuvres by Mrs. Larkins, he found himself starting circuitously through the inevitable recreation ground with Miriam to meet Annie, he found himself quite unable to avoid the topic of the shop that had now taken such a grip upon him. A sense of danger only increased the attraction. Minnie's persistent disposition to accompany them had been crushed by a novel and violent and urgently expressed desire on the part of Mrs. Larkins to see her do something in the house sometimes. "'You really think you'll open a shop?' asked Miriam. "'I hate cribs,' said Mr. Polly, adopting a moderate tone. "'In a shop there's this drawback and that, but one is one's own master.' That wasn't all talk? Not a bit of it. After all, he went on, a little shop needn't be so bad. It's a home, said Miriam. It's a home. Pause. There's no need to keep accounts and that sort of thing if there's no assistant. I dare say I could run a shop all right if I wasn't interfered with. I should like to see you in your shop said Miriam. I expect you keep everything tremendously neat. The conversation flagged. Let's sit down on one of those seats over there, said Miriam, where we can see those blue flowers. They did as she suggested, and sat down in a corner where a triangular bed of stock and delphinium brightened the asphalted traceries of the recreation ground. I wonder what they call those flowers she said. I always like them. They're handsome. Delphicums and larkspurs, said Mr. Polly. They used to be in the park at Port Burdock. Floriferous corner, he added approvingly. He put an arm over the back of the seat and assumed a more comfortable attitude. He glanced at Miriam, who was sitting in a lax, thoughtful pose, with her eyes on the flowers. 
She was wearing her old dress, she had not time to change, and the blue tones of her old dress brought out a certain warmth in her skin, and her pose exaggerated whatever was feminine in her rather lean and insufficient body, and rounded her flat chest delusively. A little line of light lay along her profile. The afternoon was full of transfiguring sunshine. Children were playing noisily in the adjacent sand-pit. Some Judas-trees were brightly abloom in the villa gardens that bordered the recreation ground, and all the place was bright with touches of young summer colour. It had all merged with the effect of Miriam in Mr. Polly's mind. Her thoughts found speech. "'One did ought to be happy in a shop,' she said with a note of unusual softness in her voice. It seemed to him that she was right. One did ought to be happy in a shop. Folly not to banish dreams that made one ache of townless woods and bracken tangles, and red-haired linen-clad figures sitting in dappled sunshine upon grey and crumbling walls, and looking queenly down on one with clear blue eyes. Cruel and foolish dreams they were, that ended in one's being laughed at and made mock of. There was no mockery here. "'A shop's such a respectable thing to be,' said Miriam thoughtfully. "'I could be happy in a shop,' he said. His sense of effect made him pause. "'If I had the right company,' he added. She became very still. Mr. Polly swerved a little from the conversational ice-run on which he had embarked. "'I'm not such a blooming geezer,' he said, "'as not to be able to sell goods a bit. One has to be nosy over one's buying, of course. But I shall do all right.' He stopped and felt falling, falling through the aching silence that followed. "'If you get the right company,' said Miriam, I shall get that all right. You don't mean you've got someone? He found himself plunging. I've got someone in my eye this minute, he said. Ilfrid, she said, turning on him, you don't mean— Well, did he mean? I do, he said. Not really? She clutched her hands to keep still. He took the conclusive step. "'Well, you and me, Miriam, in a little shop, with a cat and a canary.' He tried too late to get back to a hypothetical note. "'Just suppose it.' "'You mean,' said Miriam, "'you're in love with me, Elfrid?' What possible answer can a man give to such a question but, "'Yes!' Regardless of the public park, the children in the sandpit, and every one, she bent forward and seized his shoulder and kissed him on the lips. Something lit up in Mr. Polly at the touch. He put an arm about her and kissed her back, and felt an irrevocable act was sealed. He had a curious feeling that it would be very satisfying to marry and have a wife. Only... Somehow he wished it wasn't Miriam. Her lips were very pleasant to him, and the feel of her in his arm. They recoiled a little from each other, and sat for a moment, flushed and awkwardly silent. His mind was altogether incapable of controlling its confusion. "'I didn't dream,' said Miriam. "'You cared. Sometimes I thought it was Annie, sometimes Minnie.' "'Always liked you better than them,' said Mr. Polly. "'I loved you, Elfrid,' said Miriam, "'ever since we met at your poor father's funeral. "'Leastways, I would have done if I had thought. "'You didn't seem to mean anything you said. "'I can't believe it,' she added. "'Nor I,' said Mr. Polly. "'You mean to marry me and start that little shop?' "'As soon as ever I find it,' said Mr. Polly. 
I had no more idea when I came out with you. Nor me. It's like a dream. They said no more for a little while. I got to pinch myself to think it's real, said Miriam. What'll they do without me at home, I can't imagine. When I tell them... For the life of him, Mr. Polly could not tell whether he was fullest of tender anticipations or regretful panic. Mother's no good at managing, not a bit. Annie don't care for housework, and Minnie's got no head for it. What they'll do without me, I can't imagine. They'll have to do without you, said Mr. Polly, sticking to his guns. A clock in the town began striking. Law, said Miriam, we shall miss Annie, sitting here and love-making. She rose, and made as if to take Mr. Polly's arm. But Mr. Polly felt that their condition must be nakedly exposed to the ridicule of the world by such a linking, and evaded her movement. Annie was already in sight before a flood of hesitation and terrors assailed Mr. Polly. Uh, "'Don't tell anyone yet a bit,' he said. "'Only mother,' said Miriam firmly. End of chapter 6, section 1「six section two of the history of mr polly by h g wales this librivox recording is in the public domain read by adrian pretzelis chapter six section two figures are the most shocking things in the world the prettiest little squiggles of black looked at in the right light and yet consider the blow they can give you upon the heart you return from a careless little holiday abroad, and turn over the page of a newspaper, and against the name of that distant, vague, conceived railway and mortgages upon which you have embarked the bulk of your capital, you see, instead of the familiar persistent ninety-five to six, varying at most to ninety-three ex div, this slightly richer arrangement of marks, seventy-six and a half to seventy-eight and a half. It is like the opening of a pit just under your feet. So, too, Mr. Polly's happy sense of limitless resources was obliterated suddenly by a vision of this tracery. Two, nine, eight, instead of the three, five, O oh, he had come to regard as the fixed symbol of his affluence. It gave him a disagreeable feeling about the diaphragm, akin in a remote degree to the separation he had when the perfidy of the red-headed schoolgirl became plain to him. It made his brow moist. "'Going down a vortex,' he whispered. By a characteristic feat of subtraction, he decided that he must have spent sixty-two pounds. Funereal baked meats, he said, recalling possible items. The happy dream in which he had been living, of long, warm days, of open roads, of limitless, unchecked hours, of infinite time to look about him, vanished like a thing enchanted. He was suddenly back in the hard, old economic world, that exacts work, that limits range, that discourages phrasing, and dispels laughter. He saw Wood Street and its fearful suspenses yawning beneath his feet. And also he had promised to marry Miriam, and on the whole rather wanted to. He was distraught at supper. Afterwards, when Mrs. Johnson had gone to bed with a slight headache, he opened a conversation with Johnson. "'It's about time, old man, I saw about doing something,' he said. "'Riding about and looking at shops, all very debonairious, old man. But it's time I took one for keeps.' "'What did I tell you?' said Johnson. "'How do you think that corner shop of yours will figure out?' Mr. Polly asked. 
You're really meaning it? If it's a practical proposition, old man, assuming it's practicable, what's your idea of the figures? Johnson went to the chiffonier, got out a letter, and tore off the back sheet. Let's figure it out, he said, with solemn satisfaction. Let's see the lowest you could do it on. He squared himself to the task, and Mr. Polly sat beside him like a pupil, watching the evolution of the grey, distasteful figures that were to dispose of his little hoard. "'What running expenses have we got to provide for? said Johnson, wetting his pencil. "'Let's have them first. "'Rent?' At the end of an hour of hideous speculations, Johnson decided— "'It's close, but you'll have a chance.' "'Hm,' said Mr. Polly. "'What more does a brave man want?' "'One thing you can do quite easily. "'I've asked about it.' "'What's that, old man?' said Mr. Polly. "'Take the shop without the house above it.' "'I suppose I might put my head in to mind it,' said Mr. Polly. "'and get a job with my body.' "'Not exactly that, but I thought you'd save a lot if you stayed on here, "'being all alone as you are.' "'Never thought of that, old man,' said Mr. Polly, "'and reflected silently upon the needlessness of Miriam. "'We're talking of eighty pounds for stock,' said Johnson. "'Of course, Seventy-five is five pounds less, isn't it? Not much else we can cut. No, said Mr. Polly. It's very interesting, all this, said Johnson, folding up the half-sheet of paper and unfolding it. I wish sometimes I had a business of my own instead of a fixed salary. You'll have to keep books, of course. One wants to know where one is. I should do it all by double entry, said Johnson. A little troublesome at first, but far the best in the end. Let me see the paper, said Mr. Polly, and took it with the feeling of a man who takes a nauseating medicine, and scrutinised his cousin's neat figures with listless eyes. Well, said Johnson, rising and stretching. Bed. Better sleep on it, old man. Uh, Right-o, said Mr. Polly, without moving. And indeed, he could as well have slept upon a bed of thorns. He had a dreadful night. It was like the end of the annual holiday, only infinitely worse. It was like a newly arrived prisoner's backward glance at the trees and heather through the prison gates. He had to go back to harness, and he was as fitted to go in harness as the ordinary domestic cat. At night, fate, with the quiet complacency, and indeed at times the very face and gestures of Johnson, guided him towards that undesired establishment at the corner near the station. "'Oh, Lord!' he cried. "'I'd rather go back to Cribs. I should keep my money anyhow.' Fate never winced. "'Run away to sea,' whispered Mr. Polly, but he knew he wasn't man enough. "'Cut my blooming throat!' Some braver strain urged him to think of Miriam, and for a little while he lay still. "'Well, old man,' said Johnson, when Mr. Polly came down to breakfast, and Mrs. Johnson looked up brightly. Mr. Polly never had felt a breakfast so unattractive before. Uh, "'Just a day or so more, old man, uh, to turn it over in my mind,' he said. "'You'll get the place snapped up,' said Johnson." There were times in those last few days of coyness with his destiny when his engagement seemed the most negligible of circumstances, and times, 
and these happened for the most part at nights, after Mrs. Johnson had indulged everybody in a Welsh rarebit, when it assumed so sinister and portentous an appearance as to make him think of suicide, and there were times, too, when he very distinctly desired to be married, now that the idea had got into his head at any cost. Also, he tried to recall all the circumstances of his proposal, time after time, and never quite succeeded in recalling what had brought the whole thing off. He went over to Stampton with a becoming frequency, and kissed all his cousins, and Miriam especially, a great deal, and found it very stirring and refreshing. They all appeared to know, and Minnie was tearful but resigned. Mrs. Larkins met him, and indeed enveloped him, in unwonted warmth, and there was a big pot of household jam for tea. And he could not make up his mind to sign his name to anything about the shop, though it crawled nearer and nearer to him, though the project had materialised now to the extent of a draft agreement, with the place for his signature indicated in pencil. One morning— just after Mr. Johnson had gone to the station, Mr. Polly wheeled his bicycle out into the road, went up to his bedroom, packed his long white nightdress, a comb, and a toothbrush, in a manner that was off-hand as he could make it, informed Mrs. Johnson, who was manifestly curious, that he was off for a day or two to clear his head, and fled forthright into the road, and mounting turned his wheels towards the tropics and the equator, and the south coast of England, and indeed more particularly to where the little village of Fishbourne slumbers and sleeps. When he returned four days later, he astonished Johnson beyond measure by remarking so soon as the shop project was reopened, "'I've took a little contraption at Fishbourne, old man, that I fancy suits me better.' He paused, and then added in a manner, if possible even more off-hand, "'Oh, and I'm going to have a bit of a nuptial over at Stampton with one of the Larkins' cousins.' "'Nuptial?' said Johnson. Uh, "'Wedding bells, old man. A Benedictine collapse.' On the whole, Johnson showed great self-control. "'It's your own affair, old man.' he said, when things had been more clearly explained, and I hope you won't feel sorry when it's too late. But Mrs. Johnson was first of all angrily silent, and then reproachful. "'I don't see what we've done to be made fools of like this,' she said, "'after all the trouble we've had of making you comfortable and seeing after you, out late and sitting up and everything, and then you go off as sly as sly without a word, and get a shot behind our backs, as though you thought we meant to steal your money. I haven't patience with such deceitfulness, and I didn't think it of you, Alfred. And now the letting season's half gone by, and what shall I do with that room of yours I've no idea. Frank is frank, and fair play, fair play, so I was told anyhow when I was a girl. "'Just as long as it suits you to stay here, you stay here. "'Then it's off, and no thank you, whether we like it or not. "'Johnson's too easy with you. "'He sits there and doesn't say a word, "'and night after night he's been adding and thinking for you, "'instead of seeing to his own affairs.' "'She paused for breath. "'Unfortunate more," said Mr. Polly, "'apologetically and indistinctly. Didn't expect it myself. 4. Mr. Polly's marriage followed with a certain inevitableness. He tried to assure himself that he was acting upon his own forceful initiative, but at the back of his mind was the completest realisation of his powerlessness to resist the gigantic social forces he had set in motion. He had got to marry under the will of society, even as in times past it has been appointed for other sunny souls under the will of society 
that they should be led out by serious and unavoidable fellow-creatures, and ceremoniously drowned, or burnt, or hung. He would have preferred indefinitely a more observant and less conspicuous role, but the choice was no longer open to him. He did his best to play his part, and he procured some particularly neat check trousers to do it in. The rest of his costume, except for some bright yellow gloves, a grey and blue mixture tie, and that the broad crepe hat-band was changed for a livelier piece of silk, were things he had worn at the funeral of his father, so nearly akin are human joy and sorrow. The Larkin sisters had done wonders with grey sateen. The idea of orange blossom and white veils had been abandoned reluctantly on account of the expense of cabs. A novelette in which the heroine had stood at the altar in a modest going-away dress had materially assisted this decision. Miriam was frankly tearful, and so indeed was Annie, but with laughter as well to carry it off. Mr. Polly heard Annie say something vague about never getting a chance because of Miriam always sticking about at home like a cat at a mouse-hole that became, as people say, food for thought. Mrs. Larkins was from the first flushed, garrulous, and wet, and smeared by copious weeping, an incredibly soaked and crumpled and used-up pocket-handkerchief never left the clutch of her plump red hand. "'Goo girls, all of em she kept saying in a tremulous voice. "'Such goo 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 girls She wetted Mr. Polly dreadfully when she kissed him. Her emotions affected the buttons down the back of her bodice, and almost the last filial duty Miriam did before entering on her new life was to close that gaping orifice for the eleventh time. Her bonnet was small and ill-balanced, black adorned with red roses, and first it got over her right eye until Annie told her of it, and then she pushed it over her left eye and looked ferocious for a space, and after that baptismal kissing of Mr. Polly, the delicate millinery took fright and climbed right up to the back part of her head, and hung there by a pin, and flapped piteously at all the larger waves of emotion that filled the gathering. Mr. Polly became more and more aware of that bonnet as time went on, until he felt for it like a thing alive. Towards the end it had yawning fits. The company did not include Mrs. Johnson, but Johnson came with a manifest surreptitiousness, and backed against walls, and watched Mr. Polly with doubt and speculation in his large grey eyes, and whistled noiselessly and doubtful on the edge of things. He was, so to speak, to be best man, so to voce. A sprinkling of girls in gay hats from Miriam's place of business appeared in church, great nudgers, all of them, but only two came on afterwards to the house. Mrs. Punt brought her son with his ever-widening mind, it was his first wedding, and a Larkin's uncle, Mr. Vools, a licensed victualler, very kindly drove over in a gig from Summerhill with a plump, well-dressed wife to give the bride away. One or two total strangers drifted into the church, and sat down observantly far away. This sprinkling of people seemed only to embrace the cool brown emptiness of the church, the rows and rows of empty pews, disengaged prayer-books, and abandoned hassocks. It had the effect of a preposterous misfit. Johnson consulted with a thin-legged, short-skirted verger, about the disposition of the party. The officiating clergy appeared distantly in the doorway of the vestry, putting on his surplice, and relapsed into a contemplated cheek-scratching that was manifestly habitual. Before the bride arrived, Mr. Polly's sense of the church found an outlet 
in whispered criticisms of ecclesiastical architecture with Johnson. "'Early Norman arches, eh?' he said, or perpendicular. "'Can't say,' said Johnson. "'Telesated pavement's all right. It's well laid, anyhow.' "'Can't say I admire the altar. Scrappy, rather, with those flowers.' He coughed behind his back and cleared his throat. At the back of his mind he was speculating whether flight at this eleventh hour would be criminal or merely reprehensible bad taste. A murmur from the nudgers announced the arrival of the bridal party. The little procession from a remote door became one of the enduring memories of Mr. Polly's life. The little verger had bustled to meet it and arrange it according to tradition and morality. In spite of Mrs. Larkin's, "'Don't take her from me yet!' he made Miriam go first with Mr. Voles. The bridesmaids followed, and then himself, hopelessly unable to disentangle himself from the whispering maternal anguish of Mrs. Larkin's. Mrs. Voles, a compact, rounded woman with a square, expressionless face, imperturbable dignity, and a dress of considerable fashion completed the procession. Mr. Polly's eyes fell first upon the bride. The sight of her filled him with a curious stir of emotion, alarm, desire, affection, respect, and a queer element of reluctant dislike, all played their part in that complex eddy. The grey dress made her a stranger to him, made her stiff and commonplace. She was not even the rather drooping form that had caught his facile sense of beauty when he had proposed to her in the recreation ground. There was something, too, that did not please him in the angle of her hat. It was, indeed, an ill-conceived hat, with large, aimless rosettes of pink and grey. Then his mind passed to Mrs. Larkins and the bonnet that was to gain such a hold upon him. It seemed to be flag-signalling as she advanced, and to the eager, unrefined sisters he was acquiring. A freak of fancy set him wondering where and when in the future a beautiful girl with red hair might march along some splendid aisle. Never mind— he became aware of Mr. Voles. He became aware of Mr. Voles as a watchful blue eye of intense forcefulness. It was the eye of a man who has got hold of a situation. He was a fat, short, red-faced man, clad in a tight-fitting tailcoat of black and white check, with a coquettish bow-tie under the lowest of a number of crisp little red chins. He held the bride under his arm with an air of invincible championship, and his free arm flourished a grey top-hat of an equestrian type. Mr. Polly instantly learned from the eye that Mr. Voles knew all about his longing for flight. Its azure pupil glowed with disciplined resolution. It said, "'I've come to give this girl away.' and give her away i will i'm here now and things have to go on all right so don't think of it any more and uh, mr polly didn't a faint phantom of a certain little dog that had just hovered beneath the threshold of consciousness vanished into black impossibility until the conclusive moment of the service was attained, the eye of Mr. Voles watched Mr. Polly relentlessly, and then, instantly, he relieved guard and blew his nose into a voluminous and richly patterned handkerchief, and sighed and looked around for the approval and sympathy of Mrs. Voles, and nodded to her brightly, like one who has always foretold a successful issue to things. Mr. Polly felt then like a marionette that has just dropped off its wire, but it was long before that release arrived. 
he became aware of Miriam breathing close to him. Hello, he said, and feeling that was clumsy and would meet the eye's disapproval, a grey dress suits you no end. Miriam's eyes shone under her hat brim. Not really, she whispered. You're all right, he said, with a feeling of observation and criticism stiffening his lips. He cleared his throat. The verger's hand pushed at him from behind. Someone was driving Miriam toward the altar rail and the clergyman. "'We're in for it,' said Mr. Polly to her sympathetically. "'Where? Here. Right-o.' He was interested for a moment or so in something indescribably habitual in the clergyman's pose. What a lot of weddings he must have seen! Sick he must be of them! "'Don't let your attention wander,' said the eye. "'Got the ring?' whispered Johnson. "'Pawned it yesterday,' answered Mr. Polly, and then had a dreadful moment under that pitiless scrutiny while he felt in the wrong waistcoat pocket. The officiating clergy sighed deeply, began, and married them wearily, and without any hitch. "'Dear beloved, we gathered, gather sight to God, and face this congregation, joined, gather man, woman, holy matrimony, which is obly state, stooted by God in time's man's innocency.' Mr. Polly's thoughts wandered wide and far, and once again something like a cold hand touched his heart, and he saw a sweet face in sunshine under the shadow of trees. Someone was nudging him. It was Johnson's finger diverted his eyes to the crucial place in the prayer-book to which they had come. "'Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honour, keep her sickness and health?' "'Say, I will.' Mr. Polly moistened his lips. "'I will,' he said hoarsely. Miriam, nearly inaudible, answered some similar demand. Then the clergyman said, "'Who gifts one to be married to this man?' "'Well, I'm doing that,' said Mr. Voles, in a refreshingly full voice, and looking round at the church. You see, me and Martha Larkins being cousins. He was silenced by the clergyman's rapid grip directing the exchange of hands. Peter for me, said the clergyman to Mr. Polly. Take the Miriam wed wife. Take the Miriam wed wife, said Mr. Polly. Have hold this day forward. Have hold uh, this day forward. Bet worth rich po. Bet worth uh, rich po. Then came Miriam's turn. Lego hands, said the clergyman. Got the ring? No? On the book. So here, peat off me. With this ring, Ivy wed. With this ring, Ivy wed. And so it went on, blurred and hurried, like the momentary vision of an utterly beautiful thing seen through the smoke of a passing train. "'Now, my boy,' said Mr. Voles at last, gripping Mr. Polly's elbow tightly, "'you've got, got to sign the registry, and there you are, done.' Before him stood Miriam, a little stiffly, a hat with a slight rake across her forehead, and a kind of questioning hesitation in her face. Mr. Voles urged him past her. It was astounding. She was his wife. And for some reason Miriam and Mrs. Larkins were sobbing, and Annie was looking grave. Hadn't they, after all, wanted him to marry her? Because if that was the case— he became aware for the first time of the presence of Uncle Penstemon in the background, but approaching, wearing a tie of a light mineral blue colour, and grinning and sucking enigmatically and judiciously round his principal tooth. End of chapter 6, 
Section 2 Chapter 6, Section 3 of The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 6, Section 3. 5. It was in the vestry that the force of Mr. Vole's personality began to show at its true value. He seemed to open out and spread over things directly the restraints of the ceremony were at an end. Everything, he said to the clergyman, excellent. He also shook hands with Mrs. Larkins, who clung to him for a space, and kissed Miriam on the cheek. First kiss for me, he said, anyhow. He led Mr. Polly to the register by the arm, and then got chairs for Mrs. Larkins and his wife and then turned on Miriam. "'Now, young people,' he said, "'one, or I shall again.' "'That's right,' said Mr. Voles. "'Same again, miss.' Mr. Polly was overcome with modest confusion, and, turning, found a refuge from this publicity in the arms of Mrs. Larkins. Then, in a state of profuse moisture, he was assaulted and kissed by Annie and Minnie, who were immediately kissed upon some indistinctly stated grounds by Mr. Voles, who then kissed the entire impassive Mrs. Voles, and smacked his lips and remarked, "'Home again, safe and sound!' Then, with a strange harrowing cry, Mrs. Larkins seized upon and bedewed Miriam with kisses. Annie and Minnie kissed each other, and Johnson went abruptly to the door of the vestry and stared into the church, no doubt with ideas of sanctuary in his mind. "'Like a bit of a kiss round sometimes,' said Mr. Voles, and made a kind of hissing noise with his teeth, and suddenly smacked his hands together with great éclat several times. Meanwhile the clergyman scratched his cheek with one hand, and fiddled the pen with the other, and the verger coughed protestingly. "'The dog-cart's just outside,' said Mr. Voles. "'No walking home to-day for the bride, ma'am.' "'Not going to drive us?' cried Annie. "'The happy pair, miss. Your turn soon.' "'Oh, get out,' said Annie. "'I shan't marry, ever.' "'You won't be able to help it. You'll have to do it, just to disperse the crowd.' Mr. Voles laid his hand upon Mr. Polly's shoulder. The bridegroom gives his arm to the bride, hand across and down the middle, prump, 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 prump. Mr. Polly found himself and the bride leading the way toward the western door. Mrs. Larkins passed close to Uncle Penstemon, sobbing too earnestly to be aware of him. Such a goo goo girl, she sobbed. Didn't think I'd come, did you? said Uncle Penstemon, but she swept past him, too busy with the expression of her feelings to observe him. "'She didn't think I'd come, I lay,' said Uncle Penstemon, a little foiled, but affecting an auditory lodgment upon Johnson. "'I don't know,' said Johnson, uncomfortably. "'I suppose you were asked. How are you getting on?' "'I was asked,' said Uncle Penstemon and brooded for a moment. "'I oh, goes about seeing wonders,' he added, and then in a sort of entranced undertone, "'One of her girls getting married. That's what I mean by wonders. Lord's goodness! Whoa. "'Nothing the matter?' asked Johnson. "'Got it in the back for a moment. Going to be a change of weather, I suppose,' said Uncle Penstemon. I brought her a nice present, too, what I got in this passel, valuable old tea-caddy that used to be my mother's, what I kept my backy in for years and years, till the hinge at the back got broke. It ain't been no use to me particular since, so, thinks I, drat it, I may as well give it to her as not. Mr. Polly found himself emerging from the western door. Outside a crowd of half a dozen adults and about fifty children had collected, 
and hailed the approach of the newly wedded couple with a faint, indeterminate cheer. All the children were holding something in little bags, and his attention was caught by the expression of vindictive concentration upon the face of a small, big-eared boy in the foreground. He didn't for the moment realise what these things might import. Then he received a stinging handful of rice in the ear, and a great light shone. "'Not yet, you young fool!' he heard Mr. Voles saying behind him and then a second handful spoke against his hat. "'Not yet,' said Mr. Voles, with increasing emphasis, and Mr. Polly became aware that he and Miriam were the focus of two crescents of small boys, each with the light of massacre in his eyes, and a grubby fist clutching into a paper bag for rice, and that Mr. Voles was warding off probable discharges with a large red hand. The dog-cart was in charge of a loafer, and the horse and the whip were adorned with white favours, and the back seat was confused but not untenable with hampers. "'Up we go,' said Mr. Voles. "'Old birds in front, and young ones behind.' An ominous group of ill-restrained rice-throwers followed them up as they mounted. "'Get your handkerchief for your face,' said Mr. Polly to his bride and took the place next the pavement with considerable heroism, held on, gripped his hat, shut his eyes, and prepared for the worst. "'Off!' said Mr. Voles, and a concentrated fire came stinging Mr. Polly's face. The horse shied, and when the bridegroom could look at the world again, it was manifest the dog-cart had just missed an electric train by a hair's breadth, and far away outside the church railings, the verger and Johnson were battling with an active crowd of small boys for the life of the rest of the Larkins family. Mrs. Punt and her son had escaped across the road, the son trailing and stumbling at the end of a remorseless arm, but Uncle Penstemon, encumbered by the tea-caddy, was the centre of a little circle of his own, and appeared to be dratting them all very heartily. Remoter, a policeman, approached with an air of tranquil unconsciousness. "'Steady, you idiot! Steady!' cried Mr. Voles, and then over his shoulder, "'I brought that rice. I like old customs. Whoa! Steady!' The dog-cart swerved violently, and then, evoking a shout of groundless alarm from a cyclist, took a corner and the rest of the wedding party was hidden from Mr. Polly's eyes. 6. "'We'll get the stuff into the house before the old gal comes along,' said Mr. Voles, "'if you hold the hoss.' "'What about the key?' asked Mr. Polly. "'I got the key. Coming.' And, while Mr. Polly held the sweating horse, and dodged the foam that dripped from its bit, the house absorbed Miriam and Mr. Voles altogether. Mr. Voles carried in various hampers he had brought with him, and finally closed the door behind him. For some time Mr. Polly remained alone with his charge in the little blind alley outside the Larkins' house, while the neighbours scrutinised him from behind their blinds. He reflected that he was a married man, and that he must look very much like a fool, that the head of the horse is a silly shape, and its eye a bulger. He wondered what the horse thought of him, and whether it really liked being held and patted on the neck, or whether it only submitted out of contempt. Did it know he was married? Then he wondered if the clergyman had thought him much of an ass, and then whether the individual lurking behind the lace curtains of the front room next door was a man or a woman. A door opened over the way, and an elderly gentleman in a kind of embroidered fez appeared smoking a pipe with a quiet, satisfied expression. He regarded Mr. Polly for some time with mild but sustained curiosity. Finally he called. Aye. Hello, said Mr. Polly. You needn't hold that horse, 
said the old gentleman. Spirited beast, said Mr. Polly, and, with some faint analogy to ginger beer in his mind, he's up to-day. He won't turn hisself around, said the old gentleman, anyhow, and there ain't no way through for him to go. Uh, the bum sat, said Mr. Polly, and abandoned the horse, and turned to the door. It opened to him just as Mrs. Larkins, on the arm of Johnson, followed by Annie, Minnie, two friends, Mrs. Punt and her son, and, at a slight distance, Uncle Penstemon, appeared round the corner. "'They're coming,' he said to Miriam, and put an arm about her, and gave her a kiss. She was kissing him back when they were startled violently by the shying of two empty hampers into the passage. Then Mr. Voles appeared, holding a third. "'Here, you'll have plenty of time for that presently,' he said. "'Get these hampers away before the old girl comes. I got a cold collation here to make her sit up. My eye!' Miriam took the hampers, and Mr. Polly, under compulsion from Mr. Voles, went into the little front room. A profuse pie and a large ham had been added to the modest provision of Mrs. Larkins, and a number of select-looking bottles shouldered the bottle of sherry and the bottle of port she had got to grace the feast. They certainly went better with the iced wedding cake in the middle. Mrs. Voles, still impassive, stood by the window regarding these things with faint approval. "'Makes it look a bit thicker, eh?' said Mr. Voles, and blew out both his cheeks and smacked his hands together violently several times. "'Surprise the old girl no end!' He stood back and smiled, and bowed with arms extended as the others came clustering at the door. "'Why, Uncle Voles!' cried Annie, with a rising note. It was his reward. And then came a great wedging and squeezing and crowding into the great room. Nearly everyone was hungry, and eyes brightened at the sight of the pie and the ham and the convivial array of bottles. "'Sit down, everyone!' cried Mr. Bowles. "'Leaning against anything counts as sitting, and it makes it easier to shake down the grub.' Two friends from Miriam's place of business came into the room among the first, and then wedged themselves so hopelessly against Johnson in an attempt to get out again and take off their things upstairs that they abandoned the attempt. Amid the struggle Mr. Polly saw Uncle Penstemon relieve himself of his parcel by giving it to the bride. "'Here,' he said, and handed it to her. "'Wedding present,' he explained, and added with a confidential chuckle, Oh, I never thought I'd have to give you one, ever. "'Who says steak and kidney pie?' bawled Mr. Voles. "'Who says steak and kidney pie? You have a drop of old Tommy, Martha. That's what you want to steady you. Sit down, everyone, and don't all speak at once. Who says steak and kidney pie?' "'Vociferacious,' whispered Mr. Polly. "'Convivial vociferations.' "'Bit of ham with it?' shouted Mr. Voles, poising a slice of ham on his knife. "'Anyone have a bit of ham with it? Won't that little man of yours, Mrs. Punt, won't he have a bit of ham?' "'And now, ladies and gentlemen,' said Mr. Voles, still standing and dominating the crammed roomful, "'now you've got your plates filled, and something I can warrant you good in your glasses. What about drinking the health of the bride?' "'Eat a bit first, said Uncle Penstemon, speaking with his mouth full, amidst murmurs of applause. "'Eat a bit first, And so they did, and the plates clattered and the glasses chinked. Mr. Polly stood shoulder to shoulder with Johnson for a while. "'In for it,' said Mr. Polly, cheeringly. "'Cheer up, old man, and peck a bit. No reason why you shouldn't eat, you know.' The punt boy stood on Mr. Polly's boots for a minute, struggling violently against the compunction of Mrs. Punt's grip. "'Pie!' said the punt boy. "'Pie!' "'You sit here and have ham, my lord,' said Mrs. Punt, prevailing. 
Pa, you can't have, and you won't. Lord bless my heart, Mrs. Punt, protested Mr. Voles. Let the boy have a bit if he wants it, wedding and all. You haven't had him sick in your hands, Uncle Voles, said Mrs. Punt, else you wouldn't want to humour his fancies as you do. I can't help feeling it's a mistake, old man, said Johnson in a confidential undertone. I can't help feeling you've been rash. Let's hope for the best. Always glad of good wishes, old man, said Mr. Polly. You'd better have a drink or something. Anyhow, sit down to it. Johnson subsided gloomily, and Mr. Polly secured some ham and carried it off and sat himself down on the sewing machine on the floor in the corner to devour it. He was hungry and a little cut off from the rest of the company by Mrs. Vole's hat and back, and he occupied himself for a time with Ham and his own thoughts. He became aware of a series of jangling concussions on the table. He craned his neck and discovered that Mr. Vole's was standing up and leaning forward over the table in a manner distinctive of after-dinner speeches, tapping upon the table with a black bottle. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' said Mr. Voles, raising his glass solemnly in the empty desert of sound he had made, and paused for a second or two. "'Ladies and gentlemen, the bride!' He searched his mind for some suitable wreath of speech, and brightened at last with discovery. "'Here's luck to her,' he said at last. "'Here's luck!' said Johnson, hopelessly but resolutely, and raised his glass. Everybody murmured, here's luck. Luck, said Mr. Polly, unseen in his corner, lifting a forkful of ham. That's all right, said Mr. Voles, with a sigh of relief at having brought off a difficult operation. And now, who's for a bit more pie? For a time conversation was fragmentary again. But presently Mr. Voles rose from his chair again. He had subsided with a contented smile after his first oratorical effort, and produced a silence by renewed hammering. "'Ladies and gents,' he said, "'fill up for the second toast, the happy bridegroom.' He stood for half a minute searching his mind for the apt phrase that came at last in a rush. "'Here's... <laughs> "'Luck to him,' said Mr. Voles. "'Luck to him,' said everyone, and Mr. Polly, standing up behind Mrs. Voles, bowed amiably amidst enthusiasm. "'He may say what he likes,' said Mrs. Larkins. "'He's got luck. That girl's a treasure of treasures, and always has been, ever since she tried to nurse her own little sister.' but being three at the time and fell the full flight of stairs from top to bottom, no hurt that any outward eye has ever seen, but always ready and helpful, always tidying and busy, a treasure I must say, and a treasure I will say, giving no more than her due. She was silenced altogether by a rapping sound that would not be denied. Mr. Voles had been struck by a fresh idea, and was standing up and hammering with the bottle again. "'The third toast, ladies and gentlemen,' he said. "'Fill her up, please. The mother of the bride. I, uh, 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 la- ladies and gem, here's luck to her.'" End of chapter 6, section 3The History of Mr. Polly, Chapter 6, Section 4. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells, Chapter 6, Section 4. The dingy little room was stuffy and crowded to its utmost limit, and Mr. Polly's skies were dark with the sense of irreparable acts. 
Everybody seemed noisy and greedy and doing foolish things. Miriam, still in that unbecoming hat, for presently they had to start off to the station together, sat just beyond Mrs. Punt and her son, doing her share in the hospitalities, and ever and again glancing at him with a deliberately encouraging smile. Once she leant over the back of the chair to him and whispered cheeringly, "'Soon be together now.' Next to her sat Johnson, profoundly silent, and then Annie, talking vigorously to a friend. Uncle Penstemon was eating voraciously opposite, but with a kindling eye for Annie. Mrs. Larkin sat next to Mr. Voles. She was unable to eat a mouthful, she declared. It would choke her. But ever and again Mr. Voles wooed her to swallow a little drop of liquid refreshment. There seemed to be a lot of rice upon everybody, in their hats and hair and the folds of their garments. Presently Mr. Voles was hammering the table for the fourth time in the interests of the best man. All feasts came to an end at last, and the break-up of things was precipitated by alarming symptoms on the part of Master Punt. He was taken out hastily after a whispered consultation, and since he had got into the corner between the fireplace and the cupboard, that meant everyone moving to make way for him. Johnson took the opportunity to say, "'Well, so long,' to anyone who might be listening, and disappeared. Mr. Polly found himself smoking a cigarette and walking up and down outside in the company of Uncle Penstemon, while Mr. Voles replaced bottles in hampers and prepared for departure, and the women kind of the party crowded upstairs with the bride. Mr. Polly felt taciturn, but the events of the day had stirred the mind of Uncle Penstemon to speech. So he spoke, discursively and disconnectedly, a little heedless of his listener, as wise old men will. "'They do say,' said Uncle Penstemon, "'one funeral makes many. This time's it's a wedding, but it's all very much of a muchness,' said Uncle Penstemon. "'Am do get in my teeth nowadays,' said Uncle Penstemon. Oh, "'I can't understand it. "'Tisn't like there was nuppets or strings or such it am. "'It's a plain food.' "'Oh, that's better,' he said at last. "'You got to get married,' said Uncle Penstemon. "'Some has, some ain't.' I done it long before I was your age. It ain't for me to blame you. You can't help being the marrying sort any more than me. It's natural like poaching or drinking or wind in the stomach. You can't help it, and there you are. As for the good of it, there ain't no particular good in it, as I can see. It's a toss-up. The otter come, the sooner cold, but they all gets tired of it sooner or later. I ain't no grounds to complain. Two I've had and buried, and might have had a third, and never no worried with kids, never. You done well not to have the big gal. I will say that for you. She's a gadabout grinny, she is, if ever was. A gadabout grinny. Mucked up my mushroom beds to rights, she did. And I haven't forgotten it. Got the feet of a centipede, she has. All over everything and neither with your leave nor by your leave, like strain in a pea-patch. Cluck, cluck, trying to laugh it off. Poor, I laughed her off, I did, dratted lumping baggage. 
For a while he mused malevolently upon Annie and routed out a reluctant crumb from some coy sitting-out place in his tooth. "'It means a toss-up,' said Uncle Penstemon. "'Prize packets they are, and you can't tell what's in em till you take em home and undone em. Never was a bachelor marriage yet that didn't buy a pig in a poke. Never.' Marriage seems to change the very natures in them through and through. You can't tell what they weren't turn into, no how. I've seen the nicest girls go wrong, said Uncle Penstemon, and added with unusual thoughtfulness, Not that I mean you got one of that sort. The worst sort, the grizzler, Uncle Penstemon resumed. If ever I had a grizzler, I'd up a knitter on the head with something pretty quick. I don't think I could abide a grizzler, said Uncle Penstemon. I'd leave her have a lump about, like that other gal I would indeed. I lay I'd make her stop laughing after a bit for all her airs, and mind where her clumsy great feet went. A man's got a tackle em, whatever they be, said Uncle Penstemon, summing up the shrewd observation of an old world lifetime. Good or bad, said Uncle Penstemon, raising his voice fearlessly. A man's got a tackle em. At last it was time for the two young people to catch the train for Waterloo en route for Fishbourne. They had to hurry, and as a concluding glory of matrimony, they travelled second class, and were seen off by all the rest of the party except the punts. Master Punt being now, beyond any question, unwell off. The train moved out of the station. Mr. Polly remained waving his hat, and Mrs. Polly her handkerchief, until they were hidden under the bridge. The dominating figure to the last was Mr. Voles. He had followed them along the platform, waving the equestrian grey hat, and kissing his hand to the bride. They subsided into their seats. "'Got a compartment to ourselves, anyhow,' said Mrs. Polly, after a pause. Silence for a moment. "'The ricey must have bought pounds and pounds.' Mr. Polly felt round his collar at the thought. "'Ain't you going to kiss me, Alfred, now we're alone together?' He roused himself to sit forward, hands on knees, cocked his hat over one eye, and assumed an expression of avidity becoming to the occasion. Never, he said, ever, and feigned to be selecting a place to kiss with great discrimination. Come here, he said, and drew her to him. Be careful of my hat, said Mrs. Polly, yielding awkwardly. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7, Section 1 of The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pratzellus. Chapter 7. The Little Shop at Fishbourne. Section 1. For fifteen years Mr. Polly was a respectable shopkeeper in Fishbourne. Years they were in which every day was tedious and when they were gone, it was as if they had gone in a flash. But now Mr. Polly had good looks no more. He was, as I have described him in the beginning of this story, thirty-seven and fattish, in a not very healthy way, dull and yellowish about the complexion, and with discontented wrinklings round his eyes. He sat on the stile above Fishbourne, and cried to the heavens above him, "'Oh, rotten 
beastly silly hole and he wore a rather shabby black morning coat and vest and his tie was richly splendid being from stock and his golf cap aslant over one eye fifteen years ago and it might have seemed to you that the queer little flower of mr polly's imagination must be altogether withered and dead and with no living seed left in any part of him but indeed it still lived as an insatiable hunger for bright and delightful experiences for the gracious aspects of things for beauty he still read books when he had a chance books that told of glorious places abroad and glorious times that wrung a rich humour from life and contained the delight of words freshly and expressively grouped but alas there are not many such books and for the newspapers and the cheap fiction that abounded more and more in the world mr polly had little taste there was no epithet in them and there was no one to talk to as he loved to talk and he had to mind his shop it was a reluctant little shop from the beginning he had taken it to escape the doom of johnson's choice because fishbourne had a hold upon his imagination he had disregarded the ill-built cramped rooms behind it in which he would have to lurk and live the relentless limitations of its dimensions the inconvenience of an underground kitchen that must necessarily be the living-room in winter the narrow yard behind giving upon the yard of the royal fishbourne hotel the tiresome sitting and waiting for custom the restricted prospects of trade he had visualized himself and miriam first as at breakfast on a clear bright winter morning amidst the tremendous smell of bacon and then as having muffins for tea he had also thought of sitting on the beach on sunday afternoons and of going for a walk in the country behind the town and picking marguerites and poppies but in fact miriam and he were extremely cross at breakfast and it didn't run to muffins at tea and she didn't think it looked well she said to go traipsing about the country on sundays it was unfortunate that miriam never took to the house from the first she didn't like it when she saw it and liked it less when she explored it there's too many stairs she said and the coal being indoors will make a lot of work didn't think of that said mr polly following her round it'll be hard house to clean said miriam white paint's all very well in its way said miriam but it shows the dirt something fearful better have had it nicely grained there's a kind of place here said mr polly where we might have some flowers in pots not me said miriam i've had enough trouble with minnie and her musk they stayed for a week in a cheap boarding-house before they moved in they'd bought some furniture in stamton mostly second-hand but with new cheap cutlery in china and linen and they had supplemented this from the fishbourne shops miriam relieved from the hilarious associations of home developed a meagre and serious quality of her own and went about with knitted brows pursuing some ideal of having everything right mr polly gave himself to the arrangement of the shop with a certain zest and whistled a great deal until miriam appeared and said it went through her head as soon as he had taken the shop he had fitted the window with aggressive posters announcing in no measured terms that he was going to open and now he was getting his stuff put out he was resolved to show fishbourne what window dressing could do he meant to give them boater straws imitation panamas bathing dresses with novelties in stripes light flannel shirts summer ties and ready-made flannel trousers for men youths and boys incidentally he watched the small fishmonger over the way and had a glimpse of the china dealer next door and wondered if a friendly nod would be out of place on the first sunday in this new life he and miriam arrayed themselves with great care 
he in his wedding funeral hat and coat, she in her going-away dress, and went processionally to church, a more respectable-looking couple you could hardly imagine, and looked about them. Things began to settle down next week into their places. A few customers came, chiefly for bathing suits and hat guards, and on Saturday night the cheapest straw hats and ties, and Mr. Polly found himself more and more drawn towards the shop door and the social charm of the street. He found the china dealer unpacking a crate at the edge of the pavement, and remarked that it was a fine day. The china dealer gave a reluctant assent, and plunged into the crate in a manner that presented no encouragement to a loquacious neighbour. "'Zalacious commerciality,' whispered Mr. Polly to that unfriendly back view. Miriam combined earnestness of spirit with great practical incapacity. The house was never clean or tidy, but always being frightfully disarranged for cleaning or tidying up, and she cooked because food had to be cooked, and with a sound moralist's entire disregard of the quality of the consequences. The food came from her hands done rather than improved, and looking as uncomfortable as savages clothed under duress by a missionary with a stock of outsizes. Such food is too apt to behave resentfully, rebel, and work obi. She ceased to listen to her husband's talk from the day she married him, and ceased to unwrinkle the kink in her brow at his presence, giving herself up to mental states that had the quality of secret preoccupation. And she developed an idea for which, perhaps, there was legitimate excuse, that he was lazy. He seemed to stand about in the shop a great deal, to read an indolent habit, and presently to seek company for talking. He began to attend the bar parlour of the God's Providence Inn with some frequency, and would have done so regularly in the evening, if cards which bored him to death had not arrested conversation. But the perpetual foolish variation of the permutations and combinations of two and fifty cards, taken five at a time, and the meagre surprises and excitement that ensue, had no charms for Mr. Polly's mind, which was at once too vivid in its impressions, and too easily fatigued. It was soon manifest that the shop paid only in the least exacting sense, and Miriam did not conceal her opinion that he ought to bestir himself and do things though what he was to do was hard to say. You see, when you have sunken your capital in a shop, you do not very easily get it out again. If customers will not come to you cheerfully and freely, the law sets limits upon the compulsion you may exercise. You cannot pursue people about the streets of a watering place, compelling them, either by threats or importunity, to buy flannel trousers. Additional sources of income for a tradesman are not always easy to find. Wintershed, at the bicycle and gramophone shop to the right, played the organ in the church, and Clamp, of the toy shop, was a pew-opener, and so forth. Gamble, the greengrocer, waited at table, and his wife cooked, and Carter, the watchmaker, left things to his wife while he went about the world winding clocks. But Mr. Polly had none of these arts, and wouldn't, in spite of Miriam's quietly persistent protests, get any other. And on summer evenings he would ride his bicycle about the country, and if he discovered a sale where there were books, he would, as often as not, waste half the next day in going over again to acquire a job lot of them, haphazard, and bring them home tied about with a string, and hide them from Miriam under the counter in the shop. That is a heartbreaking thing for any wife with a serious investigatory turn of mind to discover. She was always thinking of burning these finds, but her natural turn for economy prevailed with her. 
the books he read during those fifteen years. He read everything he got, except theology, and as he read his little unsuccessful circumstances vanished, and the wonders of life returned to him. The routine of reluctant getting up, opening shop, pretending to dust it with zest, breakfasting with a shop egg underdone or overdone, or a herring raw or charred, and coffee made Miriam's way and full of little particles, the return to the shop, the morning paper, the standing, standing at the door saying, How do? to passers-by, or getting a bit of gossip or watching unusual visitors, all these things vanished, as the auditorium of a theatre vanishes when the stage is lit. He acquired hundreds of books at last, old dusty books, books with torn covers and broken covers, fat books whose backs were naked string and glue, an inimical litter to Miriam. There was, for example, The Voyages of La Perouse, with many careful, explicit woodcuts, and the frankest revelations of the ways of the eighteenth-century sailor-man, homely, adventurous, drunken, incontinent and delightful, until he floated smooth and slow, with all sail set and mirrored in the glassy water, until his head was full of the thought of shining, kindly, brown-skinned women, who smiled at him and wreathed his head with unfamiliar flowers. He had, too, a piece of a book about the lost palaces of Yucatan, whose vast terraces buried in primordial forest, of whose makers there is now no human memory. With La Perouse he linked the island at night's entertainments, and it never palled upon him that in the dusky stabbing of the island of voices something poured over the stabber's hands like warm tea. Queer, incommunicable joy it is, the joy of the vivid phrase that turns the statement of the horridest fact to beauty. And another book which had no beginning for him was the second volume of the travels of the abbés Hugh and Gabé. He followed those two sweet souls from their lessons in Tibetan, under Sandura the Bearded, who called them donkeys, to their infinite benefit, and stole their store of butter, through a hundred misadventures to the very heart of Lhasa. And it was a thirst in him that was never quenched to find the other volume, and whence they came, and who in fact they were. He read Fenimore Cooper and Tom Kringle's log side by side with Joseph Conrad, and dreamt of the many-hued humanities of the East and West Indies, until his heart ached to see those sun-soaked lands before he died. Conrad's prose had a pleasure for him that he was never able to define, a peculiar deep-coloured effect. He found, too, one day among the pile of soiled sixpenny books at Port Burdock, to which place he sometimes rode on his ageing bicycle, Bart Kennedy's A Sailor Tramp, all written in livid jerks, and had for ever after a kindlier and more understanding eye for every burly rough who slouched through Fishbourne High Street. Stern he read with a wavering appreciation and some perplexity, but, except for the Pickwick Papers, for some reason that I do not understand, he never took at all kindly to Dickens. Yet he liked Lever, and Thackeray's Catherine, and all Dumas, until he got to the Vicomte de Bragelon. I am puzzled by his insensibility to Dickens, and I record it, as a good historian should, with an admission of my perplexity. It is much more understandable that he had no love for Scott, and I suppose it was because of his ignorance of the proper pronunciation of words that he infinitely preferred any prose to any metrical writing. A book he browsed over with recurrent pleasure was Waterton's Wanderings in South America. 
He would even amuse himself by inventing descriptions of other birds in the Wartonian manner, new birds that he invented, birds with peculiarities that made him chuckle when they occurred to him. He tried to make Rusper, the ironmonger, share his joy. He read Bates, too, about the Amazon, but when he discovered that you could not see one bank from the other, he lost through some mysterious action of the soul that, again, I cannot understand, at least a tithe of the pleasure he had taken in that river. But he read all sorts of things. A book of old Celtic stories, collected by Joyce, charmed him, and Milford's Tales of Old Japan, and a number of paper-covered volumes, Tales from Blackwood, that he had acquired at Easewood, remained a standby. He developed a quite considerable acquaintance with the plays of William Shakespeare, and in his dreams he wore Sank Sento, or Elizabethan clothing, and walked about a stormy, ruffling, taverning, teeming world. Great land of sublimated things, thou world of books! Happy asylum, refreshment, and refuge from the world of every day! The essential thing of those fifteen long years of shopkeeping is Mr. Polly, while athwart the counter of his rather ill-lit shop, lost in a book, or rousing himself with a sigh to attend to business. Meanwhile he got little exercise. Indigestion grew with him until it ruled all his moods. He fattened and deteriorated physically. Moods of distress invaded and darkened his skies. Little things irritated him more and more, and casual laughter ceased in him. His hair began to come off until he had a large bald space at the back of his head. Suddenly, one day it came to him, forgetful of those books and all he had lived and seen through them, that he had been in his shop for exactly fifteen years that he would soon be forty, and that his life during that time had not been worth living, that it had been in apathetic and feebly hostile and critical company, ugly in detail and mean in scope, and that it had brought him at last to an outlook utterly hopeless and grey. End of chapter 7, section 1 Chapter 7, Section 2 of The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 7, Section 2. I have already had occasion to mention, indeed I have quoted, a certain high-browed gentleman living at Highbury, wearing a golden pince-nez, and writing for the most part in that beautiful room the library of the Reform Club. There he wrestles with what he calls social problems, in a bloodless but at times I think one must admit an extremely illuminating manner. He has a fixed idea that something called a collective intelligence is wanted in the world, which means in practice that you and I and everyone have to think about things frightfully hard and pull the results and oblige ourselves to be shamelessly and persistently clear and truthful, and support and respect, I suppose, a perfect horde of professors and writers and artists and ill-groomed difficult people, instead of using our brains in a moderate, sensible way to play golf and bridge, pretending a sense of humour prevents our doing anything else with them, and generally taking life in a nice, easy, gentlemanly way, confound him. Well, this dome-headed monster of intellect alleges that Mr. Polly was unhappy entirely through that. A rapidly complicating society, he writes, which as a whole declines to contemplate its future, or face the intricate problems of its organization, is in exactly the position of a man who takes no thought of dietary or regimen, who abstains from baths and exercises, 
and gives his appetites free play. It accumulates useless and aimless lives as a man accumulates fat and morbid products in his blood. It declines in its collective efficiency and vigour, and secretes discomfort and misery. Every phase of its evolution is accompanied by a maximum of avoidable distress and inconvenience and human waste. Nothing can better demonstrate the collective dullness of our community, the crying need for a strenuous intellectual renewal, than the consideration of that vast mass of useless, uncomfortable, under-educated, under-trained, and altogether pitiable people we contemplate when we use that inaccurate and misleading term, the lower middle class. A great proportion of the lower middle class should properly be assigned to the unemployed and the unemployable. They are only not that because the possession of some small hoard of money, savings during a period of wage-earning, an insurance policy or such like capital, uh, prevents a direct appeal to the rates. But they are doing little or nothing for the community in return for what they consume. They have no understanding of any relation of service to the community. They have never been trained, nor their imaginations touched to any social purpose. A great proportion of small shopkeepers, for example, are people who have, through the inefficiency that comes from inadequate training and sheer aimlessness, or improvements in machinery or the drift of trade, been thrown out of employment, and who set up in needless shops as a method of eking out the savings upon which they count. They contrive to make sixty or seventy per cent of their expenditure. Their rest is drawn from the shrinking capital. Essentially their lives are failures, not the sharp and tragic failure of the labourer who gets out of work and starves, but a slow chronic process of consecutive small losses, which may end, if the individual is exceptionally fortunate, in an impoverished deathbed before actual bankruptcy or destitution supervenes. Their chances of ascendant means are less in their shops than in any lottery that was ever planned. The secular development of transit and communications has made the organization of distributing businesses upon large and economical lines inevitable. Except in the chaotic confusion of newly opened countries, the day when a man might earn an independent living by unskilled or practically unskilled retailing has gone for ever. Yet every year sees the melancholy procession towards petty bankruptcy and imprisonment for debt go on, and there is no statesmanship in us to avert it. Every issue of every trade journal has its four or five columns of abridged bankruptcy proceedings. Nearly every item in which means the financial collapse of another struggling family upon the resources of the community, and continually a fresh supply of superfluous artisans and shop assistants, coming out of employment with savings or help from relations, of widows with a husband's insurance money of the ill-trained sons of parsimonious fathers, which replaces the fallen in the ill-equipped, jerry-built shops that everywhere abound. I quote these fragments from a gifted, if unpleasant, contemporary, for what they're worth. I feel this has come in here as the broad aspect of this history. I come back to Mr. Polly, sitting upon his gate, swearing in the east wind and I, so returning, have a sense of floating across unabridged abysses between the general and the particular. There, on the one hand, is the man of understanding, seeing clearly, I suppose he sees clearly, the big processes 
that dooms millions of lives to thwarting and discomfort and unhappy circumstances, and giving us no help, no hint by which we may get that better collective will and intelligence which would damn the stream of human failure, and, on the other hand, Mr. Polly sitting on his gate, untrained, unwarned, confused, distressed, angry, seeing nothing except that he is, as it were, nettled in greyness and discomfort, with life dancing all about him. Mr. Polly, with a capacity for joy and beauty at least as keen and subtle as yours or mine. I have hinted that our mother England had equipped Mr. Polly for the management of his internal concerns no whit better than she had for the direction of his external affairs. With a careless generosity she affords her children a variety of foods unparalleled in the world's history, and including many condiments and preserved preparations novel to the human economy. And Miriam did the cooking. Mr. Polly's system, like a confused and ill-governed democracy, had been brought to a state of perpetual clamour and disorder, demanding now evil and unsuitable internal satisfactions, such as pickles and vinegar, and the crackling on pork, and now vindictive external expression, war and bloodshed throughout the world, so that Mr. Polly had been led into hatred and a series of disagreeable quarrels with his landlord, his wholesalers, and most of his neighbours. Rumbold, the china dealer next door, seemed hostile from the first for no apparent reason, and always unpacked his crates with a full back to his new neighbour, and from the first Mr. Polly resented and hated that uncivil breath of expressionless humanity wanted to prod it, kick it, satirise it. But you cannot satirise a hack if you have no friend to nudge while you do it. At last Mr. Polly could stand it no longer. He approached and prodded Rumbold. Hello, said Rumbold, standing suddenly erect, and turned about. Can't we have some other point of view? said Mr. Polly. I'm tired of the end elevation. Eh? said Mr. Rumbold, frankly puzzled. Of all the vertebratious animals, man alone raises his face to the sky. Oh, man! Well, why invert it? Rumbold shook his head with a helpless expression. Don't like so much a reary pensy. Rumbold distressed in utter obscurity. In fact, I'm sick of your turning your back on me, see?" A great light shone on Rumbold. "'That's what you're talking about,' he said. "'That's it,' said Polly. Rumbold scratched his ear with the three strawy jam-pots he held in his hand. "'Way the wind blows, I expect,' he said. "'But what's the fuss?' No fuss, said Mr. Polly. Passing remark. I don't like it, old man. That's all. Can't help it if the wind blows my straw, said Mr. Rumbold, still far from clear about it. It isn't ordinary civility, said Mr. Polly. Got to unpack how it suits me. Can't unpack with the straw blowing in one's eyes. Needn't unpack like a pig rooting for truffles, need you? Truffles? Needn't unpack like a pig. Mr. Rumbold apprehended something. Pig? he said, impressed. You calling me a pig? It's the side I seem to get of you. Here, yeah, said Mr. Rumbold, suddenly fierce and shouting and marking his point with gesticulating jam-pots. "'You go indoors. I don't want no row with you, and I don't want you to row with me. I don't know what you're after, but I'm a peaceable man, teetotaler too, and a good thing if you was. See? 
You go indoors. You mean to say, I'm asking you civilly to stop unpacking with your back to me. Pig ain't civil, and you ain't sober. You go indoors and let me go unpacking. You, you're excited. Do you mean? Mr. Polly was foiled. He perceived an immense solidity about Rumbold. Get back to your shop and let me get on with my business, said Mr. Rumbold. Stop calling me pigs, see? Sweep your pavement. I came here to make a civil request. You came here to make a row. I don't want no truck with you, see? I don't like the looks of you, see? And I can't stay standing here all day arguing, see? A pause of mutual inspection. It occurred to Mr. Polly that probably he was to some extent in the wrong. Mr. Rumbold, blowing heavily, walked past him, deposited the jam pots in his shop with an immense affectation that there was no Mr. Polly in the world, returned turned a scornful back on Mr. Polly, and dived to the interior of the crate. Mr. Polly stood baffled. Should he kick this solid mass before him? Should he administer a resounding kick? No. He plunged his hands deeply into his trouser pockets, began to whistle, and returned to his own doorstep with an air of profound unconcern. There, for a time, to the tune of Men of Harlech, he contemplated the receding possibility of kicking Mr. Rumbold hard. It would be splendid, and, for the moment, satisfying, but he decided not to do it. For indefinable reasons, he could not do it. He went indoors and straightened up his dress ties very slowly and thoughtfully. Presently he went to the window, and regarded Mr. Rumbold obliquely. Mr. Rumbold was still unpacking. Mr. Polly had no human intercourse thereafter with Rumbold for fifteen years. He kept up a hate. There was a time when it seemed as if Rumbold might go, but he had a meeting of his creditors, and then went on unpacking as obtusely as ever. Hinks, the saddler, two shops further down the street, was a different case. Hinks was the aggressor, practically. Hinks was a sporting man in his way, with that taste for checks in costume and tight trousers, which is, under providence, so mysteriously and invariably associated with equestrian proclivities. At first Mr. Polly took to him as a character, became frequent in the God's Providence Inn under his guidance, stood and was stood drinks, and concealed a great ignorance of horses, until Hinks became urgent for him to play billiards or bet. Then Mr. Polly took to evading him, and Hinks ceased to conceal his opinion that Mr. Polly was in reality a softish sort of flat. He did not, however, discontinue conversation with Mr. Polly. He would come along to him whenever he appeared at his door, and converse about sport and women and fisticuffs, and the pride of life, with an air of extreme initiation, until Mr. Polly felt himself the faintest underdeveloped imitation of a man that ever had hovered on the verge of non-existence. So he invented phrases for Hink's clothes, and took rusper the ironmonger, into his confidence upon the weaknesses of Hinks. He called him the checkered careerist, and spoke of his patterned legs as shivery shanks. Good things of this sort are apt to get round to people. He was standing at his door one day, feeling bored, when Hinks appeared down the street, stood still and regarded him with a strange malignant expression for a space. Mr. Polly waved a hand in rather belated salutation. Mr. Hinks spat on the pavement and appeared to reflect. Then he came towards Mr. Polly portentously, and paused, and spoke between his teeth 
in an earnest, confidential tone. "'You've been flapping your mouth about me, I'm told,' he said. Mr. Polly felt suddenly spiritless. Uh, "'Not that I know of,' he answered. "'Not that you know of, be blowed. You've been flapping your mouth.' "'I don't see it,' said Mr. Polly. "'Don't see it, be blowed. You go flapping your silly mouth about me, and I'll give you a poke in the eye. See?' Mr. Hinks regarded the effect of this coldly but firmly, and spat again. "'Understand me?' he inquired. Uh, "'Don't recollect,' began Mr. Polly. "'Don't recollect to be blowed. You've plapped your mouth a damn too sight much. This place gets more of your mouth than it wants. Seen this?' And Mr. Hinks, having displayed a freckled fist of extraordinary size and pudginess in an ostentatiously familiar manner to Mr. Polly's close inspection by sight and smell, turned it about this way and that, and shook it gently for a moment or so, and replaced it carefully in his pocket, as for future use, receded slowly and watchfully for a pace, and then turned away as if to other matters, and ceased to be, even in outward seeming, a friend. End of chapter 7, section 2《Chapter Seven, Section Three of the History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Seven, Section Three. Mr. Polly's intercourse with all his fellow tradesmen was tarnished sooner or later by some such adverse incident, until not a friend remained to him and loneliness made even the shop-door terrible. Shops bankrupted all about him, and fresh people came and new acquaintances sprang up, but sooner or later a discord was inevitable. The tension under which these badly fed, poorly housed, bored and bothered neighbours lived made it inevitable. The mere fact that Mr. Polly had to see them every day, that there was no getting away from them, was in itself sufficient to make them almost unendurable to his fretfully active mind. Among other shopkeepers in the high street there was Chuffles the grocer, a small, hairy, silently intent polygamist, who was given rough music by the youth of the neighbourhood because of a scandal about his wife's sister, who was nevertheless totally uninteresting. And Tonks, the second grocer, an old man with an older, very enfeebled wife, both submerged by piety. Tonks went bankrupt, and was succeeded by a branch of the National Provision Company, with a young manager exactly like a fox, except that he barked. The toy and sweetstuff shop was kept by an old woman of repellent manners, and so was the little fish-shop at the end of the street. The Berlin wool-shop, having gone bankrupt, became a newspaper-shop, then fell to a haberdasher in consumption, and, finally, to a stationer. The three shops at the end of the street wallowed in and out of insolvency in the hands of a bicycle repairer and dealer, a gramophone dealer, a tobacconist, a sixpenny halfpenny bazaar keeper, a shoemaker, a greengrocer, and the exploiter of a cinematograph peep show. But none of them supplied friendship to Mr. Polly. These adventurers in commerce were all more or less distraught souls, driving without intelligible comment before the gale of fate. The two milkmen of Fishbourne were brothers who had quarrelled about their father's will, and started in opposition to each other. One was stone-deaf, and no use to Mr. Polly, and the other was a sporting man, with a natural dread of epithet, who sided with Hinks. So it was, all about him, 
On every hand, it seemed, were uncongenial people, uninteresting people, or people who conceived the deepest distrust and hostility towards him, a magic circle of suspicious, preoccupied, and dehumanized humanity. So the poison in his system poisoned the world without. But Boomer, the wine merchant, and Tashingford, the chemist, it be noted, were fraught with pride, and held themselves to be a cut above Mr. Polly. They never quarrelled with him, preferring to bear themselves from the outset as though they had already done so. As his internal malady grew upon Mr. Polly, and he became more and more of a battleground of fermenting foods and warring juices, he came to hate the very sight, as people say, of every one of these neighbours. They were, every day and all the days, just the same, echoing his own stagnation. They pained him all round the top and back of his head. They made his legs and arms weary and spiritless. The air was tasteless by reason of them. He lost his human kindliness. In the afternoon he would hover in the shop, bored to death with his business and his home and Miriam, and yet afraid to go out because of his inflamed and magnified dislike and dread of these neighbours. He could not bring himself to go out and run the gauntlet of the observant windows and the cold, estranged eyes. One of his last friendships was with Rusper, the ironmonger. Rusper took over Worthington's shop about three years after Mr. Polly opened. He was a tall, lean, nervous, convulsive man, with an upturned, back-thrown, oval head, who read newspapers and the Review of Reviews assiduously, had belonged to a literary society somewhere once, and had some defect of the palate that at first gave his lightest word a charm and interest for Mr. Polly. It caused a peculiar clicking sound as though he had something between a giggle and a gas-meter at work in his neck. His literary admirations were not precisely Mr. Polly's literary admirations. He thought books were written to enshrine great thoughts, and that art was pedagogy in fancy dress. He had no sense of phrase or epithet or richness of texture, but still he knew there were books and he was full of large, windy ideas of the sort he called modern thought, and he seemed needlessly and helplessly concerned about the welfare of the race. Mr. Polly would dream about that at nights. It seemed to that undesirable mind of his that Rusper's head was the most egg-shaped head he had ever seen. The similarity weighed upon him, and when he found an argument growing warm with Rusper, he would say, "'Boil it some more, old man, boil it harder,' or six minutes at least.' Allusions Rusper could never make head nor tail of, and got at last to disregard as a part of Mr. Polly's general eccentricity. For a long time that little tendency threw no shadow over their intercourse but it contained within it the seeds of an ultimate disruption. Often during the days of this friendship Mr. Polly would leave his shop and walk over to Mr. Rusper's establishment and stand in his doorway and inquire, "'Well, old man, how's the mind of the age working?' and get quite an hour of it, and sometimes Mr. Rusper would come into the outfitter's shop with, "'Heard the latest, and spend the rest of the morning. Then Mr. Rusper married, and he married, very inconsiderately, a woman who was totally uninteresting to Mr. Polly. A coolness grew between them from the first intimation of her advent. Mr. Polly couldn't help thinking, when he saw her, that she drew her hair back from her forehead 
a great deal too tightly, and that her elbows were angular. His desire not to mention these things in the apt terms that welled up so richly in his mind made him awkward in her presence, and that gave her an impression that he was hiding some guilty secret from her. She decided he must have a bad influence upon her husband, and she made it a point to appear whenever she heard him talking to Rusper. One day they became a little heated about the German peril. "'I lay they'll invade us,' said Rusper. "'Not a bit of it. William's not these acacious sort. "'You'll see, old man. "'Just what I shan't do. "'Before five years are out.' "'Not it.' "'Yes.' "'No.' "'Yes.' "'I'll boil it hard,' said Mr. Polly. And then he looked up and saw Mrs. Rusper standing behind the counter, half hidden by a trophy of spades and garden shears and a knife-cleaning machine, and by her expression he knew instantly that she understood. The conversation paled, and presently Mr. Polly withdrew. After that estrangement increased steadily. Mr. Rusper ceased altogether to come over to the outfitters, and Mr. Polly called upon the ironmonger only with the completest air of casualness. And everything they said to each other led now to flat contradiction and raised voices. Rusper had been warned in vague and alarming terms that Mr. Polly insulted and made game of him. He couldn't discover exactly where, and so it appeared to him that every word of Mr. Polly's might be an insult, meriting his resentment, meriting it none the less because it was masked and cloaked. Soon Mr. Polly's calls upon Mr. Rusper ceased also, and then Mr. Rusper, pursuing incomprehensible lines of thought, became afflicted with a specialised short-sightedness that applied only to Mr. Polly. He would look in other directions when Mr. Polly appeared, and his large oval face assumed an expression of conscious serenity and deliberate happy unawareness that would have maddened a far less irritable person than Mr. Polly. It evoked a strong desire to mock and ape, and produced in his throat a cough of singular scornfulness more particularly when Mr. Rusper also assisted with an assumed unconsciousness that was all his own. Then, one day, Mr. Polly had a bicycle accident. His bicycle was now very old, and it is one of the concomitants of a bicycle's senility that its free wheel should one day obstinately cease to be free. It corresponds to that epoch in human decay when an old gentleman loses an incisor tooth. It happened just as Mr. Polly was approaching Mr. Rusper's shop, and the untoward chance of a motor-car trying to pass a wagon on the wrong side gave Mr. Polly no choice but to get on the pavement and dismount. He was always accustomed to take his time and step off his left pedal at its lowest point but the jamming of the free-wheel gear made that lowest moment a transitory one, and the pedal was lifting his foot for another revolution before he realised what had happened. Before he could dismount according to his habit, the pedal had to make a revolution, and before it could make a revolution, Mr. Polly found himself among the various sonorous things with which Mr. Rusper adorned the front of his shop. Zinc dustbins household pails, lawn-mowers, rakes, spades, and all manner of clattering things. Before he got among them he had one of those agonizing moments of helpless wrath and suspense that seemed to last ages, in which one seems to perceive everything and think of nothing but words that are better forgotten. He sent a column of pails thundering across the doorway, and dismounted with one foot in a sanitary dustbin 
amidst an enormous uproar of falling ironmongery. "'Put all over the place!' he cried, and found Mr. Rusper emerging from his shop with the large tranquillities of his countenance puckered to anger, like the frowns in the brow of a reefing sail. He gesticulated speechlessly for a moment. "'Jer doin'?' he said at last. "'Tin man-traps,' said Mr. Polly. "'Jer doin'? Dressing all over the pavement as though the blessed town belonged to you. <sighs> and Mr. Polly, in attempting a dignified movement, realised his entanglement with the dustbin for the first time. With a low, embittering expression, he kicked his foot about in it for a moment, very noisily, and finally sent it thundering to the curb. On its way it struck a pail or so. Then Mr. Polly picked up his bicycle and proposed to resume his homeward way. But the hand of Mr. Rusper arrested him. Put, put, put all back. Put back yourself. You, you got put back. Get out of the way. Mr. Rusper laid one hand on the bicycle handle, and the other gripped Mr. Polly's collar urgently, whereupon Mr. Polly said, "'Let go!' and again, "'Do you hear? Let go!' and then drove his elbow with considerable force into the region of Mr. Rusper's midriff, whereupon Mr. Rusper, with a loud impassioned cry resembling, "'Whoa!' more than any other a combination of letters, released the bicycle handle, seized Mr. Polly by the cap and hair, and bore his head and shoulders downward. Thereat Mr. Polly, emitting such words as everyone knows and nobody prints, butted his utmost into the concavity of Mr. Rusper, entwined a leg about him, and, after terrific moments of swaying instability, fell headlong beneath him amidst the bicycles and pails. There, on the pavement, these inexpert children of a Pacific age, untrained in arms and uninured to violence, abandoned themselves to amateurish and absurd efforts to injure and hurt one another, of which the most palpable consequence were dusty backs, ruffled hair, and torn and twisted collars. Mr. Polly, by accident, got his finger into Mr. Rusper's mouth, and strove earnestly for some time to prolong that aperture in the direction of Mr. Rusper's ear, before it occurred to Mr. Rusper to bite him, and even then he didn't bite very hard, while Mr. Rusper concentrated his mind almost entirely on an effort to rub Mr. Polly's face on the pavement, and their positions bristled with chances of the deadliest sort. They didn't from first to last draw blood. Then it seemed to each of them that the other had become endowed with many hands and several voices and great accessions of strength. They submitted to fate and ceased to struggle. They found themselves torn apart and held up by outwardly scandalized and inwardly delighted neighbors, and invited to explain what it was all about. I got to put em all back, panted Mr. Rusper in the expert grasp of Hinks, merely asked him to put em back. Mr. Polly was under restraint of little Clamp of the toy shop, who was holding his hands in a complex and uncomfortable manner that he afterwards explained to Wintershed was a combination of something romantic called jiu-jitsu and something less romantic called the police grip. Piles! explained Mr. Polly, in breathless fragments. All over the road, pails bungs up the street, with his pails, look at em. Deliberately rode into my goods, constantly annoying me, said Mr. Rusper. They were both tremendously earnest and reasonable in their manner. They wished everyone to regard them as responsible and intellectual men, acting for the love of right and the enduring good of the world. They felt they must treat this business as a profoundly and publicly significant affair. 
They wanted to explain and orate and show the entire necessity of everything they had done. Mr. Polly was convinced that he had never been so absolutely correct in all his life as when he planted his foot in the sanitary dustbin, and Mr. Rusper considered his clutch at Mr. Polly's hair as one of the faultless impulses in an otherwise undistinguished career. But it was clear in their minds that they might easily become ridiculous if they were not careful, if for a second that they stepped over the edge of the high spirit and pitiless dignity they had hitherto maintained. At any cost, they perceived, they must not become ridiculous. Mr. Chuffles, the scandalous grocer, joined the throng about the principal combatants, mutely as became an outcast, and with a sad, distressed, helpful expression, picked up Mr. Polly's bicycle. Gamble's summer errand boy, moved by example, restored the dustbin and pails to their self-respect. "'He, he ought to pick em up,' protested Mr. Rusper. "'What's it all about?' said Mr. Hinks for the third time, shaking Mr. Rusper gently. "'Has he been calling you names?' "'Simply ran into his pails as any one might,' said Mr. Polly, "'and out he comes and scrags me.' Ass "'Assault!' said Mr. Rusper. "'He assaulted me,' said Mr. Polly. "'Jumped into my dustbin,' said Mr. Rusper. "'That assault, or isn't it?' "'You better drop it,' said Mr. Hinks. "'Great pity they can't behave better, both of them.' said Mr. Chuffles, glad for once to find himself morally unassailable. "'Anyone see it begin?' said Mr. Wintershed. "'I was in the shop,' said Mrs. Rusper, suddenly from the doorstep, piercing the little group of men and boys with the sharp horror of an unexpected woman's voice. "'If a witness is wanted, I suppose I've got a tongue. I suppose I've got a voice in seeing my own husband injured.' "'My husband went out and spoke to Mr. Polly, "'who was jumping off his bicycle all among our pails and things, "'and immediately he butted him in the stomach. "'Immediately, most savagely, butted him. "'Just after his dinner, too, and him far from strong. "'I could have screamed, but Rusper caught hold of him right away. "'I will say that for Rusper.' "'I'm going,' said Mr. Polly suddenly releasing himself from the Anglo-Japanese grip, and holding out his hands for his bicycle. "'Teach you to leave things alone,' said Mr. Rusper, with an air of one who has given a lesson. The testimony of Mrs. Rusper continued relentlessly in the background. "'You'll hear from me through a summons,' said Mr. Polly, preparing to wheel his bicycle. "'Me too!' said Mr. Rusper. Someone handed Mr. Polly a collar. This yours? Mr. Polly investigated his neck. I suppose it is. Anyone seen a tie? A small boy produced a grimy strip of spotted blue silk. Human life isn't safe with you, said Mr. Polly as a parting shot. <coughs> yours isn't, said Mr. Rusper and they got small satisfaction out of the bench, which refused altogether to perceive the relentless correctitude of the behaviour of either party, and reprove the eagerness of Mrs. Rusper, speaking to her gently, firmly but exasperatingly, as, "'My good woman!' and telling her to "'Answer the question! Answer the question!' "'Seems to me,' said the chairman, when binding them over to keep the peace. "'You can't behave like respectable tradesmen. Seems a great pity. Bad example to the young and all that. Don't do any good to the town. Don't do any good to yourselves. Don't do any manner of good to have all the tradesmen in the place scrapping about the pavement of an afternoon.' Think we're letting you off easily this time, and hope it will be a warning to you. Don't expect men of your position to come up before us, 
Very regrettable affair, eh? He addressed the latter inquiry to his two colleagues. Oh, exactly, exactly, said the colleague to the right. Ah, uh, said Mr. Rusper. But the disgust that overshadowed Mr. Polly's being as he sat upon the stile had other and profounder justification than his quarrel with Rusper and the indignity of appearing before the county bench. He was, for the first time in his business career, short with his rent for the approaching quarter-day, and so far as he could trust his own bandling of figures, he was sixty or seventy pounds on the wrong side of solvency. And that was the outcome of fifteen years of passive endurance of dullness throughout the very best years of his life. What would Miriam say when she learned this, and was invited to face the prospect of exile, heaven knows what sort of exile, from their present home? She would grumble and scold, and become limply unhelpful, he knew, and none the less so because he could not help things. She would say he ought to have worked harder, and a hundred such exasperating, pointless things. Such thoughts as these require no aid from undigested cold pork and cold potatoes and pickles to darken the soul, and with these aids his soul was black indeed. "'Might as well have a bit of a walk,' said Mr. Polly at last, after nearly intolerable meditations and sat round and put a leg over the stile. He remained still for some time before he brought over the other leg. "'Kill myself,' he murmured at last. It was an idea that came back to his mind nowadays with a continually increasing attractiveness, more particularly after meals. Life, he felt, had no further happiness to offer him. He hated Miriam, and there was no getting away from her whatever may betide, and for the rest there was toil and struggle, toil and struggle, with a failing heart and dwindling courage to sustain that dreary duologue. "'Life's insured,' said Mr. Polly. "'Place is insured. I don't see as it does any harm to her or any one.' He stuck his hands in his pockets. "'Needn't hurt much,' he said. He began to elaborate a plan. He found it quite interesting, elaborating his plan. His countenance became less miserable, and his pace quickened. "'There is nothing so good in all the world for melancholia as walking, and the exercise of the imagination in planning something presently to be done, and soon the wrathful wretchedness had vanished from Mr. Polly's face. He would have to do the thing secretly and elaborately, because otherwise there might be difficulties about the life insurance. He began to scheme how he could circumvent that difficulty. He took a long walk, for after all, what is the good of hurrying back to shop when you're not only insolvent, but very soon to die. His dinner and the east wind lost their sinister hold upon his soul, and when at last he came back along the Fishbourne High Street, his face was unusually bright, and the craving hunger of the dyspeptic was returning. So he went into the grocer's, and bought a ruddily decorated tin of brightly pink fish-like substance, known as deep-sea salmon. This he was resolved to consume regardless of cost, with vinegar and salt and pepper, as a relish to his supper. He did, and since he and Miriam rarely talked, and Miriam thought honour and his recent behaviour demanded a hostile silence, he ate fast and copiously, and soon gloomily. He ate alone, for she refrained to mark her sense of his extravagance. 
Then he prowled into the high street for a time, thought it an infernal place, tried his pipe and found it foul and bitter, and retired wearily to bed. He slept for an hour or so, and then woke up to the contemplation of Miriam's hunched back and the riddle of life. And this bright, attractive idea of ending for ever and ever and ever all the things that were locking him in, this bright idea that shone like a baleful star above all the reek and darkness of his misery. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight, Section One of the History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Eight, Making an End to Things, Section One. Mr. Polly designed his suicide with considerable care and quite a remarkable altruism. His passionate hatred for Miriam vanished directly the idea of getting away from her for ever became clear in his mind. He found himself full of solicitude then for her welfare. He did not want to buy his release at her expense. He had not the remotest intention of leaving her unprotected with a painfully dead husband and a bankrupt shop on her hands. It seemed to him that he could contrive to secure for her the full benefit of both his life insurance and his fire insurance, if he managed things in a tactful manner. He felt happier than he had done for years scheming out this undertaking, albeit it was perhaps a larger and somberer kind of happiness than had fallen to his lot before. It amazed him to think he had endured this monotony of misery and failure for so long. But there were some queer doubts and questions in the dim, half-lit background of his mind that he had very resolutely to ignore. "'Sick of it!' he had to repeat to himself aloud, to keep his determination clear and firm. His life was a failure. There was nothing more to hope for but unhappiness. Why shouldn't he? His project was to begin the fire with the stairs that led from the ground floor to the underground kitchen and scullery. This he would soak with paraffin, and assist with firewood and paper, and a brisk fire in the coal cellar underneath. He would smash a hole or so in the stairs to ventilate the blaze, and have a good pile of boxes and paper, and a convenient chair or so in the shop above. He would have the paraffin can upset and the shop lamp, as if awaiting refilling, at a convenient distance in the scullery, ready to catch. Then he would smash the house lamp on the staircase. A fall with that in his hand would be the ostensible cause of the blaze. And then he would cut his throat at the top of the kitchen stairs, which would then become his funeral pyre. He would do all this on Sunday morning when Miriam was at church, and it would appear that he had fallen downstairs with the lamp and been burnt to death. There was really no flaw whatever that he could see in the scheme. He was quite sure he knew how to cut his throat, deep at the side, but not to saw at the windpipe, and he was reasonably sure it wouldn't hurt him very much, and then everything would be at an end. There was no particular hurry to get the thing done, of course, and meantime he occupied with various possible variations of the scheme. It needed a dry and dusty east wind, a Sunday dinner of exceptional virulence, a conclusive letter from Conk, Maybridge, Gould and Gabbitas, his principal and urgent creditors, and a conversation with Miriam arising out of arrears of rent and leading on to mutual character-sketching, before Mr. Polly could be brought to the necessary pitch of despair to carry out his plans. He went for an embittering walk, and came back to find Miriam in a bad temper over the tea-things, with the brewings of three-quarters of an hour in the pot, and hot buttered muffin, 
gone leathery. He sat eating in silence, with his resolution made. "'Coming to church?' said Miriam, after she had cleared away. "'Rather, I've got a lot to be grateful for,' said Mr. Polly. "'You've got what you deserve,' said Miriam. "'Pose I have,' said Mr. Polly, and went and stared out of the back window at the despondent horse in the hotel yard. He was still standing there when Miriam came downstairs, dressed for church. Something in his immobility struck home to her. "'You'd better come to church than mope,' she said. "'I shan't mope,' he answered. She remained still for a moment. Her presence irritated him. He felt that in another moment he should say something absurd to her, make some last appeal for that understanding she had never been able to give. "'Oh, go to church!' he said. In another moment the outer door slammed upon her. "'Good riddance,' said Mr. Polly. He turned about. "'I've had my whack,' he said. He reflected. "'I don't see she'll have any cause to holler,' he said. "'Beastly home! Beastly life!' For a space he remained thoughtful. "'Here goes,' he said at last. For twenty minutes Mr. Polly busied himself about the house, making his preparations very neatly and methodically. He opened the attic windows in order to make sure of a good draught through the house, and drew down the blinds at the back and shut the kitchen door to conceal his arrangements from casual observation. At the end he would open the door on the yard and so make a clean, clear draught right through the house. He hacked at and wedged off the tread of a stair. He cleared out the coals from under the staircase, and built a neat fire of firewood and paper there. He splashed about paraffin, and arranged the lamps and can, even as he had designed, and made a fine, inflammable pile of things in the little parlour behind the shop. "'Looks pretty arsonical,' he said as he surveyed it all. Wouldn't do to have a caller now. <laughs> now for the stairs. Plenty of time, he assured himself, and took the lamp which was to explain the whole affair, and went to the head of the staircase between the scullery and the parlour. He sat down in the twilight, with the unlit lamp beside him, and surveyed things. He must light the fire in the coal cellar under the stairs, open the back door, then come up very quickly and light the paraffin puddles on each step, then sit down here and cut his throat. He drew his razor from his pocket and felt the edge. It wouldn't hurt much, and in ten minutes he would be undistinguishable ashes in the blaze. And this was the end of life for him. The end and it seemed to him now that life had never begun for him, never. It was as if his soul had been cramped and his eyes bandaged from the hour of his birth. Why had he never insisted on the things he thought beautiful and the things he desired, never sought them out, fought for them, taken any risk for them, died rather than abandoned them? They were the things that mattered. Safety did not matter. A living did not matter, unless there were things to live for. He had been a fool, a coward and a fool. He had been fooled too, for no one had ever warned him to take a firm hold upon life. No one had ever told him of the littleness of fear, or pain, or death. But what was the good of going through it now again? It was over and done with. The clock in the back parlour pinged at the half-hour. Time, said Mr. Polly, and stood up. For an instant he battled with an impulse to put it all back, hastily, guiltily, and abandon this desperate plan of suicide for ever. But Miriam would smell the paraffin. 
"'No way out this time, old man,' said Mr. Polly. And he went slowly downstairs, matchbox in hand. He paused for five seconds, perhaps, to listen to noises in the yard of the Royal Fishbourne Hotel before he struck his match. It trembled a little in his hand. The paper blackened, and an edge of blue flame ran outward and spread. The fire burnt up readily, and in an instant the wood was crackling cheerfully. Somebody might hear. He must hurry. He lit a pool of paraffin on the scullery floor, and instantly a nest of snaky, wavering blue flame became a gog for prey. He went up the stairs three steps at a time, and one eager blue flicker in pursuit of him. He seized the lamp at the top. Now, he said, and flung it, smashing. The chimney broke, but the glass receiver stood the shock and rolled to the bottom. A potential bomb. Old Rumbold would hear that and wonder what it was. Hm, he'd know soon enough. Then Mr. Polly stood hesitatingly, razor in hand, and then sat down. He was trembling violently, but quite unafraid. He drew the blade lightly under one ear. Lord, but it stung like a nettle. Then he perceived a little blue thread of flame running up his leg. It arrested his attention, and for a moment he sat, razor in hand, staring at it. It must be paraffin on his trousers that had caught fire on the stairs. Of course his legs were wet with paraffin. He smacked the flicker with his hand to put it out, and felt his leg burn as he did so, but his trousers still charred and glowed. It seemed to him necessary that he must put this out before he cut his throat. He put down the razor beside him to smack with both hands, very eagerly, and as he did so a thin, tall, red flame came up through the hole in the stairs he had made, and stood quite still, quite still as it seemed, and looked at him. It was a strange-looking flame, a flattish salmon colour, redly streaked. It was so queer and quiet-mannered that the sight of it held Mr. Polly agape. Woof! went the can of paraffin below, and boiled over with stinking white fire. At the outbreak the salmon-coloured flames shivered and ducked, and then doubled and vanished, and instantly all the staircase was noisily ablaze. Mr. Polly sprang up and backwards, as though the uprushing tongues of fire were an eager pack of wolves. "'Good Lord!' he cried, like a man who wakes up from a dream. He swore sharply, and slapped again as a flame upon his leg. "'What the deuce shall I do? I'm soaked with the confounded stuff!' He had nerved himself for throat-cutting, but this was fire. He wanted to delay things, to put them out for a moment while he did his business. The idea of arresting all this hurry with water occurred to him. There was no water in the little parlour, and none in the shop. He hesitated for a moment whether he should not run upstairs to the bedrooms and get a ewer of water to throw on the flames. At this rate Rumbold's would be ablaze in five minutes. Things were going all too fast for Mr. Polly. He ran towards the staircase door, and its hot breath pulled him up sharply. Then he dashed out through his shop. The catch of the front door was sometimes obstinate. It was now, and instantly he became frantic. He rattled and stormed and felt the parlour already ablaze behind him. In another moment he was in the high street, with the door wide open. The staircase behind him was crackling now like horse-whips and pistol-shots. He had a vague sense that he wasn't doing as he had proposed but the chief thing was his sense of that uncontrolled fire within. What was he going to do? There was the fire brigade station next door but one. The Fishbourne High Street had never seemed so empty. Far off at the corner, by the God's Providence Inn, a group of three stiff hobbledehoys 
in their black best clothes, conversed intermittently with Taplow, the policeman. "'Hi! Hi!' bawled Mr. Polly to them. "'Fire! Fire!' and struck by a horrible thought, the thought of Rumbold's deaf mother-in-law upstairs, began to bang and kick and rattle with utmost fury at Rumbold's shop door. "'Hi!' he repeated. "'Fire!' That was the beginning of the great Fishbourne fire, which burned its way sideways into Mr. Rusper's piles of crates and straw, and backwards to the petrol and stabling of the Royal Fishbourne Hotel, and spread from that basis until it seemed half Fishbourne would be ablaze. The east wind, which had been gathering in strength all that day, fanned the flame. Everything was dry and ready, and the little shed beyond Rumbold's, in which the local fire brigade kept its manual, was alight before the Fishbourne fire-hose could be saved from disaster. In marvellously little time a great column of black smoke, shot with red streamers, rose out of the middle of the high street and all Fishbourne was alive with excitement. Much of the respectable elements of Fishbourne society was in church or chapel. Many, however, had been tempted by the blue sky and the hard freshness of spring to take walks inland, and there had been the usual disappearance of loungers and conversationalists from the beach and the back streets, when, at the hour of six, the shooting of bolts and the turning of keys had ended the British Ramadan, that weekly interlude of drought our law imposes. The youth of the place were scattered on the beach or playing in backyards, under threat if their clothes were dirtied, and the adolescent were disposed in pairs among the more secluded corners to be found upon the outskirts of the place. Several godless youths, seasick but fishing steadily, were tossing about the sea in old Tarbowls, the infidel's boat, and the clamps were entertaining cousins from Port Burdock. Such few visitors as Fishbourne could boast in the spring were at church or on the beach. To all these that column of smoke did, in a manner, address itself. "'Look here,' it said. "'This, within limits, is your affair. What are you going to do?' The three hobbledehoys, had it been a weekday and they in working clothes, might have felt free to act. But the stiffness of black was upon them, and they simply moved to the corner by Rusper's to take a better view of Mr. Polly beating at the door. The policeman was a young, inexpert constable, with far too lively a sense of the public house. He put his head inside the private bar to the horror of every one there. But there was no breach of the law, thank heaven. "'Polly's and Rumbold's on fire,' he said, and vanished again. A window in the top story over Boomer's shop opened, and Boomer, captain of the fire brigade, appeared, staring out with a blank expression. Still staring, he began to fumble with collar and tie. Manifestly, he had to put on his uniform. Hink's dog, which had been lying on the pavement outside winter sheds, woke up, and, having regarded Mr. Polly suspiciously for some time, growled nervously, and went round the corner into Granville Alley. Mr. Polly continued to beat and kick at Rumbold's door. Then the public houses began to vomit forth the less desirable elements of Fishbourne society. Boys and men were moved to run and shout, and more windows went up as the stir increased. Tashingford, the chemist, appeared at his door, in shirt-sleeves and an apron, with his photographic plate-holders in his hand, and then, like a vision of purpose, came Mr. Gamble, the greengrocer, running out of Clayford's alley and buttoning on his jacket as he ran. His great brass fireman's helmet was on his head hiding it all but the sharp nose, the firm mouth, the intrepid chin. He ran straight to the fire-station and tried the door, and turned about and met the eye of Boomer still at his upper window. "'The key!' 
cried Mr. Gamble. The key! Mr. Boomer made some inaudible explanation about his trousers and half a minute. Seen old Rumbold? cried Mr. Polly, approaching Mr. Gamble. Gone over Downford for a walk, said Mr. Gamble. He told me, but look here, we haven't got the key. Lord, said Mr. Polly, and regarded the china shop with open eyes. He knew the old woman must be there alone. He went back to the shop front and stood surveying it in infinite perplexity. The other activities in the street did not interest him. A deaf old lady somewhere upstairs there, precious moments passing. Suddenly he was struck by an idea, and vanished from public vision into the open door of the Royal Fishbourne Tap. And now the street was getting crowded, and people were laying their hands to this and that. Mr. Rusper had been at home reading a number of tracts upon tariff reform during the quiet of his wife's absence in church, and trying to work out the application of the whole question to ironmongery. He heard a clattering in the street, and for a time disregarded it, until a cry of fire drew him to the window. He pencil-marked the tract of Chioza Money's that he was reading side by side with one by Mr. Holt's schooling, made a hasty note, Bal of Trade, say, twelve million, and went to look out. Instantly he opened the window and ceased to believe the fiscal question the most urgent of human affairs. Good God, said Mr. Rusper, and now the rapidly spreading blaze had forced the partition into Mr. Rumbold's premises, swept across his cellar, clambered his garden wall by means of his well-tarred mushroom shed, and assailed the engine-house. It stayed not to consume, but ran as a thing that seeks its quarry. Mr. Polly's shop and upper parts were already a furnace, and black smoke was coming out of Rumbold's cellar gratings. The fire in the engine-house showed only as a sudden rush of smoke from the back, like something suddenly blown up. The fire brigade, still much under strength, were now hard at work in the front of the latter building. They had got the door open all too late. They had rescued the fire escape and some buckets, and were now lugging out their manual, with the hose already a dripping mass of molten, flaring, stinking rubber. Boomer was dancing about and swearing and shouting. This direct attack upon his apparatus outraged his sense of chivalry. The rest of the brigade hovered in a disheartened state about the rescued fire escape, and tried to piece Boomer's comments into some intelligible instruction. Hi said Rusper from the window. "'What's up?' Gamble answered him out of his helmet. "'Hose!' he cried. "'Hose gone!' "'I got hose!' cried Rusper. He had. He had a stock of several thousand feet of hose, garden hose of various qualities and calibres, and now he felt it was time to use it. In another moment his shop door was open and he was hurling pails, garden syringes, and rolls of garden hose out upon the pavement. He cried, "'Undo it!' to the gathering crowd in the roadway. They did. Presently a hundred ready hands were unrolling and spreading and tangling up and twisting and hopelessly involving Mr. Rusper's stock of hose, sustained by an unquenchable assurance that Presently it would, in some manner, contain and convey water, and Mr. Rusper, on his knees, ing violently, became incredibly busy with wires and brass junctions and all sorts of mysteries. "'Fix it to the bathroom tap,' said Mr. Rusper. Next door to the fire station was Mantell and Throbson's, the little fishbourne branch of that celebrated firm, and Mr. Boomer, seeking in a teeming mind for a plan of action, had determined to save this building. Someone telephoned to the Port Burdock and Hampstead-on-Sea fire brigades, 
he cried to the crowd, and then to his fellows, "'Cut away the woodwork of the fire-station!' and so led the way into the blaze with a whirling hatchet that effected wonders in no time in ventilation. But it was not, after all, such a bad idea of his. Mantell and Throbson's were separated from the fire-station in front by a covered glass passage, and at the back the roof of a big outhouse sloped down to the fire-station leads. The sturdy longshoremen who made up the bulk of the fire-brigade assailed the glass roof of the passage with extraordinary gusto, and made a smashing of glass that drowned for a time the rising uproar of the flames. A number of willing volunteers started off to the new telephone office, in obedience to Mr. Boomer's request, only to be told with cold official politeness by the young lady at the exchange that all had been done on her own initiative ten minutes ago. She parlayed with these heated enthusiasts for a space, and then returned to the window. And indeed the spectacle was well worth looking at. The dusk was falling, and the flames were showing brilliantly at half a dozen points. The Royal Fishbourne Hotel Tap, which adjoined Mr. Polly to the west, was being kept wet by the enthusiastic efforts of a string of volunteers with buckets of water, and above, at a bathroom window, the little German waiter was busy with the garden hose. But Mr. Polly's establishment looked more like a house of fire than most houses on fire contrive to look from start to finish. Every window showed eager, flickering flames, and flames like serpents' tongues were licking out of three large holes in the roof, which was already beginning to fall in. Behind, larger and abundantly spark-shot gusts of fire rose from the fodder that was now getting a light at the Royal Fishbourne Hotel stables. Next door to Mr. Polly, Mr. Rumbold's house was disgorging black smoke from the gratings that protected its underground windows, and smoke and occasional shivers of flame were also coming out of its first-floor windows. The fire station was better alight at the back than in the front and its woodwork burnt pretty briskly, with peculiar greenish flickerings and a pungent flavour. In the street an inaggressively disorderly crowd clambered over the rescued fire-escape and resisted the attempts of the three local constables to get it away from the danger of Mr. Polly's tottering façade. A cluster of busy forms danced and shouted and advised on the noisy and the smashing attempt to cut off Mantell and Throbson's from the fire-station, that was still in ineffectual progress. Further, a number of people appeared to be destroying interminable red and grey snakes under the heated direction of Mr. Rusper. It was as if the high street had a plague of worms, and beyond, again, the more timid and less active, crowded in front of an accumulation of arrested traffic. Most of the men were in sabbatical black, and this and the white and starched quality of the women and children in their best clothes gave a note of ceremony to the whole affair. For a moment the attention of the telephone clerk was held by the activity of Mr. Tashingford, the chemist, who, regardless of everyone else, was rushing across the road, hurling fire-grenades into the fire-station, and running back for more, and then her eyes lifted to the slanting outhouse roof that went up to a ridge behind the parapet of Mantell and Throbson's. An expression of incredulity came into the telephone operator's eyes and gave place to hard activity. She flung up the window and screamed out, Two people on the roof up there! Two people on the roof! End of section one. Chapter 8, Section 2 of The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 8, Section 2. Her eyes had not deceived her. Two figures which had emerged from the upper staircase window of Mr. Rumbold and had got after a perilous paddle in his cistern onto the fire station were now slowly but resolutely clambering onto the outhouse roof 
towards the back of the main premises of Messrs. Mantell and Throbson. They clambered slowly, and one urged and helped the other, slipping and pausing ever and again amidst a constant trickle of fragments of broken tile. One was Mr. Polly, with his hair wildly disordered, his face covered with black smudges and streaked with perspiration, and his trouser legs scorched and blackened. The other was an elderly lady, quietly but becomingly dressed in black, with small white frills at her neck and wrists, and a Sunday cap of ecru lace, enlivened with a black velvet bow. Her hair was brushed back from her wrinkled brow, and plastered down tightly, meeting in a small knob behind. Her wrinkled mouth bore that expression of supreme resolution common to the toothless aged. She was shaky, not with fear, but with the vibrations natural to her years, and she spoke with the slow, quavering firmness of the very aged. "'I don't mind scrambling,' she said, with piping inflexibility, "'but I can't jump, and I won't jump.' "'Scramble, then, old lady, scramble,' said Mr. Polly, pulling her arm. It's one up and two down on these blessed tiles. It's not what I'm used to, she said. Stick to it, said Mr. Polly. Live and learn, and got to the ridge and grasped her arm to pull her after him. I can't jump, mind you, she repeated, pressing her lips together. And old ladies like me mustn't be hurried. Uh, "'Well, let's get as high as possible, anyhow,' said Mr. Polly, urging her gently upward. "'Shinning up a water-spout in your line? Near as you'll get to heaven.' "'I can't jump,' she said. "'I can do anything but jump.' "'Hold on,' said Mr. Polly, "'while I give you a boost. That's wonderful.' "'So long as it is jumping.' The old lady grasped the parapet above, and there was a moment of intense struggle. "'Whoa!' said Mr. Polly. "'Hold on! Gollies! Where's she gone to?' Then an ill-mended, wavering, yet very reassuring spring side-boot appeared for an instant. "'Thought perhaps there wasn't any roof there,' he explained, scrambling up over the parapet beside her. "'I've never been out on a roof before,' said the old lady. "'I'm all disconnected. "'It's very bumpy, especially that last bit. "'Can't we sit here for a bit and rest? "'I'm not the girl I used to be.' "'You sit here for ten minutes,' shouted Mr. Polly, "'and you'll pop like a roast chestnut. "'Don't understand me?' Roast, chest, nut, pop. There ought to be a limit to deafness. Come on round to the front and see if we can find an attic window. Look at this smoke. Nasty, said the old lady, her eyes following his gesture, puckering her face into an expression of great distaste. Come on. Can't hear a word you say. He pulled her arm. Come on! She paused for a moment to relieve herself of a series of entirely unexpected chuckles. Such goings on, she said. I never did. Where's he going now? And came along behind the parapet to the front of the drapery establishment. Below, the street was now fully alive to their presence and encouraged the appearance of their heads by shouts and cheers. A sort of free fight was going on round the fire escape, order represented by Mr. Boomer and the very young policeman, and disorder by some partially intoxicated volunteers with views of their own about the manipulation of the apparatus. Two or three lengths of Mr. Rusper's garden hose appeared to have twined themselves round the ladder, 
Mr. Polly watched the struggle with a certain impatience, and glanced ever and again over his shoulder at the increasing volume of smoke and steam that was pouring up from the burning fire-station. He decided to break an attic window and get in, and so tried to get down through the shop. He found himself in a little bedroom, and returned to fetch his charge, but for some time he could not make her understand his purpose. "'Got to come at once!' he shouted. "'I haven't had such a time for years,' said the old lady. "'We've got to get down through the house.' "'Can't do no jumping,' said the old lady. "'No!' She yielded reluctantly to his grasp. She stared over the parapet. "'Running and scurrying about like black beetles in a kitchen.' she said. We've got to hurry. Mr. Rumbold, he's a very quiet man. He likes everything quiet. He'll be surprised to see me here. Why, there he is. She fumbled in her garments mysteriously, and at last produced a wrinkled pocket handkerchief, and began to wave it. Oh, come on, cried Mr. Polly and seized her. He got her into the attic, but the staircase, he found, was full of suffocating smoke, and he dared not venture below the next floor. He took her into a long dormitory, shut the door on those pungent and pervasive fumes, and opened the window to discover the fire-escape was now against the house, and all fishbourne boiling with excitement as an immensely helmeted and active and resolute little figure ascended. In another moment the rescuer stared over the window-sill, heroic, but just a trifle self-conscious and uh, grotesque. "'Looks a mussy,' said the old lady. "'Wonders and wonders! Why, it's Mr. Gamble, hiding his head in that thing— Ooh, I never did. Can we get her out? said Mr. Gamble. There's not much time. He might get stuck in it. You'll get stuck in it, said Mr. Polly. Come along. Not for jumping, I don't, said the old lady, understanding his gestures rather than his words. Not a bit of it. I bain't no good at jumping, and I won't. They urged her gently but firmly towards the window. "'You let me do it my own way,' said the old lady at the sill. "'I could do it better if he'd take it off.' "'Oh, come on!' "'It's worse than Carter's style,' she said, "'before they mended it, with a cow looking at you.' Mr. Gamble hovered protectingly below, Mr. Polly steered her aged limbs from above. An anxious crowd below babbled advice, and did its best to upset the fire-escape. Within, streamers of black smoke were pouring up through the cracks in the floor. For some seconds the world waited, while the old lady gave herself up to reckless mirth again. "'Such times!' she said, and "'Poor Rumbold!' Slowly they descended, and Mr. Polly remained at the post of danger, steadying the long ladder, until the old lady was in safety below, and sheltered by Mr. Rumbold, who was in tears, and the young policeman from the urgent congratulations of the crowd. The crowd was full of such an impotent passion to participate. Those nearest wanted to shake her hand. Those remoter cheered. The first fire I was ever in, and likely to be my last. It's a scurrying, hurrying business, but I'm real glad I ever missed it, said the old lady, as she was borne, rather than led, towards the refuge of the Temperance Hotel. Also, she was heard to remark, He was saying something about hot chestnuts. I haven't had no hot chestnuts.
Then the crowd became aware of Mr. Polly awkwardly negotiating the top runs of the fire escape. "'Here he comes!' cried a voice, and Mr. Polly descended into the world again, out of the conflagration he had lit to be his funeral pyre, moist, excited, and tremendously alive amidst a tempest of applause. As he got lower and lower, the crowd howled like a pack of dogs at him. Impatient men, unable to wait for him, seized and shook his descending boots, and so brought him to earth with a run. He was rescued with difficulty from an enthusiast who wished to slake at his own expense and to his own accompaniment a thirst altogether heroic. He was hauled into the temperance hotel and flung like a sack, breathless and helpless, into the wet tear embrace of Miriam. With the dusk and the arrival of some county constabulary, and first one and presently two other fire engines from Port Burdock and Hampstead on Sea, the local talent of Fishbourne found itself forced back into a secondary, less responsible and more observant role. I will not pursue the story of the fire to its ashes, nor will I do more than glance at the unfortunate Mr. Rusper, a modern Laocoon, vainly trying to retrieve his scattered hose amidst the tramplings and rushings of the Port Burdock experts. In a small sitting-room of the Fishbourne Temperance Hotel, a little group of Fishbourne tradesmen sat and conversed in fragments, and anon went to the window and looked out upon the smoking desolation of their homes across the way, and anon sat down again. They and their families were the guests of old Lady Bargrave, who had displayed the utmost sympathy and interest in their misfortunes. She had taken several people into her own house at Everdeen, and engaged the Temperance Hotel as a temporary refuge, and personally superintended the housing of Mantell and Throbson's homeless assistants. The Temperance Hotel became and remained extremely noisy and congested, with people sitting about everywhere, conversing in fragments, and totally unable to get themselves to bed. The manager was an old soldier, and, following the best traditions of the service, saw that everyone had hot cocoa. Hot cocoa seemed to be about everywhere, and it was no doubt very heartening and sustaining to everyone. When the manager detected someone disposed to be drooping or pensive, he exhorted that person at once to drink further hot cocoa, and maintain a stout heart. The hero of the occasion, the centre of interest, was Mr. Polly, for he had not only caused the fire by upsetting a lighted lamp, scorching his trousers and narrowly escaping death, as indeed he had now explained in detail about twenty times, but he had further thought at once of that amiable but helpless old lady next door, had shown the utmost decision in making his way to her over the yard wall of the Royal Fishbourne Hotel, and had rescued her with perseverance and vigour, in spite of the levity natural to her years. Everyone thought well of him, and was anxious to show it, more especially by shaking his hand painfully and repeatedly. Mr. Rumbold, breaking the silence of nearly fifteen years, thanked him profusely, said he had never really understood him properly, and declared he ought to have a medal. There seemed to be a widely diffused idea that Mr. Polly ought to have a medal. Hinks thought so. He declared, moreover, and with the utmost emphasis, that Mr. Polly had a crowned and richly decorated interior, or words to that effect. There was something apologetic in this persistence. It was as if he regretted past intimations that Mr. Polly was internally defective and hollow. He also said that Mr. Polly was a white man, albeit, as he developed it, 
with a liver of the deepest chromatic satisfactions. Mr. Polly wandered centrally through it all, with his face washed and his hair carefully brushed and parted, looking modest and more than a little absent-minded, and wearing a pair of black dress trousers belonging to the manager of the Temperance Hotel, a larger man than himself in every way. He drifted upstairs to his fellow tradesmen, and stood for a time staring into the littered street, with its pools of water and extinguished gas-lamps. His companions in misfortune resumed a fragmentary, disconnected conversation. They touched now on one aspect of the disaster and now on another, and there were intervals of silence. More or less empty cocoa cups were distributed over the table, mantel-shelf and piano, and in the middle of the table was a tin of biscuits, into which Mr. Rumbold, sitting round-shoulderedly, dipped ever and again in an absent-minded way, and munched like a distant shooting of coals. It added to the solemnity of the affair that nearly all of them were in their black Sunday clothes. Little Clamp was particularly impressive and dignified in a wide-open frock-coat, a Gladstone-shaped paper collar, and a large white and blue tie. They felt that they were in the presence of a great disaster, the sort of disaster that gets into the papers, and is even illustrated by blurred photographs of the crumbling ruins. In the presence of that sort of disaster, all honourable men are lugubrious and sententious. And yet it is impossible to deny a certain element of elation. Not one of those excellent men was but already realising that a great door had opened, as it were, in the opaque fabric of destiny, that they were to get their money again, that had seemed shrunken for ever beyond any hope in the deeps of retail trade. Life was already in their imagination rising like a phoenix from the flames. "'I suppose there'll be a public subscription,' said Mr. Clamp. "'Not for those who are insured,' said Mr. Wintershed. "'I was thinking of them assistants from Mantell and Throbson's. They must have lost nearly everything.' "'They'll be looked after all right,' said Mr. Rumbold. "'Never fear.' Pause. "'I'm insured,' said Mr. Clamp, with unconcealed satisfaction. Royal Salamander. Same here, said Mr. Wintershed. Mine's the Glasgow Sun, Mr. Hinks remarked. Very good company. You insured Mr. Polly? He deserves to be, said Rumbold. Rather, said Hinks. Blowed if he don't. Hard lines it would be, if there wasn't something for him. Commercial in general answered Mr. Polly over his shoulder, still staring out of the window. "'Oh, I'm all right.' The topic dropped for a time, though manifestly it continued to exercise their minds. "'It's cleared me out of a lot of old stock,' said Mr. Wintershed. "'That's one good thing.' The remark was felt to be in rather questionable taste, and still more so was his next comment. Rusp is a bit sick. It didn't reach him. Everyone looked uncomfortable, and no one was willing to point the reason why a Rusper should be a bit sick. Rusper's been playing a game of his own, said Hinks. Wonder what he thought he was up to, sitting in the middle of the road with a pair of tweezers he was, and about a yard of wire mending something. Wonder he wasn't run over by the Port Burdock engine. Presently a little chat sprung up on the causes of fires, and Mr. Polly was moved to tell how it had happened for the one and twentieth time. His story had now become as circumstantial and exact as the evidence of a police witness. "'Upset the lamp,' he said. "'I just lighted it. I was going upstairs, and my foot slipped against one of where the treads was a bit rotten. And down I went.' 
Ooh, thing was a flame in a moment. He yawned at the end of the discussion and moved doorward. So long, said Mr. Polly. Good night, said Mr. Rumbold. You played a brave man's part. If you don't get a medal... He left an eloquent pause. Ear, ear, said Mr. Wintershed and Mr. Clamp. Good night, old man, said Mr. Hinks. Good night, all, said Mr. Polly. He went slowly upstairs. The vague perplexity common to popular heroes pervaded his mind. He entered the bedroom and turned up the electric light. It was quite a pleasant room, one of the best in the Temperance Hotel, with a nice, clean, flowered wallpaper and a very large looking-glass. Miriam appeared to be asleep, and her shoulders were humped up under the clothes in a shapeless, forbidding lump that Mr. Polly had found utterly loathsome for fifteen years. He went softly over to the dressing-table and surveyed himself thoughtfully. Presently he hitched up the trousers. "'Miles too big for me,' he remarked. "'Funny not to have a pair of breeches of one's own. Like being born again. Naked came I into this world.' Miriam stirred and rolled over and stared at him. "'Hello,' she said. "'Hello. Come to bed.' It's three. Pause, while Mr. Polly disrobed slowly. I've been thinking, said Miriam, it isn't going to be so bad after all. We shall get your insurance. We can easily begin all over again. Hm, said Mr. Polly. She turned her face away from him and reflected. Get a better house, said Miriam, regarding the wallpaper pattern. I've always hated them stairs. Mr. Polly removed a boot. Choose a better position where there's more doing, murmured Miriam. Not half so bad, she whispered. You wanted stirring up, she said, half asleep. It dawned then upon Mr. Polly for the first time that he had forgotten something. He ought to have cut his throat. The fact struck him as remarkable, but as now no longer of any particular urgency. It seemed a thing far off in the past, and he wondered why he had not thought of it before. Odd thing life is. If he had done it, he would never have seen this clean and agreeable apartment with the electric light. His thoughts wandered into a question of detail. Where could he have put the razor down? Somewhere in the little room behind the shop, he supposed. But he couldn't think where more precisely. Anyhow, it didn't matter now. He undressed himself calmly, got into bed, and fell asleep almost immediately. End of Chapter 8「Chapter Nine, Section One of the History of Mr. Polly Chapter Nine, Section One The Potwell Inn But when a man has broken through the paper walls of everyday circumstance, those unsubstantial walls that hold so many of us securely prisoned from the cradle to the grave, he has made a discovery. If the world does not please you, you can change it. Determine to alter it at any price, and you can change it altogether. You may change it to something sinister and angry, to something appalling. But it may be that you will change it to something brighter, something more agreeable, and at the worst something much more interesting. There is only one sort of man who is absolutely to blame for his own misery, 
and that is the man who finds life dull and dreary. There are no circumstances in the world that determined action cannot alter, unless perhaps they are the walls of a prison cell, and even those will dissolve and change, I am told, into the infirmary compartment, at any rate, for the man who can fast with resolution. I give these things as fact and information, and with no moral intimations. And Mr. Polly, laying awake at night, with a renewed indigestion, with Miriam sleeping sonorously beside him, and a general air of inevitableness about his situation, saw through it. Understood, there was no inevitable any more, and escaped his former despair. He could, for example, clear out. It became a wonderful and alluring phrase to him, clear out. Why had he never thought of clearing out before? He was amazed and a little shocked at the unimaginative and superfluous criminality in him that had turned old, cramped, and stagnant Fishbourne into a blaze and new beginnings. I wish from the bottom of my heart I could say he was properly sorry. But something constricting and restrained seemed to have been destroyed by that flare. Fishbourne wasn't the world. That was the new, the essential fact of which he had lived so lamentably in ignorance. Fishbourne, as he had known it and hated it, so that he wanted to kill himself to get out of it, wasn't the world. The insurance money he was to receive made everything humane and kindly and practicable. He would clear out with justice and humanity. He would take exactly twenty-one pounds, and all the rest he would leave to Miriam. That seemed to him absolutely fair. Without him she could do all sorts of things, all the sorts of things she was constantly urging him to do and he would go off along the white road that led to Garchester, and on to Crowgate, and so to Tunbridge Wells, where there was a toad rock he had heard of but never seen. It seemed to him this must needs be a marvel, and so to other towns and cities. He would walk and loiter by the way, and sleep in inns at night, and get odd jobs here and there, and talk to strange people. Perhaps he would get quite a lot of work and prosper, and if he did not do so he would lie down in front of a train, or wait for a warm night, and then fall into some smooth, broad river. Not so bad as sitting down to a dentist, not nearly so bad, and he would never open a shop any more. Never. So the possibilities of the future presented themselves to Mr. Polly, as he lay awake at nights. It was springtime, and in the woods, so soon as one got out of reach of the sea wind, there would be anemones and primroses. A month later a leisurely and dusty tramp, plump equatorially and slightly bald, with his hands in his pockets and his lips puckered to a contemplative whistle, strolled along the river bank between Uppingdon and Potwell. It was a profusely budding spring day, and greens such as God had never permitted in the world before in human history, though indeed they come every year, were mirrored vividly in a mirror of unequally unprecedented brown. For a time the wanderer stopped and stood still, and even the thin whistle died away from his lips as he watched a water vole run to and fro upon a little headland across the stream. The vole plopped into the water, and swam and dived, and only when the last ring of its disturbance had vanished did Mr. Polly resume his thoughtful course to nowhere in particular. For the first time in many years he had been leading a healthy human life, living constantly in the open air, walking every day for eight or nine hours, eating sparingly, accepting every conversational opportunity, 
not even disdaining the discussion of possible work, and beyond mending a hole in his coat that he had made while negotiating barbed wire with a borrowed needle and thread in a lodging-house, he had done no work at all. Neither had he worried about business or about times and seasons, and for the first time in his life he had seen the aurora borealis. So far the holiday had cost him very little. He had arranged it on a plan that was entirely his own. He had started out with four five-pound notes and a pound divided into silver, and he had gone by train from Fishbourne to Ashington. At Ashington he had gone to the post office, obtained a registered letter, and sent his four five-pound notes with a short brotherly note addressed to himself at Gilhampton Post Office. He sent this letter to Gilhampton for no other reason in the world that he liked the name of Gilhampton and the rural suggestion of its containing county, which was Sussex, and, having so dispatched it, he set himself to discover, mark down, and walk to Gilhampton, and so recover his resources. And having got to Gilhampton at last, he changed his five-pound note, bought four-pound postal orders, and repeated his manoeuvre with nineteen pounds. After a lapse of fifteen years, he rediscovered this interesting world, about which so many people go incredibly blind and bored. He went along country roads while all the birds were piping and chirruping, and cheeping and singing, and looked at fresh new things and felt as happy and irresponsible as a boy with an unexpected half-holiday. And if ever the thought of Miriam returned to him, he controlled his mind. He came to country inns, and sat for unmeasured hours talking of this and that to those sage carters who rest for ever in the taps of country inns, while the big, sleek, brass-jingling horses wait patiently outside with their wagons. He got a job with some van people who were wandering about the country with swings and a steam roundabout, and remained with them for three days, until one of their dogs took a violent dislike to him and made his duties unpleasant. He talked to tramps and wayside labourers. He snoozed under hedges by day and in outhouses and hayricks at night, and once, but only once, he slept in a casual ward. He felt as the etiolated grass and daisies must do when you move the garden roller away to a new place. He gathered a quantity of strange and interesting memories. He crossed some misty meadows by moonlight, and the mist lay low on the grass, so low that it scarcely reached above his waist and houses and clumps of trees stood out like islands in a milky sea, so sharply denned was the upper surface of the mist-bank. He came nearer and nearer to a strange thing that floated like a boat upon this magic lake, and behold, something moved at the stern, and a rope was whisked at the prow, and it had changed into a pensive cow, drowsy-eyed, regarding him. He saw a remarkable sunset in a new valley near Maidstone, a very red and clear sunset, a wide redness under a pale cloudless heaven, and with the hills all round the edge of the sky a deep purple blue and clear and flat, looking exactly as he had seen mountains painted in pictures. He seemed transported to some strange country, and would have felt no surprise if the old labourer he came upon, leaning silently over a gate, had addressed him in an unfamiliar tongue. Then, one night, just towards dawn, his sleep upon a pile of brushwood was broken by the distant rattle of a racing motor-car, breaking all the speed regulations, and as he could not sleep again, he got up and walked into Maidstone as the day came. He had never been abroad in a town at half-past two in his life before, and the stillness of everything in the bright sunrise 
impressed him profoundly. At one corner was a startling policeman, standing in a doorway, quite motionless, like a waxen image. Mr. Polly wished him good morning, unanswered, and went down to the bridge over the medway, and sat on the parapet very still and thoughtful, watching the town awaken, and wondering what he should do if it didn't, if the world of men never woke up again. One day he found himself going along a road, with a wide space of sprouting bracken and occasional trees on either side, and suddenly this road became strangely, perplexingly familiar. Lord, he said, and turned about and stood. It can't be. He was incredulous, left the road, and walked along a scarcely perceptible track to the left, and came in half a minute to an old lichenous stone wall. It seemed exactly the bit of wall he had known so well. It might have been but yesterday he was in that place. There remained even a little pile of wood. It became absurdly the same wood. The bracken, perhaps, was not so high, and most of its fronds still uncoiled. That was all. Here he had stood, it seemed, and there she had sat and looked down upon him. Where was she now, and what had become of her? He counted the years back, and marvelled that beauty should have called to him with so imperious a voice, and signified nothing. He hoisted himself with some difficulty to the top of the wall, and off under the two beeches, two schoolgirls, small, insignificant, pigtailed creatures, with heads of blonde and black, with their arms twined about each other's necks, no doubt telling each other the silliest secrets. But that girl with the red hair, was she a countess? Was she a queen? Children, perhaps. Had sorrow dared to touch her? Had she forgotten altogether? A tramp sat by the roadside thinking, and it seemed to the man in the passing motor-car he must needs be plotting for another pot of beer. But, as a matter of fact, what the tramp was saying to himself over and over was a variant upon a well-known Hebrew word. Ichabod, the tramp was saying in the voice of one who reasons on the side of the inevitable. It's fair Ichabod, old man. There's no going back to it. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon, one hot day in high May, when Mr. Polly, unhurrying and serene, came to that broad bend of the river to which the little lawn and garden of the Potwell Inn run down. He stopped at the sight of the place, with its deep tiled roof, nestling under big trees. You never get a decently big, decently shaped tree by the seaside. Its sign toward the roadway, its sun-blistered green bench and tables, its shapely white windows, and its row of upshooting hollyhock plants in the garden. A hedge separated it from a buttercup-yellow meadow, and beyond stood three poplars in a group against the sky, three exceptionally tall, graceful, and harmonious poplars. It is hard to say what there was about them that made them so beautiful to Mr. Polly but they seemed to him to touch a pleasant scene to a distinction almost divine. He remained admiring them for a long time. At last the need for coarser aesthetic satisfactions arose in him. Provinder, he whispered, drawing near to the inn. Cold soiloin for choice, and nut-brown brew, and wheaten bread. The nearer he came to the place, the more he liked it. The windows on the ground floor were long and low, and they had pleasing red blinds. The green tables outside were agreeably ringed with memories of former drinks, and an extensive grapevine spread level branches across the whole front of the place. Against the wall was a broken oar, two boat-hooks, and stained and faded red cushions of a pleasure-boat. One went up three steps to the glass-panelled door, 
and peeped into a broad, low room with a bar and beer engine, behind which were many bright and helpful-looking bottles against mirrors, and great and little pewter measures, and bottles fastened in brass wire upside down with their corks replaced by taps, and a white china cask labelled shrub, and cigar boxes and boxes of cigarettes, and a couple of toby jugs, and a beautifully coloured hunting scene, framed and glazed, showing the most elegant and beautiful people taking piper's cherry brandy, and cards such as the law requires about the dilution of spirits, and the illegality of bringing children into bars, and satirical verses about swearing and asking for credit, and three very bright red-cheeked waxed apples, and a round-shaped clock. But these were the mere background to the really pleasant thing in the spectacle, which was quite the plumpest woman Mr. Polly had ever seen, seated in an armchair in the midst of all these bottles and glasses and glittering things, peacefully and tranquilly, and without the slightest loss of dignity, asleep. Many people would have called her a fat woman, but Mr. Polly's innate sense of epithet told him from the outset that plump was the word. She had shapely brows and a straight, well-shaped nose, kind lines and contentment about her mouth, and beneath it the jolly chins clustered like chubby little cherubim about the feet of an assumptioning Madonna. Her plumpness was firm and pink and wholesome, and her hands, dimpled at every joint, were clasped in front of her. She seemed, as it were, to embrace herself with infinite confidence and kindliness, as one who knew herself good in substance, good in essence, and would show her gratitude to God by that ready acceptance of all that he had given her. Her head was a little on one side, not much, but just enough to speak of trustfulness, and rob her of the stiff effect of self-reliance. And she slept. "'My salt,' said Mr. Polly, and opened the door very softly, divided between the desire to enter and come nearer, and an instinctive indisposition to break slumbers so manifestly sweet and satisfying. She awoke with a start, and it amazed Mr. Polly to see swift terror flash into her eyes. Instantly it had gone again. "'Lor!' she said, her face softening with relief. "'I thought you were Jim.' "'I'm never Jim,' said Mr. Polly. "'You've got his sort of hat.' "'Oh!' said Mr. Polly, and leant over the bar. "'It just came into my head that you was Jim,' said the plump lady, dismissed the topic, and stood up. "'I believe I was having forty winks,' she said, "'if all the truth was told. What can I do for you?' "'Cold meat,' said Mr. Polly. "'There is cold meat,' the plump woman admitted. "'And room for it.' The plump woman came and leant over the bar, and regarded him, judicially, but kindly. "'There's some cold broiled beef,' she said, and added, "'a bit of crisp lettuce.' "'New mustard,' said Mr. Polly, "'and a tankard.' "'A tankard.' They understood each other perfectly. "'Looking for work?' asked the plump woman. "'In a way,' said Mr. Polly. They smiled like old friends. Whatever the truth may be about love, there is certainly such a thing as friendship at first sight. They liked each other's voices. They liked each other's way of smiling and speaking. "'It's such beautiful weather this spring,' said Mr. Polly, explaining everything. "'What sort of work do you want?' she asked. "'I've never properly thought that out,' said Mr. Polly. I've been looking round for ideas. Will you have your beef in the tap or outside? That's the tap. 
Mr. Polly had a glimpse of an oaken settle. "'In the tap will be handier for you,' he said. "'Hear that?' said the plump lady. "'Hear what?' "'Lesson.' Presently the silence was broken by a distant howl. "'Over!' "'Eh?' she said. He nodded. "'That's the ferry, and there isn't a ferryman.' "'Er, uh, could I?' "'Can you punt?' "'Er, uh, never tried.' "'Well, pull the pole out before you reach the end of the punt. That's all. Try.' Mr. Polly went out again into the sunshine. At times one can tell so much so briefly. Here are the facts, then. Bear. He found a punt and a pole, got across to the steps on the opposite side, picked up an elderly gentleman in an alpaca jacket and a pith helmet, cruised with him vaguely for twenty minutes, conveyed him torturously into the midst of a thicket of forget-me-not spangled sedges, splashed the water-weed over him, hit him twice with the punt-pole, and finally landed him, alarmed but abusive, in treacherous soil at the edge of a hay-meadow about forty yards downstream, where he immediately got into difficulties with a noisy, aggressive little white dog, which was guardian of a jacket. Mr. Polly returned in a complicated manner to his moorings. He found the plump woman rather flushed and tearful, and seated at one of the green tables outside. "'I've been laughing at you,' she said. "'What for?' asked Mr. Polly. "'I ain't had such a laugh since Jim came home. When you hit his head, it hurt my side, huh?' "'It didn't hurt his head, not particularly she waved her head did you charge him anything uh gratis said mr polly i never thought of it the plump woman pressed her hands to her side and laughed silently for a space you ought to have charged him something she said you better come and have your cold meat before you do any more punting you and me'll get on together Presently she came and stood watching him eat. "'You eat better than you punt,' she said, and then, "'I dare say you could learn to punt.' "'Wax to receive and marble to retain,' said Mr. Polly. "'This beef is a bit of all right, ma'am. I could have done differently if I hadn't been punting on an empty stomach. There's a queer feeling as the pole goes in.' "'I've never held with fasting,' said the plump woman. "'You want a ferryman? I want an odd man about the place.' "'Well, I'm odd all right. What's your wages?' "'Not much, but you'll get tips and pickings. I've a sort of feeling it would suit you.' "'I've a sort of feeling it would. What's the duties? Fetch and carry? Ferry? Garden? Uh, wash bottles?' Ceritis parabus that's about it said the fat woman uh, give me a trial i've more than half a mind or i wouldn't have said anything about it i suppose you're all right you've got a sort of half respectable look about you i suppose you haven't done anything oh bit of arson said mr polly as if he jested so long as you haven't the habit said the plump woman "'My first time, ma'am,' said Mr. Polly, munching his way through an excellent big leaf of lettuce, "'and my last.' "'It's all right if you haven't been to prison,' said the plump woman. "'It isn't what a man's happened to do makes him bad. We all happen to do things at times. It's bringing it home to him, and spoiling his self-respect does the mischief. "'You don't look a wrong un. Have you been to prison?' never nor a reformatory nor any institution not me do i look reformed can you paint and carpenter a bit well i'm ripe for it have a bit of cheese if i might and the way she brought the cheese showed mr polly that the business was settled in her mind he spent the afternoon exploring the premises of the potwell inn 
and learning the duties that might be expected of him, such as Stockholm tarring fences, digging potatoes, swabbing out boats, helping people land, embarking, landing, and timekeeping for the hirers of two rowing boats and one Canadian canoe, bailing out the said vessels, and concealing their leaks and defects from prospective hirers, persuading inexperienced hirers to start downstream rather than up, repairing rollocks and taking inventories of returning boats with a view to supplementary charges, cleaning boots, sweeping chimneys, house-painting, cleaning windows, sweeping out and sanding the tap and bar, cleaning pewter, washing glasses, turpentining woodwork, whitewashing generally, plumbing and engineering, repairing locks and clocks, waiting and tapsters' work generally, beating carpets and maps, cleaning bottles and saving corks, taking into the cellar, moving, tapping and connecting beer casks and their engines, blocking and destroying wasps' nests, doing forestry with several trees, drowning superfluous kittens, and dog-fancying as required, assisting in the rearing of ducklings and the care of various poultry, bee-keeping, stabling, baiting and grooming horses and asses, cleaning and garing motor-cars and bicycles, inflating tyres and repairing punctures, recovering the bodies of drowned persons from the river as required, and assisting people in trouble in the water, first aid and sympathy, improvising and superintending a bathing station for visitors, attending inquests and funerals in the interests of the establishment, scrubbing floors, and all the ordinary duties of scullion, the ferry, chasing hens and goats from the adjacent cottages out of the garden, making up paths and superintending drainage, gardening generally, delivering bottled beer and soda-water siphons to the neighbourhood, running miscellaneous errands, removing drunken and offensive persons from the premises by tact or muscle as occasion required, keeping in with the local policemen, defending the premises in general, and the orchard in particular from depredators. "'Can but try it,' said Mr. Polly, towards tea-time. "'When there's nothing else on hand, I suppose I might do a bit of fishing.' End of section one. Chapter nine, section two of the history of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter nine, section two. Mr. Polly was particularly charmed by the ducklings. They were piping about among the vegetables in the company of their foster-mother, and as he and the plump woman came down the garden path, the little creatures mobbed them, and ran over their boots, and in between Mr. Polly's legs, and did their best to be trodden down and killed, after the manner of ducklings all the world over. Mr. Polly had never been near young ducklings before, and their extreme blondness and the delicate completeness of their feet and beaks filled him with admiration. It is open to question whether there is anything more friendly in the world than a very young duckling. It was with the utmost difficulty that he tore himself away to practice punting, with the plump woman coaching from the bank. Punting, he found, was difficult, but not impossible, and towards four o'clock he succeeded in conveying a second passenger across the sundering flood from the inn to the unknown. As he returned, slowly indeed, but now one might say, surely, to the peg to which the punt was moored, he became aware of a singularly delightful human being awaiting him on the bank. She stood with her legs very wide apart, her hands behind her back, and her head a little on one side, watching his gestures with an expression of disdainful interest. She had black hair and brown legs, and a buff short frock, and very intelligent eyes. And when he reached a sufficient proximity she remarked, 
Hello. Hello, said Mr. Polly, and saved himself in the nick of time from disaster. Silly, said the young lady, and Mr. Polly lunged nearer. What are you called? Polly. Liar. Why? I'm Polly. Then I'm Alfred, but I meant to be Polly. I was first. All right. I'm going to be the ferryman. I see. You'll have to punt better. You should have seen me earlier in the afternoon. I can imagine it. I've seen the others. What others? Mr. Polly had now landed and was fastening up the punt. Wayam has scooted. Scooted? He conies and scoots them. He'll scoot you too, I expect. A mysterious shadow seemed to fall athwart the sunshine and pleasantness of the Potwell Inn. "'I'm not a scooter,' said Mr. Polly. "'Uncle Jim is.' She whistled a little flatly for a moment, and threw small stones at a clump of meadow-sweet that sprang from the bank. Then she remarked, "'When Uncle Jim comes back, he'll cut your insides out. Perhaps, very likely, he'll let me see.' There was a pause. "'Who's Uncle Jim?' Mr. Polly asked in a faded voice. "'Don't you know who Uncle Jim is? He'll show you. He's a scorcher, is Uncle Jim. He only came back just a little time ago, and he scooted three men. He don't like strangers about, don't Uncle Jim. He can swear. He's going to teach me, soon as I can whistle properly.' "'Teach you to swear?' cried Mr. Polly, horrified. "'And spit,' said the little girl proudly. He says I'm the gamest little beast he ever came across, ever. For the first time in his life it seemed to Mr. Polly that he had come across something sheerly dreadful. He stared at the pretty thing of flesh and spirit in front of him, lightly balanced on its stout little legs, and looking at him with eyes that had still to learn the expression of either disgust or fear. "'I say,' said Mr. Polly. How old are you? Nine, said the little girl. She turned away and reflected. Truth compelled her to add one statement. He's not what I should call handsome, not Uncle Jim, she said. But he's a scorcher and no mistake. Grammar don't like him. Mr. Polly found the plump woman in the big bricked kitchen, lighting a fire for tea. He went to the root of the matter at once. "'I say,' he asked, "'who's Uncle Jim?' The plump woman blanched and stood still for a moment. A stick fell out of the bundle in her hand, unheeded. "'That little granddaughter of mine been saying things?' she asked faintly. Uh, "'Bits of things,' said Mr. Polly. "'Well,' I suppose I must tell you sooner or later. He's—it's Jim. He's the drawback to this place. That's what he is, the drawback. I hoped you mightn't hear her so soon. Very likely he's gone. She don't seem to think so. He hasn't been near the place these two weeks and more, said the plump woman. But who is he? "'I suppose I've got to tell you,' said the plump woman. "'She says he scoots people,' Mr. Polly remarked after a pause. "'He's my sister's own son.' The plump woman watched the crackling fire for a space. "'I suppose I've got to tell you,' she repeated. She softened towards tears. "'I try not to think of it.' and day and night he's haunting me i try not to think of it i've been easy going my whole life but i'm that worried and afraid with death and ruin threatened and evil all about me i don't know what to do my own sister's son a mere widow woman and helpless against his doings 
she put down the sticks he held upon the fender, and felt for her handkerchief. She began to sob and talk quickly. "'I wouldn't mind nothing else half so much if he'd leave that child alone. But he goes talking to her. If I leave her a moment, he's talking to her, teaching her words and giving her ideas.' "'That's a bit thick,' said Mr. Polly. "'Thick!' cried the plump woman. "'It's horrible. And what am I to do? He's been here three times now, six days and a week and part of a week, and I pray to God night and day he may never come back again. Praying. Oh, back he's come, sure as fate. He takes my money and he takes my things. He won't let no man stay here to protect me or do the boats or work the ferry. The ferry's getting a scandal. They stand and shout and scream and use language. Oh, if I complain, they'll say I'm helpless to manage here. They'll take away my license, and out I shall go. And it's all the living I can get, and he knows it, and he plays on it, and he don't care. And here I am. I'd send the child away, but I got nowhere to send the child. I buys him off when it comes to that. And back he comes, worse than ever, prowling about and doing evil. And not a soul to help me, not a soul. I just hope there might be a day or two before he comes back again. I was just hoping. I am the sort that hopes. Mr. Polly was reflecting on the flaws and drawbacks that seemed to be inseparable from all the more agreeable things in life. Um, biggish sort of man, I expect," asked Mister Polly, trying to get the situation in all its bearings. But the plump woman did not heed him. She was going on with her fire making and retelling in disconnected fragments the fearfulness of Uncle Jim. There was always something a bit wrong with him," she said, "but nothing you might have hoped for." Not till they took him and carried him off and reformed him. He was cruel to the hens and chickens, it's true, and stuck a knife into another boy. But then I've seen him that nice to a cat. Nobody could have been kinder. I'm sure he didn't do no harm to that cat, what anybody ever tries to make out of it. I never listened to that. It was the reformatory that ruined him. They put him along of a lot of London boys, full of ideas of wickedness. And because he didn't mind pain, and he don't, I'll admit, try as I would, that made him think himself a hero. Them boys laughed at the teachers they set above them, laughed and mocked at them. And I don't suppose they was the best teachers in the world. I don't suppose, and I don't suppose anyone sensible does suppose, that any one who goes to be a teacher or a chaplain in a or a warder in a reformatory home goes and changes right away into an angel of grace from heaven and oh lord where was i uh, what did they send him to the reformatory for playing truant and stealing he stole right enough stole the money from an old woman and what was i to do when it came to the trial but say what i knew and him like a viper a-looking at me, more like a viper than a human boy. He leans on the bar and looks at me. All right, Aunt Flo, he says, just that and nothing more. Time after time I've dreamed of it, and now he's come. They've reformed me, he says, and made me a devil, and devil I mean to be to you. So out with it, he says. "'What did you give him last time?' asked Mr. Polly. Three golden pounds,' said the plump woman. "'That won't last very long,' he says. "'But there ain't no hurry. I'll be back in a week about. "'If I wasn't one of the hoping sort.' She left the sentence unfinished. Mr. Polly reflected. "'What sort of a size is he?' he asked. I'm not one of your Herculaneous sort, if you meant that. Uh, nothing very wonderful, biceptually. 
you will scoot said the plump woman with conviction rather than bitterness you'd better scoot now and i'll try and find some money for him to go away with when he comes it ain't reasonable to expect you to do anything but scoot but i suppose it's the way of a woman in trouble to try to get help from a man and hope i am the hoping sort how long's he been about asked mr polly ignoring his own outlook oh three months it is come the seventh since he come in by that back door and i ain't seen eyes on him for seven long years he stood in the door watching me and suddenly he let off a yelp like a dog and there he was grinning at the fright he'd given me good old auntie flo he says ain't you delighted to see me he says now i'm reformed the plump lady went to the sink and filled the kettle i never did like him she said standing at the sink and seeing him there with his teeth all black and broken perhaps i didn't give him much of a welcome at first not what would have been kind to him lord i said it's jim it's jim he said like a bad shilling like a damned bad shilling jim and trouble you all of you wanted me reformed and now you got me reformed i'm a reformatory reformed character warranted all right and turned out as such ain't you gonna ask me in auntie dear come in i said i won't have it said i wasn't ready to be kind to you he comes in and shuts the door down he sits in that chair i come to torment you he says you old something and begins at me no human being could have ever been called such things before it made me cry out and now he says just to show i ain't afraid of hurting you he says and ups and twists my wrist mr polly gasped i could stand even his violence said the plump woman if it wasn't for the child mr polly went to the kitchen window and surveyed his namesake who was away up the garden path with her hands behind her back and wisps of black hair in disorder about her little face thinking profoundly about ducklings you two oughtn't be left he said the plump woman stared at his back with hard hope in her eyes i don't see that it's my affair said mr polly the plump woman resumed her business with the kettle i'd like to have a look at him before i go said mr polly thinking aloud and added somehow not my business of course lord he cried with a start at a noise in the bar who's that only a customer said the plump woman Mr. Polly made no rash promises, and thought a great deal. "'It seems a good sort of crib,' he said, and added, "'for a chap who's looking for trouble.' But he stayed on and did various things out of the list I have already given, and worked the ferry, and it was four days before he saw anything of Uncle Jim." and so resistant is the human mind to things not yet experienced that he could easily have believed in that time that there was no such person in the world as uncle jim the plump woman after her one outbreak of confidence ignored the subject and little polly seemed to have exhausted her impressions in her first communication and engaged her mind now with a simple directness in the study and subjugation of the new human being heaven had sent into her world the first unfavourable impression of his punting was soon effaced he could nickname ducklings very amusingly create boats out of wooden splinters and stalk and fly from imaginary tigers in the orchard with a convincing earnestness that was surely beyond the power of any other human being she conceded at last that he should be called mr polly in honour of her miss polly even as he desired 
Uncle Jim turned up in the twilight. Uncle Jim appeared with none of the disruptive violence Mr. Polly had dreaded. He came quite softly. Mr. Polly was going down the lane behind the church that led to the Potwell Inn after posting a letter to the lime-juice people at the post-office. He was walking slowly after his habit and thinking discursively. With a sudden tightening of the muscles he became aware of a figure walking noiselessly beside him. His first impression was of a face singularly broad above and with a wide empty grin as its chief feature below, of a slouching body and dragging feet. "'Arf a mo,' said the figure, as if in response to his start, and speaking in a hoarse whisper, "'Arf a mo, mister. You the new bloke at the Potwell Inn?' Mr. Polly felt evasive. Uh, "'Suppose I am,' he replied hoarsely and quickened his pace. "'Arf a mo,' said Uncle Jim, taking his arm. "'We ain't doing a sanguinary marathon. It ain't a decorated cinder track. I want a word with you, mister. See?' Mr. Polly wriggled his arm free and stopped. "'What is it?' he asked, and faced the terror. I just want a decorated word with you, see? Just a friendly word or two, just to clear up any blooming errors. That's all I want. No need to be so, richly decorated, proud. If you are the new bloke at Potwell Inn, not a bit of it, see? Uncle Jim was certainly not a handsome person. He was short, shorter than Mr. Polly, with long arms and lean big hands, a thin and wiry neck stuck out of his grey flannel shirt, and supported a big head that had something of the snake in the convergent lines of its broad knotty brow, meanly proportioned face, and pointed chin. His almost toothless mouth seemed a cavern in the twilight. Some accident had left him with one small and active, and one large and expressionless reddish eye, and wisps of straight hair strayed from under the blue cricket cap he wore pulled down obliquely over the latter. He spat between his teeth, and wiped his mouth untidily with the soft side of his fist. "'You got to blurry well shift,' he said. "'See?' Er, shift, said Mr. Polly. How? Cause the Potwell Inn's my beat. See? Mr. Polly had never felt less witty. How's it your beat? he asked. Uncle Jim thrust his face forward and shook his open hand, bent like a claw under Mr. Polly's nose. Not your blooming business, he said. You got to shift. Suppose I don't, said Mr. Polly. You got to shift. The tone of Uncle Jim's voice became urgent and confidential. You don't know who you're up against, he said. It's a kindness I'm doing to warn you, see? I'm just one of these blokes who don't stick at things, see? I don't stick at nothing. Mr. Polly's manner became detached and confidential, as though the matter and the speaker interested him greatly, but didn't concern him overmuch. What do you think you'll do? he asked. If you don't clear out? Yes. Gaw, said Uncle Jim. You better. Here. He gripped Mr. Polly's wrist with a grip of steel, and in an instant Mr. Polly understood the relative quality of their muscles. He breathed an uninspiring breath into Mr. Polly's face. "'What won't I do?' he said, "'once I start in on you.' 
He paused, and the night about them seemed to be listening. "'I'll make a mess of you,' he said in his hoarse whisper. "'I'll do you injuries. I'll hurt you. I'll kick you ugly, see? I'll hurt you in horrible ways, horrible ugly ways.' He scrutinised Mr. Polly's face. "'You'll cry,' he said, "'to see yourself. See? Cry you will.' "'You've got no right,' began Mr. Polly. "'Right?' His note was fierce. "'Ain't the old woman me aunt?' He spoke still closer. "'I'll make a gory mess of you. I'll cut bits all for you.' He receded a little. "'I've got no quarrel with you,' he said. "'It's too late to go to-night,' said Mr. Polly. "'I'll be round to-morrow, about eleven, see? And if I find you—' He produced a blood-curdling oath. "'Hum,' said Mr. Polly, trying to keep things light. Uh, "'We'll consider your suggestions.' "'You better,' said Uncle Jim and suddenly, noiselessly, was going. His whispering voice sank until Mr. Polly could hear only the dim fragments of sentences. "'Horrible things to you, horrible things. Kick you ugly, kick your liver out, spread it all about, I will. Out in dues. See, I don't care a dead rat one way or the other.' and with a curious twisting gesture of the arm uncle jim receded until his face was a still dim thing that watched and the black shadows of the hedge seemed to have swallowed up his body altogether end of section two chapter nine section three of the history of mr polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter 9, Section 3 Next morning, about half-past ten, Mr. Polly found himself seated under a clump of fir-trees by the roadside, and about three miles and a half from the Potwell Inn. He was by no means sure whether he was taking a walk to clear his mind, or leaving that threat-marred paradise for good and all. His reason pointed a lean, unhesitating finger along the latter course. After all, the thing was not his quarrel. That agreeable, plump woman, agreeable, motherly, comfortable as she might be, wasn't his affair. That child with the mop of black hair, who combined so magically the charm of mouse and butterfly and flitting bird, who was daintier than a flower and softer than a peach, was no concern of his. Good heavens! What were they to him? Nothing. Uncle Jim, of course, had a claim. A sort of claim. If it came to duty and chucking up this attractive, indolent, observant, humorous, tramping life, there were those who had a right to him, a legitimate right, a prior claim on his protection and chivalry. Why not listen to the call of duty and go back to Miriam now? He had had a very agreeable holiday. And while Mr. Polly sat thinking these things as well as he could, he knew that if only he dared to look up, the heavens had opened, and a clear judgment on his case was written across the sky. He knew, he knew now as much as a man can know of life, he knew he had to fight or perish. Life had never been so clear to him before. It had always been a confused, entertaining spectacle. He had responded to this impulse and that, seeking agreeable and entertaining things, evading difficult and painful things. Such is the way of those who grow up to a life that has neither danger nor honour in its texture. 
He had been muddled and wrapped about and entangled like a creature born in the jungle who has never seen sea or sky. Now he had come out of it, suddenly, into a great exposed place. It was as if God and heaven waited over him, and all the earth was expectation. "'Not my business,' said Mr. Polly, speaking aloud. "'Where the devil do I come in?' And again, with something between a whine and a snarl in his voice, "'Not my blasted business.' His mind seemed to have divided itself into several compartments, each with its own particular discussion, busily in progress, and quite regardless of the others. One was busy with the detailed interpretation of the phrase, "'Kick you ugly!' There's a sort of French wrestling in which you use and guard against feet. Watch the man's eye, and as his foot comes up, grip! and over he goes, at your mercy, if you use the advantage right. But how do you use the advantage rightly? When he thought of Uncle Jim, the inside feeling of his body faded away rapidly into blank discomfort. Old Cadger! She hadn't no business to drag me into her quarrels. Ought to go to the police and ask for help dragging me into a quarrel that don't concern me. Wish I've never set eyes on the rotten inn. The reality of the case arched over him like the vault of the sky, as plain as the sweet blue heavens above and the wide spread of hill and valley about him. Man comes into life to seek and find his sufficient beauty, to serve it, to win and increase it to fight for it, to face anything and dare anything for it, counting death as nothing so long as the dying eyes still turn to it, and fear and dullness and indolence and appetite, which indeed are no more than fear's three crippled brothers who make ambushes and creep by night, are against him, to delay him, to hold him off, to hamper and beguile and kill him in that quest. He had but to lift his eyes to see all that, as much a part of his world as the driving clouds and the bending grass. But he had kept himself downcast, a grumbling, inglorious, dirty, fattish little tramp, full of dreads and quivering excuses. "'Why the hell was I ever born?' he said, with the truth almost winning him. What do you do when a dirty man who smells gets you down and under in the dust and dirt with a knee below your diaphragm and a large hairy hand squeezing your windpipe tighter and tighter in a quarrel that isn't, properly speaking, yours? If I had a chance against him, protested Mr. Polly. It's no good, you see, said Mr. Polly. He stood up as though his decision was made, and was, for an instant, still struck by doubt. There lay the road before him, going this way to the east, and that to the west. Westward, one hour away now, was the Potwell Inn. Already things might be happening there. Eastward was the wise man's course, a road dipping between hedges to a hop-garden and a wood, and presently no doubt reaching an inn, a picturesque church, perhaps, a village and fresh company, the wise man's course. Mr. Polly saw himself going along it, and tried to see himself going along it with all the self-applause a wise man feels, but somehow it wouldn't come like that. The wise man fell short of happiness for all his wisdom. The wise man had a paunch and round shoulders, and red ears, and excuses. It was a pleasant road, and why the wise man should not go along it, merry and singing, full of summer happiness, was a miracle to Mr. Polly's mind. But confound it! The fact remained, the figure went slinking—slinking was the only word for it 
and would not go otherwise than slinking. He turned his eyes westward, as if for an explanation. And if the figure was no longer ignoble, the prospect was appalling. "'One kick in the stomach would settle a chap like me,' said Mr. Polly. "'Oh, God!' cried Mr. Polly, and lifted his eyes to heaven, and said for the last time in that struggle, "'It isn't my affair!' And, so saying, he turned his face towards the Potwell Inn. He went back, neither halting nor hastening in his pace after this last decision, but with a mind feverishly busy. "'If I get killed, I get killed. And if he gets killed, I get hung. Don't seem just, somehow. Don't suppose I shall just frighten him off.' <laughs> The private war between Mr. Polly and Uncle Jim for the possession of the Potwell Inn fell naturally into three chief campaigns. There was, first of all, the great campaign, which ended in the triumphant eviction of Uncle Jim from the inn premises. Then came next, after a brief interval, the futile invasions of the premises by Uncle Jim, that culminated in the Battle of the Dead Eel, and, after some months of involuntary truce, there was the last supreme conflict of the night's surprise. Each of these campaigns merits a section to itself. Mr. Polly entered the inn discreetly. He found the plump woman seated in her bar, her eyes astare, her face white and wet with tears. "'Oh, God!' she was saying over and over again. Oh, God! The air was full of a spiritous reek, and on the sanded boards in front of the bar were the fragments of a broken bottle and an overturned glass. She turned her despair at the sound of his entry, and despair gave place to astonishment. You come back, she said. Rather, said Mr. Polly. He's mad drunk and looking for her. Where is she? Locked upstairs. Haven't you sent to the police? No one to send. I'll see to it, said Mr. Polly. Out this way? She nodded. He went to the crinkly paned window and peered out. Uncle Jim was coming down the garden path towards the house, his hands in his pockets, singing hoarsely. Mr. Polly remembered afterwards with pride and amazement that he felt neither faint nor rigid. He glanced round him, seized a bottle of beer by the neck as an improvised club, and went out by the garden door. Uncle Jim stopped, amazed. His brain did not instantly rise to the new posture of things. You, he cried, and stopped for a moment. You, scoot! Your job, said Mr. Polly and advanced some paces. Uncle Jim stood swaying with wrathful astonishment, and then darted forward with clutching hands. Mr. Polly felt that if his antagonist closed, he was lost, and smoked with all his force at the ugly head before him. Smash went the bottle, and Uncle Jim staggered, half stunned by the blow, and blinded with beer. The lapses and leaps of the human mind are forever mysterious. Mr. Polly had never expected that bottle to break. In the instant he felt disarmed and helpless. Before him was Uncle Jim, infuriated and evidently still coming on, and for defence was nothing but the neck of a bottle. For a time our Mr. Polly has figured heroic. Now comes the fall again. He sounded abject terror. He dropped that ineffectual scrap of glass, and turned and fled round the corner of the house. "'Bottles!' came the thick voice of the enemy behind him, as one who accepts a challenge, and bleeding but indomitable, Uncle Jim entered the house. "'Bottles!' he said, surveying the bar, fighting with bottles. I'll show him fighting with bottles. 
Uncle Jim had learned all about fighting with bottles in the reformatory home. Regardless of his terror-stricken aunt, he ranged among the bottled beers, and succeeded after one or two failures in preparing two bottles to his satisfaction by knocking off the bottoms and gripping them dagger-wise by the necks. So prepared, he went forth again to destroy Mr. Polly. Mr. Polly, freed from the sense of urgent pursuit, had halted behind the raspberry canes and rallied his courage. The sense of Uncle Jim victorious in the house restored his manhood. He went round by the outhouses to the riverside, seeking a weapon, and found an old paddle-boat hook. With this he smote Uncle Jim as he emerged by the door of the tap. Uncle Jim, blaspheming dreadfully, and with dire stabbing intimations in either hand, came through the splintering paddle like a circus rider through a paper hoop, and once more Mr. Polly dropped his weapon and fled. A careless observer, watching him sprint round and round the inn in front of the lumbering and reproachful pursuit of Uncle Jim, might have formed an altogether erroneous estimate of the issue of the campaign. Certain compensating qualities of the very greatest military value were appearing in Mr. Polly even as he ran. If Uncle Jim had strength and brute courage, and the rich, toughening experience a reformatory home affords, Mr. Polly was nevertheless sober, more mobile, and with a mind now stimulated to an almost incredible nimbleness, so that he had not only gained on Uncle Jim, but thought what use he might make of his advantage. The word strategious flamed red across the tumult of his mind. As he came round the house for the third time, he darted suddenly into the yard, swung the door to behind himself, and bolted it seized the zinc pig's pail that stood by the entrance to the kitchen, and had it neatly and resolutely over Uncle Jim's head, as he came belatedly round the outhouse on the other side. One of the splintered bottles jabbed Mr. Polly's ear, at the time it seemed of no importance, and then Uncle Jim was down and writhing dangerously and noisily upon the yard tiles, with his head still in the pig pail, and his bottles gone to splinters and Mr. Polly was fastening the kitchen door against him. Phew! Can't go on like this for ever, said Mr. Polly, whooping for breath, and selecting a weapon from among the brooms that stood behind the kitchen door. Uncle Jim was losing his head. He was up and kicking the door, and bellowing unamiable proposals and invitations, so that a strategist emerging silently by the tap-door could locate him without difficulty, steal upon him unawares, and— But before that felling blow could be delivered, Uncle Jim's ear had caught a footfall, and he turned. Mr. Polly quailed, and lowered his broom, a fatal hesitation. "'Now I've got you!' cried Uncle Jim, dancing forward in a disconcerting zigzag. He rushed to close and Mr. Polly stopped him neatly, as if it were a miracle, with the head of the broom across his chest. Uncle Jim seized the broom with both hands. "'Let go,' he said, and tugged. Mr. Polly shook his head, tugged, and showed pale, compressed lips. Both tugged. Then Uncle Jim tried to get round the end of the broom. Mr. Polly circled away. They began to circle about one another, both tugging hard, both intensely watching for the slightest initiative on the part of the other. Mr. Polly wished brooms were longer, twelve or thirteen feet, for example. Uncle Jim was clearly for shortness in brooms. He wasted breath in saying what was to happen shortly, sanguinary, oriental soul-blenching things, when the broom no longer separated them. Mr. Polly thought he had never seen an uglier person. Suddenly Uncle Jim flashed into violent activity, but alcohol slows movement, and Mr. Polly was equal to him. Then Uncle Jim tried jerks, 
and for a terrible instant seemed to have the broom out of Mr. Polly's hands. But Mr. Polly recovered it with the clutch of a drowning man. Then Uncle Jim drove suddenly at Mr. Polly's midriff, but again Mr. Polly was ready and swept him round in a circle. Then suddenly a wild hope filled Mr. Polly. He saw the river was very near, the post to which the punt was tied not three yards away. With a wild yell he sent the broom home into his antagonist's ribs. "'Bush!' he cried, as the resistance gave. "'Oh, goo!' said Uncle Jim, going backwards helplessly. And Mr. Polly thrust hard and abandoned the broom to the enemy's despairing clutch. Splash! Uncle Jim was in the water, and Mr. Polly had leapt like a cat aboard the ferry punt and grasped the pole. Up came Uncle Jim, spluttering and dripping. You! Unprofitable matter, and printing it would lead to a censorship of novels. You know I got a weak chest. The pole took him in the throat and drove him backward and downwards. "'Let go!' cried Uncle Jim, staggering and with real terror in his once awful eyes. Splash! Down he fell backwards into a frothing mass of water, with Mr. Polly jabbing at him. Under water he turned round and came up again, as if in flight, towards the middle of the river. Directly his head reappeared, Mr. Polly had him between the shoulders and under again, bubbling thickly. A hand clutched and disappeared. It was stupendous. Mr. Polly had discovered the heel of Achilles. Uncle Jim had no stomach for cold water. The broom floated away, pitching gently on the swell. Mr. Polly infuriated with victory, thrust Uncle Jim under again, and drove the punt round on its chain in such a manner that when Uncle Jim came up for the fourth time, and now he was nearly out of his depth, too buoyed up to walk, and apparently nearly helpless, Mr. Polly, fortunately for them both, could not reach him. Uncle Jim made the clumsy gestures of those who struggle insecurely in the water. "'Keep out!' said Mr. Polly. Uncle Jim, with a great effort, got a footing, emerged until his armpits were out of the water, until his waistcoat buttons showed, one by one, till scarcely two remained, and made for the camp-sheeting. "'Keep out!' cried Mr. Polly, and leapt off the punt and followed the movement of his victim along the shore. "'I tell you I've got a weak chest!' said Uncle Jim, moistly. "'This ain't fair fighting,' said Uncle Jim, almost weeping, and all his terrors had gone. "'Keep out!' said Mr. Polly, with an accurately poised pole. "'I tell you, I've got to land, you fool,' said Uncle Jim, with a sort of despairing wrathfulness, and began moving downstream. "'You keep out!' said Mr. Polly, in parallel movement. Don't you ever land on this place again. Slowly, argumentatively, and reluctantly, Uncle Jim waded downstream. He tried threats, he tried persuasion. He even tried a belated note of pathos. Mr. Polly remained inexorable, if in secret a little perplexed as to the outcome of the situation. "'This cold's getting to my marrow,' said Uncle Jim. "'You want cooling. You keep out in it,' said Mr. Polly. They came round the bend into sight of Nicholson's Eight, where the backwater runs down to the Potwell Mill, and there, after much parley and several feints, Uncle Jim made a desperate effort and struggled into clutch of the overhanging osiers on the island and so got out of the water, with the mill-stream between them. He emerged dripping and muddy, and vindictive. "'By gore,' he said, "'I'll skin you for this.' 
"'You keep out or I'll do worse for you,' said Mr. Polly. The spirit was out of Uncle Jim for the time, and he turned away to struggle through the osiers towards the mill, leaving a shining trail of water among the green-grey stems. Mr. Polly returned slowly and thoughtfully to the inn, and suddenly his mind began to bubble with phrases. The plump woman stood at the top of the steps that led up to the inn door to greet him. "'Law!' she cried as he drew near. "'Hasn't he killed you?' "'Do I look like it?' said Mr. Polly. "'But where's Jim?' "'Gone off. He was mad, drunk, and dangerous. I put him in the river. That toned down his alkalacious frenzy. I gave him a bit of a doing altogether. Hasn't he hurt you? Not a bit of it. Then what's all that blood beside your ear? Mr. Polly felt. Quite a cut. Funny how one overlooks things. Heated moments. He must have done that when he jabbed about with those bottles. Hello, Kitty. You venturing downstairs again? Ain't he killed you? asked the little girl. "'Well, I wish I'd seen more of the fighting.' "'Didn't you?' "'All I saw was you running round the house and Uncle Jim after you.' There was a little pause. "'I was leading him on,' said Mr. Polly. "'Someone's shouting at the ferry,' she said. right o. But you won't see any more of Uncle Jim for a bit. We've been having a bit of a conversazione about that.' "'I believe it is Uncle Jim.' said the little girl. Then he can wait. He turned round and listened for the words that drifted across from the little figure on the opposite bank. So far as he could judge, Uncle Jim was making an appointment for the morrow. He replied with a defiant movement of the punt-pole. The little figure was convulsed for a moment, and then went on its way upstream, fiercely. So it was that the first campaign ended in an insecure victory. End of section three. Chapter nine, section four of the history of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter nine, section four. The next day was Wednesday, and a slack day for the Potwell Inn. It was a hot, close day, full of the murmuring of bees. One or two people crossed by the ferry. An elaborately equipped fisherman stopped for cold meat and dry ginger ale in the bar parlour. Some haymakers came and drank beer for an hour, and afterwards sent jugs and jars by a boy to be replenished. That was all. Mr. Polly had risen early and was busy about the place meditating upon the probable tactics of Uncle Jim. He was no longer strung up to the desperate pitch of the first encounter, but he was grave and anxious. Uncle Jim had shrunken, as all antagonists that are boldly faced shrink, after the first battle, to the negotiable the vulnerable. Formidable he was, no doubt, but not invincible. He had, under Providence, been defeated once, and he might be defeated altogether. Mr. Polly went about the place considering the militant possibilities of pacific things. Pokers, copper sticks, garden implements, kitchen knives, garden nets, barbed wire, oars, clothes-lines, blankets, pewter-pots, stockings, and broken bottles. He prepared a club with a stocking and a bottle inside, upon the best East End model. He swung it round his head once, broke an outhouse window with a flying fragment of glass, and ruined the stocking beyond all darning. He developed a subtle scheme with the cellar flap as a sort of pitfall, but he rejected it finally because a. it might entrap the plump woman, and b. 
he had no use whatsoever for Uncle Jim in the cellar. He determined to wire the garden that evening, burglar fashion, against the possibilities of night attack. Towards two o'clock in the afternoon three young men arrived in a capacious boat from the direction of Lamham, and asked permission to camp in the paddock. It was given all the more readily by Mr. Polly because he perceived in their proximity a possible check upon the self-expression of Uncle Jim. But he did not foresee, and no one could have foreseen, that Uncle Jim, stealing unawares upon the Potwell Inn in the late afternoon, armed with a large rough-hewn stake, should have mistaken the bending form of one of those campers, who was pulling a few onions by permission in the garden, for Mr. Polly, and crept upon it swiftly and silently, and smitten its wide invitation unforgettably and unforgivably. It was an error impossible to explain. The resounding whack went up to heaven, the cry of amazement, and Mr. Polly emerged from the inn, armed with the frying-pan he was cleaning, to take his reckless assailant in the rear. Uncle Jim, realising his error, fled blaspheming into the arms of the other two campers, who were returning from the village with butcher's meat and groceries. They caught him. They smacked his face with steak, and punched him with a bursting parcel of lump sugar. They held him, though he bit them, and their idea of punishment was to duck him. They were hilarious, strong, young stockbrokers' clerks, territorials and seasoned boating men. They ducked him as though it was romping, and all that Mr. Polly had to do was to pick up lumps of sugar for them, and wipe them on his sleeve, and put them on a plate, and explain that Uncle Jim was a notorious bad character, and not quite right in the head got a regular obsession that the missus is his aunt," said Mr. Polly, expanding it. "'Perfect nuisance he is.' But he caught a glance of Uncle Jim's eye as he receded before the camper's urgency that boded ill for him, and in the night he had a disagreeable idea that perhaps his luck might not hold for the third occasion. That came soon enough so soon indeed as the campus had gone. Thursday was the early closing day at Lamham, and next to Sunday the busiest part of the week at the Potwell Inn. Sometimes as many as six boats all at once would be moored against the ferry punt and hiring rowboats. People could either have a complete tea, a complete tea with jam, cake, and eggs, a kettle of boiling water, and find the rest, or refreshments a la carte, as they chose. They sat about, but usually the boiling waterers had a delicacy about using the tables, and grouped themselves humbly on the ground. The complete tiers with jam and eggs got the best tablecloth on the table nearest the steps that led up to the glass-panelled door. The groups about the lawn were very satisfying to Mr. Polly's sense of amenity. To the right were the complete tiers with everything heart could desire, then a small group of three young men in remarkable green and violet and pale blue shirts, and two girls in mauve and yellow blouses, with common teas and gooseberry jam, at the green clothless table. Then, on the grass, down by the pollarded willow, a small family of hot waterers with a hamper, a little troubled by wasps in their jam, from the nest in the tree, and all in mourning, but happy otherwise. And on the lawn to the right, a ginger-beer lot of apprentices without their collars, and very jocular and happy. The young people in the rainbow shirts and blouses formed the centre of interest. They were under the leadership of a gold-spectacled senior with a fluting voice and an air of mystery. He ordered everything, and showed a particular knowledge of the qualities of the Potwell jams, preferring gooseberry with much insistence. 
Mr. Polly watched him, christened him the Benifulous Influence, glanced at the prentices, and went inside and down into the cellar in order to replenish the stock of stone ginger beer which the plump woman had allowed to run low during the preoccupations of the campaign. It was in the cellar that he first became aware of the return of Uncle Jim. He became aware of him as a voice, a voice not only hoarse but thick, as voices thicken under the influence of alcohol. "'Where's that muddy-faced mongrel?' cried Uncle Jim. "'Let him come out to me. Where's that blighted wisp with the punch pole? I got a word to say to him. Come out of it, you pot-bellied chunk of dirtiness, you. Come out and have your ugly face wiped. I got a thing for you. Hear me? He's hiding. That's what he's doing, said the voice of Uncle Jim, dropping for a moment to sorrow and then with a great increment of wrathfulness come out of my nest you blinking cuckoo you or i'll cut your silly insides out come out of it you pock-marked rat still in another man's home away from him come out and look me in the face you squinting son of a skunk Mr. Polly took the ginger beer and went thoughtfully upstairs to the bar. "'He's back,' said the plump woman, as he appeared. "'I knew he'd come back.' "'I heard him,' said Mr. Polly, and looked about. "'Just give me the old poker handle that's under the beer engine.' The door opened softly, and Mr. Polly turned quickly but it was only the pointed nose and intelligent face of the young man with the gilt spectacles and discreet manner. He coughed, and the spectacles fixed Mr. Polly. "'I say,' he said with quiet earnestness, "'there's a chap out here seems to want someone.' "'Why don't he come in?' said Mr. Polly. "'He seems to want you out there.' "'What's he want?' "'I think—' said the spectacled young man, after a thoughtful moment. "'He appears to have brought you a present of fish. "'Isn't he shouting? "'He is a little boisterous. "'He'd better come in.' The manner of the spectacled young man intensified. "'Ah, I wish you'd come out and persuade him to go away,' he said. "'His language isn't quite the thing. Mm, "'Ladies!' "'It never was,' said the plump woman, her voice charged with sorrow. Mr. Polly moved towards the door and stood with his hand on the handle. The gold-spectacled face disappeared. "'Now, my man,' came his voice from outside, "'be careful what you're saying.' "'Who in all the world and hereafter are you to call me my man?' cried Uncle Jim, in the voice of one astonished and pained beyond endurance, and added scornfully, "'You gold-eyed geezer, you!' "'Tut-tut,' said the gentleman in gilt glasses, "'with strain yourself!' Mr. Polly emerged, poker in hand, just in time to see what followed. Uncle Jim, in his shirt-sleeves, and a state of ferocious décolletage, was holding something—yes, a, a dead eel—by means of a piece of newspaper about its tail, holding it down and back, and a little sideways, in such a way as to smite it upwards and hard. It struck the spectacled gentleman under the jaw with a peculiar dead thud, and a cry of horror came from the two seated parties at the sight. One of the girls shrieked piercingly. Horace! And everyone sprang up. The sense of helping numbers came to Mr. Polly's aid. Drop it! he cried, and came down the steps, waving his poker, and thrusting the spectacled gentleman before him 
as once heroes were wont to wield the ox-hide shield. Uncle Jim gave ground suddenly, and trod upon the foot of a young man in a blue shirt, who immediately thrust at him violently with both hands. "'Let go!' howled Uncle Jim. "'That's the chap I'm looking for!' and pressing the head of the spectacled gentleman aside, smote hard at Mr. Polly. But at the sight of this indignity inflicted upon the spectacled gentleman, a woman's heart was stirred, and a pink parasol drove hard and true at Uncle Jim's wiry neck, and at the same moment the young man in the blue shirt sought to collar him, and lost his grip again. "'Suffragettes!' gasped Uncle Jim, with the ferule at his throat, everywhere, and aimed a second, more successful blow at Mr. Polly. "'Wow!' said Mr. Polly. But now the jam and egg party was joining in the fray. A stout, yet still fairly able-bodied gentleman in black and white checks inquired, "'What's the fellow up to? Ain't there no police here?' and it was evident that once more public opinion was rallying to the support of Mr. Polly. "'Oh, come on, then, all the lot of you!' cried Uncle Jim, and backing dexterously, whirled the eel round in a destructive circle. The pink sunshade was torn from the hand that gripped it, and whirled athwart the complete but unadorned tea-things on the green table. "'Collar him!' "'Someone get hold of his collar!' cried the gold-spectacled gentleman, coming out of the scrimmage, retreating up the steps to the inn door, as if to rally his forces. "'Stand clear, you blessed mantle ornaments!' cried Uncle Jim. "'Stand clear!' and retired backing, staving off attack by means of the whirling eel. Mr. Polly, undeterred by a sense of grave damage done to his nose, pressed the attack in front. The two young men in violet and blue skirmished on Uncle Jim's flanks. The man in black and white checks sought still further outflanking possibilities, and two of the apprentice boys ran for oars. The gold-spectacled gentleman, as if inspired, came down the wooden steps again, seized the tablecloth of the jam and egg party, lugged it from under the crockery with inadequate precautions against breakage, and advanced with compressed lips, curious lateral crouching movements, swift flashings of his glasses, and a general suggestion of bullfighting in his pose and gestures. Uncle Jim was kept busy, and unable to plan his retreat with any strategic soundness. He was, moreover, manifestly a little nervous about the river in his rear. He gave ground in a curve, and so came right across the rapidly abandoned camp of the family in mourning, crunching a teacup under his heel, oversetting the teapot, and finally tripping backwards over the hamper. The eel flew out at a tangent from his hand, and became a mere looping relic on the sward. "'Hold him!' cried the gentleman in spectacles, "'Collar him!' and, moving forward with extraordinary promptitude, wrapped the best tablecloth around Uncle Jim's arms and head. Mr. Polly grasped his purpose instantly. The man in checks was scarcely slower, and in another moment Uncle Jim was no more than a bundle of smothered blasphemy and a pair of wildly active legs. "'Duck him!' panted Mr. Polly, holding on to the earthquake. "'Best thing, duck him!' The bundle was convulsed by paroxysms of anger and protest. One boot got to the hamper, and sent it ten yards. "'Go into the house for a quo's line, someone,' said the gentleman in gold spectacles. "'He'll get out of this in a moment.' One of the apprentices ran. "'Bird nets in the garden!' shouted Mr. Polly in the garden. The apprentice was divided in his purpose, and then, suddenly, Uncle Jim collapsed and became a limp, dead-seeming thing under their hands. His arms were drawn inward, his legs bent up under his person, and so he lay. 
fainted said the man in checks relaxing his grip a fit perhaps said the man in spectacles keep hold said mr polly too late for suddenly uncle jim's arms and legs flew out like springs released mr polly was tumbled backwards and fell over the broken teapot and into the arms of the father in mourning something struck his head dazzlingly in another second uncle jim was on his feet and the tablecloth enshrouded the head of the man in checks uncle jim manifestly considered he had done all that honour required of him and against overwhelming numbers and the possibility of reiterated duckings flight is no disgrace uncle jim fled mr polly sat up after an interval of an indeterminate length among the ruins of an idyllic afternoon quite a lot of things seemed scattered and broken but it was difficult to grasp it all at once he stared between the legs of people he became aware of a voice speaking slowly and complainingly somewhere ought to pay for those tea things said the father in mourning we didn't bring em here to be danced on not by no manner of means there followed an anxious peace for three days and then a rough man in a blue jersey in the intervals of trying to choke himself with bread and cheese and pickled onions broke out abruptly into information jim's been lagged again missus he said what said the landlady our jim your jim said the man and after an absolutely necessary pause for swallowing added stealing a hatchet he did not speak for some moments and then he replied to mr polly's inquiries yes a hatchet down lamham way night before last what he steal a hatchet for asked the plump woman he said he wanted a hatchet i wonder what he wanted a hatchet for said mr polly thoughtfully oh, i dare say he had a use for it said the gentleman in the blue jersey and he took a mouthful that amounted to conversational suicide there was a prolonged pause in the little bar and mr polly did some rapid thinking he went to the window and whistled i shall stick it he whispered at last hatchets or no hatchets he turned to the man with the blue jersey when he thought him clear for speech again how much did you say they'd given him he asked three months said the man in the blue jersey and refilled anxiously as if alarmed at the momentary clearness of his voice those three months passed all too quickly months of sunshine and warmth of varied novel exertion in the open air of congenial experiences of interest and wholesome food and successful digestion months that browned mr polly and hardened him and saw the beginnings of his beard months marred only by one anxiety an anxiety mr polly did his utmost to suppress the day of reckoning was never mentioned it is true by either the plump woman or himself but the name of uncle jim was written in letters of glaring silence across their intercourse as the term of that respite drew to an end his anxiety increased until at last it even trenched upon his well-earned sleep he had some idea of buying a revolver at last he compromised upon a small and very foul and dirty rook rifle which he purchased in lamham under the pretext of bird scaring and loaded and carefully concealed under his bed from the plump woman's eye september passed away october came and at last came that night in october whose happenings it is so difficult for a sympathetic historian to drag out of their proper nocturnal indistinctiveness into the clear hard light of positive statement a novelist should present characters not uh, vivisect them publicly 
the best, the kindliest, if not the justest course, is surely to leave untold such things as Mr. Polly would manifestly have preferred untold. Mr. Polly had declared that, when the cyclist discovered him, he was seeking a weapon that should make a conclusive end to Uncle Jim. That declaration is placed before the reader without comment. The gun was certainly in possession of Uncle Jim at that time, and no human being but Mr. Polly knows how he got hold of it. The cyclist was a literary man named Warspite, who suffered from insomnia. He had risen and come out of his house near Lamham just before the dawn, and he discovered Mr. Polly partly concealed in the ditch by the Potwell churchyard wall. It is an ordinary dry ditch, full of nettles and overgrown with elder and dog-rose, and in no way suggestive of an arsenal. It is the last place in which you would look for a gun, and he says that when he dismounted to see why Mr. Polly was allowing only the uh, latter part of his person to show, and that it would seem by inadvertency, Mr. Polly merely raised his head and advised him to look out, and added, he's let fly at me twice already. He came out under persuasion, and with gestures of extreme caution. He was wearing a white cotton nightgown, of the type that has now been so extensively superseded by pyjama sleeping suits, and his legs and feet were bare, and much scratched and torn, and very muddy. Mr. Warspite takes that exceptionally lively interest in his fellow-creatures which constitutes so much of the distinctiveness and complex charm of your novelist all the world over, and he at once involved himself generously in the case. The two men returned at Mr. Polly's initiative across the churchyard to the Potwell Inn, and came upon the burst and damaged rook-rifle near the new monument to Sir Samuel Harpon, upon the corner by the yew. "'That must have been his third go,' said Mr. Polly. "'It sounded a bit funny.' The sight inspirited him greatly, and he explained further that he had fled to the churchyard on account of the cover afforded by the tombstones from the flight of small shot. He expressed anxiety for the fate of the landlady of the Potwell Inn and her grandchild, and led the way with enhanced alacrity along the lane to that establishment. They found the doors of the house standing open, the bar in some disorder, several bottles of whisky were afterwards found to be missing, and Blake, the village policeman, rapping patiently at the open door. He entered with them. The glass at the bar had suffered severely, and one of the mirrors was starred from a blow from a pewter pot. The till had been forced and ransacked, and so had the bureau in the minute room behind the bar. An upper window was opened, and the voice of the landlady became audible, making inquiries. They went out and parlayed with her. She had locked herself upstairs with the little girl, she said, and refused to descend until she was assured that neither Uncle Jim nor Mr. Polly's gun were anywhere on the premises. Mr. Blake and Mr. Warspite proceeded to satisfy themselves with regard to the former condition, and Mr. Polly went to his room in search of garments more suited to the brightening dawn. He returned immediately with a request that Mr. Blake and Mr. Warspite would just come and look. They found his apartment in a state of extraordinary confusion, the bedclothes in a ball in the corner, the drawers all open and ransacked, the chair broken, the lock of the door forced and broken, one door panel slightly scorched and perforated by shot, and the window wide open. None of Mr. Polly's clothes were to be seen, but some garments which had apparently once formed part of a stoker's workaday outfit, two brownish-yellow halves of a shirt, and an unsound pair of boots, were scattered on the floor. A faint smell of gunpowder still hung in the air, and two or three books Mr. Polly had recently acquired 
had been shied with some violence under the bed. Mr. Warspite looked at Mr. Blake, and then both men looked at Mr. Polly. "'That's his boots,' said Mr. Polly. Mr. Blake turned his eye to the window. "'Some of these tiles have just got broken,' he observed. "'I got out of the window and slid down the scullery tiles,' Mr. Polly answered, omitting much, they both felt, from his explanation. "'Well, we better find him and have a word with him,' said Blake. "'That's about my business now.' But Uncle Jim had gone altogether. He did not return for some days. That, perhaps, was not very wonderful. But the days lengthened to weeks, and the weeks to months, and still Uncle Jim did not reoccur. A year passed, and the anxiety of him became less acute. A second healing year followed the first. One afternoon, about thirty months after the night's surprise, the plump woman spoke of him. "'I wonder what's become of Jim,' she said. "'I wonder sometimes,' said Mr. Polly. End of chapter 9「Ten, the last chapter of the History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, Miriam Revisited. One summer afternoon, about five years after his first coming to the Potwell Inn, Mr. Polly found himself sitting under the pollard willow, fishing for dace. It was a plumper, browner, and healthier Mr. Polly altogether than the miserable bankrupt with whose dyspeptic portrait our novel opened. He was fat, but with a fatness more generally diffused, and the lower part of his face was touched to gravity by a small square beard. Also he was balder. It was the first time he had found leisure to fish, though from the very outset of his Potwell career he had promised himself abundant indulgence in the pleasure of fishing. Fishing, as the golden page of English literature testifies, is a meditative and retrospective pursuit, and the varied page of memory, disregarded so long for sake of the teeming duties I have already enumerated, began to unfold itself to Mr. Polly's consideration. A speculation about Uncle Jim died for want of material, and gave place to a reckoning of the years and months that had passed since his coming to the Potwell, and that to a philosophical review of his life. He began to think about Miriam, remotely and impersonally. He remembered many things that had been neglected by his conscience during the busier times, as, for example, that he had committed arson and deserted a wife. For the first time he looked these long-neglected facts in the face. It is disagreeable to think one has committed arson, because it is an action that leads to jail. Otherwise I do not think there was a grain of regret for that in Mr. Polly's composition. But deserting Miriam was in a different category. Deserting Miriam was mean. This is a history, and not a glorification of Mr. Polly, and I tell of things as they were with him. Apart from the disagreeable twinge arising from the thought of what might happen if he was found out, he had not the slightest remorse about that fire. Arson, after all, is an artificial crime. Some crimes are crimes in themselves, would be crimes without any law. The cruelties, mockery, and breaches of faith that astonish and wound. But the burning of things is in itself neither good nor bad. A large number of houses deserve to be burned, most modern furniture, an overwhelming majority of pictures and books. 
one might go on for some time with the list. If our community was collectively anything more than a feeble idiot, it would burn most of London and Chicago, for example, and build sane and beautiful cities in the place of these pestilential heaps of rotten private property. I have failed in presenting Mr. Polly altogether if I have not made you see that he was in many respects an artless child of nature, far more untrained, undisciplined, and spontaneous than an ordinary savage. And he was really glad, for all that little drawback of fear, that he had the courage to set fire to his house, and fly, and come to the Potwell Inn. But he was not glad he had left Miriam. He had seen Miriam cry once or twice in his life, and it had always reduced him to abject commiseration. He now imagined her crying. He perceived, in a perplexed way, that he had made himself responsible for her life. He forgot how she had spoiled his own. He had hitherto rested in the faith that she had over a hundred pounds of insurance money. But now, with his eye meditatively upon his float, he realized a hundred pounds does not last for ever. His conviction of her incompetence was unflinching. She was bound to have fooled it away somehow by this time. And then he saw her humping her shoulders and sniffing in a manner he had always regarded as detestable at close quarters, but which now became harrowingly pitiful. Damn, said Mr. Polly, and down went his float, and he flicked up a victim to destruction and took it off the hook. He compared his own comfort and health with Miriam's imagined distress. Ought to have done something for herself, said Mr. Polly, rebating his hook. She was always talking about doing things. Why couldn't she? He watched the float oscillating gently towards quiescence. Silly to begin thinking about her, he said. Damn silly. But once he had begun thinking about her, he had to go on. Oh, blow! cried Mr. Polly presently, and pulled up his hook to find another fish had just snatched at it in the last instant. His handling must have made the poor thing feel itself unwelcome. He gathered his things together and turned towards the house. All the Potwell Inn betrayed his influence now, for here indeed he had found his place in the world. It looked brighter, so bright indeed as to be almost skittish, with the white and green paint he had lavished on it. Even the garden palings were striped white and green, and so were the boats. For Mr. Polly was one of those who find a positive sensuous pleasure in the laying on of paint. Left and right were two large boards, which had done much to enhance the inn's popularity with the lighter-minded variety of pleasure-seekers. Both marked innovations. One bore in large words the single word museum. The other was plain and laconic with omelettes. The spelling of the latter word was Mr. Polly's own, but when he had seen a whole boatload of men intent on Lamham for lunch stop open-mouthed and stare and grin, and come in and ask, in a marked, sarcastic manner, for omelettes, he perceived that his inaccuracy had done more for the place than his utmost cunning could have contrived. In a year or so the inn was known both up and down the river by its new name of omelettes, and Mr. Polly, after some secret irritation, smiled and was content and the fat woman's omelettes were things to remember. You will note I have changed her epithet. Time works upon us all. Hmm. She stood upon the steps as he came towards the house, 
and smiled at him richly. "'Caught many?' she asked. "'Er, uh, got an idea,' said Mr. Polly. "'Would it put you out very much if I went off for a day or two, for a bit of a holiday? There won't be much doing now until Thursday.' Feeling recklessly secure behind his beard, Mr. Polly surveyed the Fishbourne High Street once again. The north side was much as he had known it, except that Rusper had vanished. A row of new shops replaced the destruction of the great fire. Mantell and Throbson's had risen up again upon a more flamboyant pattern, and the new fire station was in the Swiss Teutonic style, and with much red paint. Next door, in the place of Rumbold's, was a branch of the Colonial Tea Company, and then a Salmon and Gluckstein tobacco shop, and then a little shop that displayed sweets, and professed a tea-room upstairs. He considered this as a possible place in which to pursue inquiries about his lost wife, wavering a little between it and the God's Providence Inn down the street. Then his eye caught a name over the window. Polly, he read, and Larkins. Well, I'm astonished. A momentary faintness came upon him. He walked past and down the street, returned and surveyed the shop again. He saw a middle-aged, rather untidy woman standing behind the counter, who for an instant, he thought, might be Miriam terribly changed, and then recognized as his sister-in-law Annie, filled out and no longer hilarious. She stared at him without a sign of recognition as he entered the shop. "'Can I have tea?' said Mr. Polly. "'Well,' said Annie, "'you can, but our tea-room's upstairs. My sister's been cleaning it out, and it's a bit upset.' "'It would be,' said Mr. Polly, softly. "'I beg your pardon,' said Annie. "'I said I didn't mind. Up here.' "'I dare say there'll be a table,' said Annie, and followed him to a room whose conscientious disorder was intensely reminiscent of Miriam. "'Nothing like turning everything upside down when you're cleaning,' said Mr. Polly, cheerfully. "'It's my sister's way,' said Annie, impartially. "'She's gone out for a bit of fresh air, but I dare so she'll be back soon to finish. "'It's a nice light room, and it's tidy. Can I put you in a table over there?' "'Let me,' said Mr. Polly, and assisted. He sat down by the open window, and drummed on the table, and meditated on his next step, while Annie vanished to get his tea. After all, things didn't seem so bad with Miriam. He tried over several gambits in imagination. "'Unusual name,' he said as Annie laid a cloth before him. Annie looked interrogation. "'Polly! Polly and Larkins! Real, I suppose?' "'Polly's my sister's name. She married a Mr. Polly.' "'Widow, I presume?' said Mr. Polly. "'Yes, these five years, come October.' "'Lord!' said Mr. Polly, in unfeigned surprise. "'Found drowned he was. There was a lot of talk in the place.' "'Never heard of it,' said Mr. Polly. "'I'm a stranger, uh, rather.' "'In the Midway, near Maidstone. He must have been in the water for days. Wouldn't have known him, my sister wouldn't if it hadn't been for the name sewn in his clothes. All whitey, and eat away he was. Bless my heart, must have been a bit of a shock for her. Oh, it was a shock, said Annie, and added darkly, but sometimes a shock's better than a long agony. Er, uh, no doubt, said Mr. Polly. He gazed with a rapt expression at the preparations before him. So, I'm drowned, something was saying inside him. Are life insured? he asked. We started the tea-rooms with it, 
said Annie. Why, if things were like this, had remorse and anxiety for Miriam been implanted in his soul? No shadow of an answer appeared. Marriage is a lottery, said Mr. Polly. She found it so, said Annie. Would you like some jam? Uh, I'd like an egg, said Mr. Polly. I'll have two. I've got a sort of feeling as though I wanted keeping up. Wasn't a particularly good sort, this Mr. Polly. He was a wearing husband, said Annie. I've often pitied my sister. He was one of that sort. Dissolute, suggested Mr. Polly faintly. No, said Annie judiciously. Not exactly dissolute. Feeble's more the word. Weak. He was weak as water. How long do you want your eggs boiled? Uh, four minutes exactly, said Mr. Polly. One gets talking, said Annie. One does, said Mr. Polly, and she left him to his thoughts. What perplexed him was his recent remorse and tenderness for Miriam. Now he was back in her atmosphere, all that had vanished, and the old feeling of helpless antagonism returned. He surveyed the piled furniture, the economically managed carpet, the unpleasing pictures on the wall. Why had he felt remorse? Why had he entertained this illusion of a helpless woman crying aloud in the pitiless darkness for him? He peered into the unfathomable mysteries of the heart, and ducked back to a smaller issue. Was he feeble? The eggs came up. Nothing in Annie's manner invited a resumption of the discussion. Business brisk? he ventured to ask. Annie reflected. It is, she said, and it isn't. It's like that. Oh, said Mr. Polly, and squared himself to his egg. Uh, was there an inquest on that chap? What chap? Uh, what was his name? Uh, Polly. Of course. You're sure it was him? What do you mean? Annie looked at him hard and suddenly his soul was black with terror. Who else could it have been in the very clothes he wore? Uh, of course, said Mr. Polly, and began his egg. He was so agitated that he only realized its condition when he was halfway through it, and Annie safely downstairs. Lord, he said, reaching out hastily for the pepper, one of Miriam's. I haven't tasted such an egg for five years. Wonder where she gets them. Picks them out, I suppose. He abandoned it for its fellow. Except for a slight mustiness, the second egg was very palatable indeed. He was getting on down to the bottom of it, as Miriam came in. He looked up. A nice afternoon, he said at her stare and perceived she knew him at once by the gesture and the voice. She went white and shut the door behind her. She looked as though she was going to faint. Mr. Polly sprang up quickly and handed her a chair. "'My God!' she whispered, and crumpled up rather than sat down. "'It's you!' she said. Uh, "'No!' said Mr. Polly, very earnestly. "'It isn't. It just looks like me. That's all.' "'I knew that man wasn't you, all along. I tried to think it was. I tried to think that perhaps the water had altered your wrists and feet, and the colour of your hair.' "'Oh!' "'I'd always feared you'd come back.' Mr. Polly sat down by his egg. "'I haven't come back,' he said very earnestly. Don't you think it? How we pay the insurance now, I don't know. She was weeping. She produced a handkerchief and covered her face. Look here, Miriam, said Mr. Polly. I haven't come back, and I'm not coming back. I'm, I'm a visitant from another world. 
You shut up about me, and I'll shut up about myself. I came back because I thought you might be hard up, or in trouble, or some silly thing like that. Now I see you again. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied completely, see? I'm going to absqualiate, see? Hey, presto, right away. He turned to his tea for a moment, finished his cup noisily, stood up. "'Don't you think you're going to see me again?' he said. "'For you ain't.' He moved to the door. Uh, "'That was a tasty egg,' he said, hovered for a second, and vanished. Annie was in the shop. "'The missus has had a bit of a shock,' he remarked. "'Got some kind of fancy about a ghost. Can't make it out quite. So long.' And he had gone. Mr. Polly sat beside the fat woman at one of the little green tables at the back of the Potwell Inn, and struggled with the mystery of life. It was one of those evenings, serenely luminous, amply and atmospherically still, when the river bend was at its best. A swan floated against the dark green masses of the further bank. The stream flowed broad and shining to its destiny with scarce a ripple, except where the reeds came out from the headland, and the three poplars rose clear and harmonious against a sky of green and yellow, and it was as if it were all secure within a great, warm, friendly globe of crystal sky. It was as safe and enclosed and fearless as a child that has still to be born. It was an evening full of the quality of tranquil, unqualified assurance. Mr. Polly's mind was filled with the persuasion that, indeed, all things whatsoever must needs be satisfying and complete. It was incredible that life has ever done more than seemed to jar, that there could be any shadow in life save such velvet softness as made the setting for that silent swan, or any murmur but the ripple of the water as it swirled round the chained and gently swaying punt. And the mind of Mr. Polly, exalted and made tender by this atmosphere, sought gently, but sought, to draw together the various memories that came drifting, half-submerged, across the circle of his mind. He spoke in words that seemed like a bent and broken stick thrust suddenly into water, destroying the mirror of the shapes they sought. "'Jim's not coming back again, ever,' he said. "'He got drowned five years ago.' "'Where?' asked the fat woman, surprised. "'Miles from here, in the Medway, away in Kent.' "'Law!' said the fat woman. "'It's right enough,' said Mr. Polly. "'How do you know?' "'I went to my home.' "'Where?' Uh, "'Don't matter. I went and found out. He'd been in the water some days. He'd got my clothes, and they said it was me.' "'They?' "'It, it don't matter. I'm not going back to them.' The fat woman regarded him silently for some time. Her expression of scrutiny gave way to a quiet satisfaction. Then her brown eyes went to the river. "'Poor Jim,' she said. "'He hadn't much tact, ever,' she added mildly. "'I can't hardly say I'm sorry.' "'Nor me,' said Mr. Polly, and got a step nearer the thought in him. "'But it don't seem much good his having been alive, does it?' "'He wasn't much good,' the fat woman admitted, "'ever.' "'I suppose there were things that were good to him,' Mr. Polly speculated. Uh, "'They weren't our things.' His hold slipped again. "'I often wonder about life,' he said weakly. He tried again. "'One seems to start in life,' he said, "'expecting something.' and it doesn't happen, and it doesn't matter. One 
starts with ideas that things are good and things are bad, and it hasn't much relation to what is good and what is bad. I've always been the sceptitious sort, and it's always seemed rot to me to pretend that we know good from evil. It's just what I've never done. No Adam's apple stuck in my throat, ma'am. I don't own to it. He reflected. I set fire to a house once. The fat woman started. I don't feel sorry for it. I don't believe it was a bad thing to do, any more than burning a toy like I did once when I was a baby. I nearly killed myself with a razor. Who hasn't, anyhow, gone as far as thinking of it? Most of my time I've been half dreaming. I married like a dream, almost. I've never really planned my life or set out to live. I happened. Things just happened to me. It's so with everyone. Jim couldn't help himself. I shot at him and tried to kill him. I dropped the gun and he got it. He very nearly had me. I wasn't a second too soon, ducking. Awkward, that night was. Hmm. But I don't blame him, come to that. Only I don't see what it's all up to. Like children, playing about in a nursery, hurt themselves at times. There's something that doesn't mind us, he resumed presently. It isn't what we try to get that we get. It isn't the good we think we do is good. What makes us happy isn't our trying. What makes others happy isn't our trying. There's a sort of character people like and stand up for, and a sort they won't. You've got to work it out and take the consequences. Miriam was always trying. Who's Miriam? asked the fat woman. Oh, no one you know, but she used to go about with her brows knit, trying not to do whatever she wanted to do if ever she did want to do anything. He lost himself. "'You can't help being fat,' said the fat woman, after a pause, trying to get up to his thoughts. "'You can't,' said Mr. Polly. "'It helps, and it hinders. "'Like my upside-down way of talking. "'The magistrates wouldn't have kept on the license to me if I hadn't been fat.' "'Then what would we have done?' said Mr. Polly, to get an evening like this. "'Lord, look at it!' He sent his arm round the great curve of the sky. "'If I was a black or an Italian, I should come out here and sing. I whistle sometimes, but, bless you, it's singing I've got in my mind. Sometimes I think I live for sunsets.' "'I don't see that it does you any good always looking at sunsets like you do,' said the fat woman. "'Nor me, but I do. Sunsets and things I was made to like.' "'They don't help you,' said the fat woman thoughtfully. "'Who cares?' said Mr. Polly. A deeper strain had come to the fat woman. "'You got to die some day,' she said. "'Some things I can't believe,' said Mr. Polly suddenly. "'And one is your being a skellington.' He pointed his hand towards the neighbour's hedge. "'Look at em against the yellow. And they're just stinging nettles, nasty weeds, if you count things by their uses, and no help in the life hereafter. But just look at the look of em. "'It isn't only looks,' said the fat woman. "'Whenever there's signs of a good sunset and I'm not too busy,' said Mr. Polly, "'I'll come and sit out here.' The fat woman looked at him with eyes in which contentment struggled with some obscure, reluctant protest, and at last turned them slowly to the black nettle pagodas against the golden sky. "'I wish we could,' she said. "'I will.' The fat woman's voice sank nearly to the inaudible. "'Not always,' she said. 
Mr. Polly was some time before he replied. "'Come here always, when I'm a ghost,' he replied. "'Spoil the place for others,' said the fat woman, abandoning her moral solicitudes for a more congenial point of view. "'Not my sort of ghost, wouldn't?' said Mr. Polly, emerging from another long pause. "'I'd be a sort of diaphalous feeling, just mellowish and warmish-like.' They said no more, but sat on in the warm twilight until, at last, they could scarcely distinguish each other's faces. They were not so much thinking as lost in a smooth, still quiet of the mind. A bat flitted by. "'Time we was going in, old party,' said Mr. Polly, standing up. "'Supper to get. It's as you say, we can't sit here for ever. The End End of chapter 9 and End of The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells Read by Adrian Pretzelis in Santa Rosa, California December 24th, 2011